Chapter 14 of Sixty Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 14 Orchards and Vineyards, 1856. During 1856, I dissolved with my partners, Rich and Laventhal, and went into business with my uncle, Joseph Newmark, J. P. Newmark, and Maurice Kramer under the title of Newmark, Kramer, and Company. Instead of a quasi-wholesale business, we now had a larger assortment and did more of a retail business. We occupied a room about 40 by 80 feet in size in the Mascarell and Berry block on the south side of Commercial Street, then known as Commercial Row, between Main and Los Angeles streets, our modest establishment being almost directly opposite the contracted quarters of my first store, and having the largest single storeroom then in the city, and there we continued with moderate success until 1858. To make this new partnership possible, Kramer had sold out his interest in the firm of Lazard and Kramer, dry goods merchants, the readjustment providing an amusing illustration of the manner in which the business, with its almost entire lack of specialization, was then conducted. When the stock was taken, a large part of it consisted, not of dry goods, as one might well suppose, but of cigars and tobacco. About the beginning of 1856, Sisters of Charity made their first appearance in Los Angeles, following a meeting called by Bishop Amat during the preceding month to provide for their coming, when Abel Stearns presided and John G. Downey acted as secretary. Benjamin Hayes, Thomas Foster, Ezra Drown, Louis Vignes, Ignacio de Valle and Antonio Coronel cooperated, while Manuel Raquena collected the necessary funds. On January 5th, sisters Maria Scholastica, Maria Corzina, Anna, Clara, Francisca, and Angela arrived, three of them coming almost directly from Spain, and immediately they formed an important adjunct to the church in matters pertaining to religion, charity, and education. It was to them that B. D. Wilson sold his Los Angeles home, including ten acres of fine orchard, at the corner of Alameda and Macy Streets, for eight thousand dollars, and there for many years they conducted their school, the Institute and Orphan Asylum, until they sold the property to J. M. Griffith, who used the site for a lumber yard. Griffith, in turn, disposed of it to the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. Sister Scholastica, who celebrated in 1889 her 50th anniversary as a sister, was long the mother superior. The so-called first public school having met with popular approval, the Board of Education in 1856 opened another school on Bath Street. The building, two stories in height, was of brick and had two rooms. On January 9th, John P. Brody assumed charge of the Southern Californian. Andres Pico was then proprietor, and before the newspaper died in 1857, Pico lost, it is said, $10,000 in the venture. The first regular course of public lectures here was given in 1856 under the auspices of a society known as the Mechanics Institute, and in one of Henry Dalton's corrugated iron buildings. George T. Burrill, first county sheriff, died on February 2nd, his demise bringing to mind an interesting story. He was sheriff in the summer of 1850, when certain members of the infamous Irving party were arraigned for murder, and during that time received private word that many of the prisoner's friends would pack the little courtroom and attempt a rescue. Burrell, however, who used to wear a sword and had a rather soldierly bearing, was equal to the emergency. He quickly sent to Major E. H. Fitzgerald, and had the latter come post-haste to town and court with a detachment of soldiers and with this superior disciplined force he overawed the bandits compañeros who sure enough were there and fully armed to make a demonstration thomas e rowan arrived here with his father james rowan in 1856 and together they opened a bakery tom delivered the bread for a short time but soon abandoned that pursuit for politics being frequently elected to office serving in turn as supervisor, city and county treasurer, and even, from 1893 to 1894, as mayor of Los Angeles. Shortly before Tom married Miss Josephine Meyerhofer in San Francisco in 1862, and a handsome couple they made, the Rowans bought from Louis Mesmer, the American bakery, located at the southwest corner of Main and First Streets, and originally established by August Ulyard. 
When James Rowan died about forty years ago, Tom fell heir to the bakery, but as he was otherwise engaged, he employed Maurice Mauricio as manager, and P. Golta, afterward a prosperous businessman of Bakersfield, as driver. Tom, who died in 1899, was also associated as cashier with I. W. Hellman and F. P. F. Temple in their bank. Rowan Avenue and Rowan Street were both named after this early comer. The time for the return of my brother and his European bride now approached, and I felt a natural desire to meet them. Almost coincident, therefore, with their arrival in San Francisco, I was again in that growing city in 1856, although I had been there but the year previous. On April 9th occurred the marriage of Matilda, daughter of Joseph Newmark, to Maurice Kramer. The ceremony was performed by the bride's father. For the subsequent festivities, ice, from which ice cream was made, was brought from San Bernardino, both luxuries on this occasion being used in Los Angeles, as far as I can remember, for the first time. To return to the Los Angeles Star. When J. S. Waite became postmaster, in 1855, he found it no sinecure to continue even such an unpretentious and, in all likelihood, unprofitable news sheet, and at the same time attend to Uncle Sam's mailbags and early in 1856 he offered the entire establishment at $1,000 less than cost. Business was so slow at that time, in fact, that wait, after perhaps ruefully looking over his unpaid subscriptions, announced that he would take wood, butter, eggs, flour, wheat, or corn in payment of bills due. He soon found a ready customer in William A. Wallace, the principal of the boys' school, who on the 12th of April bought the paper, but Waite's disgust was nothing to that of the schoolteacher, who after two short months' trial with the editorial quill, scribbled a last doleful adios. The flush times of the Pueblo, the day of large prices and pocket-books, are past, Wallace declared, and before him the editor saw, only picayunes, bad liquor, rags, and universal dullness, when neither pistol-shots nor dying groans could have any effect, and when earthquakes would hardly turn men in their beds. Nothing was left for such a destitute and discouraged quillman but to wait for a carreta and get out of town. Wallace sold the paper, therefore, in June 1856 to Henry Hamilton, a native of Ireland who had come to California in 1848 an apprenticed printer, and was for some years in newspaper work in San Francisco, and Hamilton soon put new life into the journal. In 1856 the many-sided Dr. William B. Osborne organized a company to bore an artesian well west of the city. But when it reached a depth of over 700 feet, the prospectors went into bankruptcy. George Lehman, early known as George the Baker, whose shop at one time was on the site of the Hayward Hotel, was a somewhat original and very popular character who, in 1856, took over the round house on Main Street between 3rd and 4th, and there opened a pleasure resort extending to Spring Street and known as the Garden of Paradise. The grounds really occupied, on the one hand, what are now the sites of the Pridham, the Pinney, and the Turnverine, and on the other the Henny, the Breed, and the Lancashire blocks. There was an entrance on Main Street, and one with two picket gates on Spring. From the general shape and appearance of the building, it was always one of the first objects in town to attract attention. Anne Lehman, who, when he appeared on the street, had a crooked cane hanging in his arm and a lemon in his hand, came to be known as Roundhouse George. The house had been erected in the late forties by Raimundo, generally called Ramon, or Raymond Alexander, a sailor who asserted that the design was a copy of a structure he had once seen on the coast of Africa, and there Ramon and his native California wife had lived for many years. Partly because he wished to cover the exterior with vines and flowers, Lehman nailed boards over the outer adobe walls and thus changed the cylinder form into that of an octagon. An ingenious arrangement of the parterre and a particular distribution of some trees, together with a profusion of plants and flowers, affording cool and shady bowers, somewhat similar to those of a typical beer or wine garden in the fatherland, gave the place great popularity, while two heroic statues, one of Adam and the other of Eve, with a conglomeration of other curiosities, including the apple tree and the serpent, all illustrating the old world story of Eden, and a moving panorama made the garden unique and rather famous. The balcony of the house provided accommodation for the playing of such music, perhaps discordant, as Los Angeles could then produce, and nearby was a framework containing a kind of swing then popular known as flying horses. 
The bar was in the garden, near a well sweep, and at the main street entrance stood a majestic and noted cactus tree which was cut down in 1886. The Garden of Paradise was opened toward the end of September 1858, and so large were the grounds that when they were used in 1876 for the 4th of July celebration, 2,600 people were seated there. This leads me to say that Arthur Mackenzie Dodson, who established a coal and wood yard at what was later the corner of Spring and Sixth Streets, started there a little community which he called Georgetown. As a compliment, it was said to the famous roundhouse George, whose bakery, I have remarked, was located on that corner. On June 7th, Dr. John S. Griffin, who had an old-fashioned classical education and was a graduate in medicine of the University of Pennsylvania, succeeded Dr. William B. Osborne as superintendent of the Los Angeles City Schools. In these times of modern irrigation and scientific methods, it is hard to realize how disastrous were climactic extremes in an earlier day. In 1856, a single electric disturbance, accompanied by intense heat and sandstorms, left tens of thousands of dead cattle to tell the story of drought and destruction. During the summer, I had occasion to go to Fort Tejon to see George C. Alexander, a customer, and I again asked Sam Meyer if he would accompany me. Such a proposition was always agreeable to Sam, and having procured horses, we started, the distance being about 115 miles. We left Los Angeles early one afternoon and made our first stop at License Station, where we put up for the night. One of the brothers, after whom the place was named, prepared supper. Having to draw some thick black strap from a keg, he used a pitcher to catch the treacle, and as the liquid ran very slowly, our sociable host sat down to talk a bit and soon forgot all about what he had started to do. The molasses, however, although it ran pretty slowly, ran steadily, and finally, like the mush in the fairy tale of the enchanted bowl, overflowed the top of the receptacle and spread itself over the dirt floor. When Lyons had finished his chat, he saw, to his intense chagrin, a new job upon his hands, and one likely to busy him for some time. Departing next morning at five o'clock, we met Cy Lyons, who had come to Los Angeles in 1849, and was then engaged with his brother Sanford in raising sheep in that neighborhood. Cy was on horseback and had two pack animals loaded with provisions. "'Hello, boys, where are you bound?' he asked, and when we told him that we were on our way to Fort Tejon, he said that he was also going there and volunteered to save us forty miles by guiding us over the trail. Such a shortening of our journey appealed to us as a good prospect, and we fell in behind the mounted guide. It was one of those red-hot summer days characteristic of that region and season, and in a couple hours we began to get very thirsty. Noticing this, Cy told us that no water would be found until we got to the Rancho de la Libre, and that we could not possibly reach there until evening. Having no bota de agua handy, I took an onion from Lion's pack and ate it, and that afforded me some relief. But Sam, whose decisions were always as lasting as the fragrance of that aromatic bulb, would not try the experiment. To make a long story short, when we at last reached the ranch, Sam, completely fagged out and unable to alight from his horse, toppled off into our arms. The chewing of the onion had refreshed me to some extent, but just the same, the day's journey proved one of the most miserable experiences through which I have ever passed. The night was so hot at the ranch that we decided to sleep outdoors in one of the wagons, and being worn out with the day's exposure and fatigue, we soon fell asleep. The soundness of our slumbers did not prevent us from hearing, in the middle of the night, a snarling bear scratching in the immediate neighborhood. A bear generally means business, and you may depend upon it that neither Sam, myself, nor even Cy were very long in bundling out of the wagon and making a dash for the more protecting house. Early next morning we recommenced our journey toward Fort Tejon and reached there without any further adventures worth relating. Coming back we stopped for the night at Gordon's station, and the next day rolled fully seventy miles, not so inconsiderable an accomplishment, perhaps, for those not accustomed to regular saddle exercise. A few months later I met Cy on the street. Harris, said he, do you know that once, on that hot day going to Fort Tejon, we were within three hundred feet of a fine, cool spring? Then why in the devil, I retorted, didn't you take us to it? To which Cy, with a chuckle, answered, well, I just wanted to see what would happen to you. My first experience with camp meetings was in the year 1856, when I attended one in company with Miss Sarah Newmark, to whom I was then engaged, and Miss Harriet, her sister, later Mrs. Eugene Meyer. I engaged a buggy from George Carson's livery stable on Main Street, 
and we rode to Ira Thompson's Grove at El Monte, in which the meeting was held. These camp meetings supplied a certain amount of social attraction to residents, in that good-hearted period when creeds formed a bond rather than a hindrance. It was in 1856 that, in connection with our regular business, we began buying hides. One day a Mexican customer came into the store, looking around, and said, Compra cueros? Do you buy hides? Si, sí, senor, I replied, to which he then said, Tengo muchos en mi rancho. I have many at my ranch. Where do you live? I asked. Between Cahuenga and San Fernando Mission, he answered. He had come to town in his carreta, and added that he would conduct me to his place if I wished to go there. I obtained a wagon, and accompanied by Samuel Cohn, went with the Mexican. The native jogged on, carreta fashion, the oxen lazily plodding along, while the driver with his ubiquitous pole kept them in the road by means of continual and effective prods, delivered first on one side, then on the other. It was dark when we reached the ranch, and the night being balmy, we wrapped ourselves up in blankets and slept under the adobe veranda. Early in the morning I awoke and took a survey of the premises. To my amazement I saw but one little kipskin hanging up to dry. When at length my Mexican friend appeared on the scene, I asked him where he kept his hides. Donde tiene usted los cueros? At which he pointed to the lone kip, and with a characteristic and perfectly indifferent shrug of the shoulders said, No tengo mas. I have no more. I then deliberated with Sam as to what we should do, and having proceeded to San Fernando Mission to collect there, if possible, a load of hides, we were soon fortunate in obtaining enough to compensate us for our previous trouble and disappointment. On the way home we came to a rather deep ditch preventing further progress. Being obliged, however, to get to the other side, we decided to throw the hides into the ditch, placing one on top of the other until the obstructing gap was filled to a level with the road and then we drove across, if not on dry land, at least on dry hides, which we reloaded into the wagon. Finally, we reached town at a late hour. In this connection I may remind the reader of Dana's statement in his celebrated Two Years Before the Mast, that San Pedro once furnished more hides than any other port on the coast, and may add that from the same port, more than forty years afterward, consignments of this valuable commodity were still being made, I myself being engaged more and more extensively in the hide trade. Colonel Isaac Williams died on September 13th, having been a resident of Los Angeles and vicinity nearly a quarter of a century. A Pennsylvanian by birth, he had with him in the West a brother, Hiram, later of San Bernardino County. Happy as was most of Colonel Williams's life, tragedy entered his family circle, as I shall show, when both of his sons-in-law, John Raines and Robert Carlyle, met violent deaths at the hands of others. Jean-Louis Vignet came to Los Angeles in 1829 and set out the Aliso Vineyard of 104 acres which derived its name, as did the street, from a previous and incorrect application of the Castilian Aliso, meaning alder, to the sycamore tree, a big specimen of which stood on the place. This tree, possibly a couple of hundred years old, long shaded Vignet's wine cellars and was finally cut down a few years ago to make room for the Philadelphia brew house. From a spot about fifty feet away from the Vignes adobe extended a grape arbor, perhaps ten feet in width and fully a quarter of a mile long, thus reaching to the river, and this arbor was associated with many of the early celebrations in Los Angeles. The northern boundary of the property was Aliso Street, its western boundary was Alameda, and part of it was surrounded by a high adobe wall, inside of which, during the troubles of the Mexican War, Don Luis enjoyed a far safer seclusion than many others. On June 7, 1851, Vignes advertised El Aliso for sale, but it was not subdivided until much later, when Eugene Meyer and his associates bought it for this purpose. Vignes Street recalls the veteran viticulturist. While upon the subject of this substantial old pioneer family, I may give a rather interesting reminiscence as to the state of Aliso Street at this time. I have said that this street was the main road from Los Angeles to the San Bernardino country, and so it was. But in the 50s, Aliso Street stopped very abruptly at the San Savane Vineyard, where it narrowed down to one of the willow-bordered, picturesque little lanes so frequently found here, and paralleled the noted grape arbor as far as the river bank. At this point, Andrew Boyle and other residents of the Heights and beyond were wont to cross the stream on their way to and from town. The more important travel was by means of another lane known as the Aliso Road, turning at a corner occupied by the old Aliso Mill and winding along the Hoover Vineyard to the river. 
along this route the san bernardino stage rolled noisily traversing in summer or during a poor season what was almost a dry wash but encountering in wet winter raging torrents so impassable that all intercourse with the settlements to the east was disturbed for a whole week on several occasions the san bernardino stage was tied up and once at least andrew boyle before he had become conversant with the vagaries of the los angeles river found it impossible for the better part of a fortnight to come to town for the replenishment of a badly depleted larder lover's lane willowed and deep with dust was a narrow road now variously located in the minds of pioneers my impression being that it followed the line of the present date street although some insist that it was the macy pierre saint savane a nephew of vignes came in eighteen thirty nine and for a while worked with his uncle jean louis saint savane and another nephew arrived in los angeles in eighteen forty nine or soon after and on april fourteenth eighteen fifty five purchased for forty two thousand dollars the vineyard cellars and other property of his uncle this was the same year in which he returned to france for his son michael and remarried leaving another son paul in school there pierre joined his brother and in eighteen fifty seven saint savane brothers made the first california champagne first shipping their wine to san francisco paul now a resident of san diego came to los angeles in eighteen sixty one the name endures in saint servain street the activity of these frenchmen reminds me that much usually characteristic of country life was present in what was called the city of los angeles when i first saw it as may be gathered from the fact that in eighteen fifty three there were a hundred or more vineyards hereabouts seventy five or eighty of which were within the city precincts these did not include the once famous mother vineyard of san gabriel mission which the padres used to claim had about fifty thousand vines but which had fallen into somewhat picturesque decay near san gabriel however in eighteen fifty five william m stockton had a large vineyard nursery william wolfskill was one of the leading vineyardists having set out his first vine so it was said in eighteen thirty eight when he affirmed his belief that the plant if well cared for would flourish a hundred years Don Jose Serrano, from whom Dr. Leon's Hoover bought many of the grapes he needed, did have vines, it was declared, that were nearly a century old. When I first passed through San Francisco en route to Los Angeles, I saw grapes from this section in the markets of that city bringing twenty cents a pound, and to such an extent for a while did San Francisco continue to draw on Los Angeles for grapes, that Banning shipped thither from San Pedro in 1857 no less than twenty one thousand crates averaging forty five pounds each it was not long however before ranches near san francisco began to interfere with this monopoly of the south and as a consequence the shipment of grapes from los angeles fell off this reminds me that william wolfskill sent to san francisco some of the first northern grapes sold there they were grown in a napa valley vineyard that he owned in the middle of the fifties and when unloaded on the long wharf three or four weeks in advance of los angeles grapes brought at wholesale twenty five dollars per hundred weight with the decline in fresh fruit trade however the making and exportation of wine increased and several who had not ventured into vineyarding before now did so acquiring their own land or an interest in the establishments of others by eighteen fifty seven jean louis vignet boasted of possessing some white wine twenty years old possibly of the same vintage about which dr griffin often talked in his reminiscences of the days when he had been an army surgeon and louis wilhart occasionally sold wine which was little inferior to that of jean louis dr hoover was one of the first to make wine for the general market having for a while a pretty and well situated place called the clayton vineyard and old joseph huber who had come to california from kentucky for his health began in eighteen fifty five to make wine with considerable success he owned the foster vineyard where he died in july eighteen sixty six b d wilson was also soon shipping wine to san francisco j l rose who first entered the field in january eighteen sixty one at sunny slope not far from san gabriel mission was another producer and had vineyard famous for brandy and wine he made a departure in going to the foothills and introduced many varieties of foreign grapes by the same year or somewhat previously matthew keller stearns and bell dr thomas j white dr parrott kiln messer henry dalton h d barrows juan bernard and ricardo vejar had wineries and john shoemaker had a vineyard opposite the site of the city gardens in the late seventies l h titus in time had a vineyard known as the dewdrop near that of rose 
Still another wine producer was Antonio Maria Lugo, who set out his vines on San Pedro Street, near the present second, and often dwelt in the long adobe house where both Steve Foster, Lugo's son-in-law, and Mrs. Wallace Woodworth lived, and where I have been many times pleasantly entertained. Dr. Leons Hoover, who died on October 8, 1862, was a native of Switzerland and formerly a surgeon in the army of Napoleon when his name, later changed at the time of naturalization, had been Huber. Dr. Hoover, in 1849, came to Los Angeles with his wife, his son, Vincent A. Hoover, then a young man, and two daughters, the whole family traveling by ox team and prairie schooner. They soon discovered rich placer gold beds, but were driven away by hostile Indians. A daughter, Mary A., became the wife of Samuel Briggs, a New Hampshire Yankee, who was for years Wells Fargo's agent here. For a while the Hoovers lived on the Wolfskill Ranch, after which they had a vineyard in the neighborhood of what is now the property of the Cuddy Packing Company. Vincent Hoover was a man of prominence in his time. He died in 1883. Mrs. Briggs, whose daughter married the well-known physician Dr. Granville McGowan, sold her home, on Broadway between 3rd and 4th Streets, to Homer Laughlin when he erected the Laughlin Building. Hoover Street is named for this family. Accompanied by his son, William, Joseph Huber, Sr., in 1855, came to Los Angeles from Kentucky, hoping to improve his health, and when the other members of his family, consisting of his wife and children, Caroline, Emmeline, Edward, and Joseph, followed him here, in 1859, by way of New York and the Isthmus, they found him settled as a vineyardist, occupying the foster property running from Alameda Street to the river, in a section between Second and Sixth Streets. The advent of a group of young people so well qualified to add to what has truthfully been described by old-time Angelenos as our family circle was hailed with a great deal of interest and satisfaction. In time, Miss Emmeline Huber was married to O.W. Childs, and Miss Caroline was wedded to Dr. Frederick Preston Howard, a druggist who, more than forty years ago, bought out Theodore Woolweber, selling the business back to the latter a few years later. The prominence of this family made it comparatively easy for Joseph Huber, Jr., in 1865, to secure the nomination and be elected county treasurer, succeeding M. Kramer, who had served six years. Huber, Sr. died about the middle sixties. Mrs. Huber lived to be eighty-three years old. Jose de Rubio had at least two vineyards when I came, one on Alameda Street, south of Wolfskills, and not far from Coronel's, and one on the east side of the river. Rubio came here very early in the century after having married Juana, a daughter of Juan Maria Maron, a well-known sea captain, and built three adobe houses. The first of these was on the site of the present home of William H. Workman, on Boyle Heights. The second was near what was later the corner of Alameda and Eighth Streets, and the third was on Alameda Street, near the present Vernon Avenue. One of his ranches was known as Rubio's, and there many a barbecue was celebrated. In 1859, Rubio leased the Sepulveda Landing at San Pedro and commenced to haul freight to and fro. Senor and Senora Rubio footnote. Senora Rubio survived her husband many years, dying on October 27, 1914, at the age of 107, after residing in Los Angeles 94 years. End footnote. Had 25 children, of whom five are now living. Another Los Angeles vineyardist who lived near the river when I came was a Frenchman named Clemente. Julius Wise also had a vineyard, living on what is now 8th Street near San Pedro. A son, H. G. Wise, has distinguished himself as an attorney and has served in the legislature. Another, Otto G., married the widow of Edward Naud, while a third son, Rudolph G., married a daughter of H. D. Barrows. The Reyes family was prominent here. A daughter married William Nordholt. Ysidro had a vineyard on Washington Street, and during one of the epidemics he died of smallpox. His brother Pablo was a rancher. While on the subject of vineyards, I may describe the method by which wine was made here in the early days, and the part taken in the industry by the Indians, who always interested and astounded me. Stripped to the skin and wearing only loincloths, they tramped with ceaseless tread from morn till night, pressing from the luscious fruit of the vineyard the juice so soon to ferment into wine. The grapes were placed in elevated vats from which the liquid ran into other connecting vessels, and the process exhaled a stale acidity, scenting the surrounding air. 
these indians were employed in the early fall the season of the year when wine is made and when the thermometer as a rule in southern california reaches its highest point and this temperature coupled with incessant toil caused the perspiration to drip from their swarthy bodies into the wine product the sight of which in no wise increased my appetite for california wine a staple article of food for the indians in eighteen fifty six by the way was the acorn the crop that year however was very short and streams having also failed in many instances to yield the food usually taken from them the tribes were in a distressed condition such were the aborigines straits in fact that rancheros were warned of the danger then greater than ever from indian depredations on stock in telling of the sisters of charity i have forgotten to add that after settling here they sent to new york for a portable house which they shipped to los angeles by way of cape horn in due time the cows arrived but imagine their vexation on discovering that although the parts were supposed to have been marked so that they might easily be joined together no one here could do the work in the end the sisters were compelled to send east for a carpenter who after a long interval arrived and finished the house soon after the organization of a masonic lodge here in eighteen fifty four many of my friends joined and among them my brother j p newmark who was admitted on february twenty sixth eighteen fifty five on which occasion j h stewart was a secretary and through their participation in the celebration of st john's day the twenty fourth of june i was seized with a desire to join the order this i did at the end of eighteen fifty six becoming a member of los angeles lodge number forty two whose meetings were held over Potter's store on Main Street. Worshipful Master Thomas Foster initiated me, and on January 22, 1857, Worshipful Master Jacob Elias officiating, I took the third degree. I am, therefore, in all probability, the oldest living member of this now venerable Masonic organization. End of chapter 14《ラフォーマー・ヘルマーティカ・ラフォーマーヘルマーティカ・ラフォーマーヘルマーティカ・ラフォーマーヘルマーティカ・ラフォーマーヘルマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・ラフォーマーティカ・A tremor shook the earth from north to south. The first shocks being light, the quake grew in power until houses were deserted. Men, women, and children sought refuge in the streets, and horses and cattle broke loose in wild alarm. For perhaps two or two and a half minutes, the temblor continued and much damage was done. Los Angeles felt the disturbance far less than many other places, although five to six shocks were noted, and twenty times during the week people were frightened from their homes. At Temple's Rancho and at Fort Tejon, great rents were opened in the earth and then closed again, piling up a heap or dune of finely powdered stone and dirt. Large trees were uprooted and hurled down the hillsides, and tumbling after them went the cattle. Many officers, including Colonel B. L. Beale, well known in Los Angeles circles, barely escaped from the barracks with their lives, and until the cracked adobes could be repaired, officers and soldiers lived in tents. It was at this time, too, that a so-called tidal wave almost engulfed the seabird, plying between San Pedro and San Francisco, as she was entering the Golden Gate. Under the splendid seamanship of Captain Salisbury Haley, however, his little ship weathered the wave, and he was able later to report her awful experience to the scientific world. This year also proved a dry season, and consequently times became very bad. With two periods of adversity, even the richest of the cattle kings felt the pinch, and many began to part with their lands in order to secure the relief needed to tide them over. The effects of drought continued until 1858, although some good influences improved business conditions. Due to glowing accounts of the prospects for conquest and fortune given out by Henry A. Crabb, a Stockton lawyer who married a Spanish woman with relatives in Sonora, a hundred or more filibusters gathered in Los Angeles in January to meet Crabb at San Pedro when he arrived from the north on the steamer Seabird. They strutted about the streets here, displaying rifles and revolvers, and this would seem to have been enough to prevent their departure for Sonita, a little town a hundred miles beyond Yuma, to which they finally tramped. The filibusters were permitted to leave, however, and they invaded the foreign soil, 
but crabbe made a mess of the undertaking even failing in blowing up a little church he attacked and those not killed in the skirmish were soon surrounded and taken prisoners the next morning crabbe and some others who had paraded so ostentatiously while here were tied to trees or posts and summarily executed crabbe's body was riddled with a hundred bullets and his head cut off and sent back in mescal only one of the party was spared charlie evans a lad of fifteen years who worked his way to los angeles and was connected with a somewhat similar invasion a while later in january also when threats were made against the white population of southern california mrs griffin the wife of dr j s griffin came running in all excitement to the home of joseph newmark and told the members of the family to lock all their doors and bolt their windows as it was reported that some of the outlaws were on their way to los angeles to murder the white people as soon as possible the ladies of the griffin nichols foy mallard workman newmark and other families were brought in together for greater safety in armory hall on spring street near second while the men took their places in line with the other citizens to patrol the hills and streets a still vivid impression of this startling episode recalls an englishman a dr carter who arrived here some three years before he lived on the east side of main street near first where the macdonald block now stands and while not prominent in his profession he associated with some estimable families when others were volunteering for sentry work or to fight the doctor very gallantly offered his services as a committee of one to care for the ladies far from the firing line on hearing of these threats by native bandidos james r barton formerly a volunteer under general s w kearney and then sheriff at once investigated the rumors and the truth of the reports being verified our small and exposed community was seized with terror a large band of mexican outlaws led by pancho daniel a convict who had escaped from san quentin prison and included luciano tapia and juan flores on january twenty second had killed a german storekeeper named george w flugart in san juan capistrano while he was preparing his evening meal and after having placed his body on the table they sat around and ate what the poor victim had provided for himself on the same occasion these outlaws plundered the stores of manuel garcia henry charles and miguel kragevsky or krasuski the last name escaping by hiding under a lot of wash in a large clothes basket when the news of this murder reached los angeles excitement rose to fever heat and we prepared for something more than defense jim barton accompanied by william h little and charles k baker both constables charles f daly an early blacksmith here alfred hardy and frank alexander all volunteers left that evening for san juan capistrano to capture the murderers and soon arrived at the san joaquin ranch about eighteen miles from san juan there don jose andres sepulveda told barton of a trap set for him and that the robbers outnumbered his posse two to one and urged him to send back to los angeles for more volunteers brave but reckless barton however persisted in pushing on the next day and so encountered some of the marauders in santiago canyon barton baker little and daly were killed while hardy and alexander escaped when los angeles was apprised of this second tragedy the frenzy was indescribable and steps were taken toward the formation of both a committee of safety and a vigilance committee the latter to avenge the foul deed and bring in the culprits in meeting this emergency the el monte boys as usual took an active part the city was placed under martial law and dr john s griffin was put in charge of the local defenses suspicious houses thought to be headquarters for robbers and thieves were searched and forty or fifty persons were arrested the state legislature was appealed to and at once voted financial aid although the committee of safety had the assistance of special foot police in guarding the city the citizens made a requisition on fort tejon and fifty soldiers were sent from that post to help pursue the band troops from san diego with good horses and plenty of provisions were also placed at the disposition of the los angeles authorities Companies of mounted rangers were made up to scour the country, American, German, and French citizens vying with one another for the honor of risking their lives, one such company being formed at El Monte and another at San Bernardino. There were also two detachments of native Californians, but many Sonorans and Mexicans from other states, either from sympathy or fear, aided the murdering robbers and so made their pursuit doubly difficult. However, the outlaws were pursued far into the mountains, and although the first party sent out returned without effecting anything, reporting that the desperadoes were not far from San Juan and that the horses of the pursuers had given out, practically all of the band, as will be seen, were eventually captured. 
not only were vigorous measures taken to apprehend and punish the murderers but provision was made to rescue the bodies of the slain and to give them decent and honorable burial the next morning after nearly one hundred mounted and armed men had set out to track the fugitives another party also on horseback left to escort several wagons filled with coffins in which they hoped to bring back the bodies of sheriff barton and his comrades in this effect the posse succeeded and when the remains were received in los angeles on sunday about noon the city at once went into mourning all business was suspended and the impressive burial ceremonies conducted on monday were intended by citizens en masse oddly enough there was not a protestant clergyman in town at the time but the masonic order took the matter in hand and performed their rites over those who were masons and even paid their respects with a portion of the ritual to the non-masonic dead general andres pico with a company of native mounted californians who left immediately after the funeral was especially prominent in running down the outlaws thus again displaying his natural gift of leadership and others fitted themselves out and followed as soon as they could general pico knew both land and people and on capturing silvas and arderio two of the worst of the bandidos after a hard resistance he straightway hung them to trees at the very spot where they had tried to assassinate him and his companions in the pursuit of the murderers james thompson successor in the following january to the murdered sheriff getman led a company of horsemen toward the tehunga and at the simi pass high upon the rocks he stationed united states soldiers as a lookout little san gabriel in which j f burns as deputy sheriff was on the watch also made its contribution to the restoration of order and peace for some of its people captured and executed three or four of daniels's and flores's band flores was caught on the top of a peak in the santiago range all in all some fifty-two culprits were brought to los angeles and lodged in jail and of that number eleven were lynched or legally hung when the vigilance committee had jailed a suspected murderer the people were called to sit in judgment we met near the veranda of the montgomery and judge jonathan r scott having been made chairman a regular order of procedure extra legal though it was was followed after announcing the capture and naming the criminal the judge called upon the crowd to determine the prisoner's fate thereupon someone would shout hang him scott would then put the question somewhat after the following formula gentlemen you have heard the motion all those in favor of hanging so-and-so will signify by saying i and the citizens present unanimously answered i having thus expressed their will the assemblage proceeded to the jail a low adobe building behind the little municipal and county structure and easily subdued the jailer frank j carpenter whose daughter josephine became frank burns's second wife the prisoner was then secured taken from his cell escorted to fort hill a rise of ground behind the jail where a temporary gallows had been constructed and promptly dispatched and after each of the first batch of culprits had there successively paid the penalty for his crime the avengers quietly dispersed to their homes to await the capture and dragging in of more cutthroats among those condemned by vote at a public meeting in the way i have described was juan flores who was hanged on February 14, 1857, well up on Fort Hill, in sight of such a throng that it is hardly too much to say that practically every man, woman, and child in the Pueblo was present, not to mention many people drawn by curiosity from various parts of the state who had flocked into town. Flores was but twenty-one years of age, yet the year previous he had been sent to prison for horse-stealing. At the same time that Flores was executed, Miguel Blanco, who had stabbed the militiaman Captain W. W. Twist, in order to rob him of a thousand dollars was also hanged espinosa and lopez two members of the robber band for a while eluded their pursuers at san buenaventura however they were caught and on the following morning espinosa was hung lopez again escaped and it was not until february sixteenth that he was finally recaptured and dispatched to other realms two days after juan flores was sent to a warmer clime luciano tapia and thomas king were executed tapia's case was rather regrettable for he had been a respectable laborer at san luis obispo until flores meeting him persuaded him to abandon honest work tapia came to los angeles joined the robber band and was one of those who helped to kill sheriff barton in 1857 the sisters of charity founded the los angeles infirmary the first regular hospital in the city with sister anna for years well known here as sister superior for a while temporary quarters were taken in the house long occupied by don jose maria aguilar and family which property the sisters soon purchased 
but the next year they bought some land from don luis arenas adjoining don jose andres sepulvedas and were thus enabled to enlarge the hospital their service being the best in time they were enabled to acquire a good-sized two-story building of brick in the upper part of the city and there their patients enjoyed the refreshing and health restoring environment of garden and orchard it was not until this year that on the corner of alameda and bath streets oscar macy city treasurer in eighteen eighty seven to eighty eight opened the first public bath house having built a water wheel with small cans attached to the paddles to dip water up from the alameda zanja as a medium for supplying his tank he provided hot water as well as cold oscar charged fifty cents a bath and furnished soap and towels in eighteen fifty seven the steamship senator left san francisco on the fifth and twentieth of each month and so continued until the people wanted a steamer at least once every ten days despite the inconvenience and expense of obtaining water for the home it was not until february twenty fourth that judge w g dryden who with a man named mcfadden had established the nucleus of a system was granted a franchise to distribute water from his land and to build a water wheel in the zanja madre the dryden formerly known as the abila springs and later the source of the Baudry supply were near the site selected for the san fernando street railway station and from these springs water was conveyed by Assange to the plaza there in the center a brick tank perhaps ten feet square and fifteen feet high was constructed and this was filled by means of pumps while from the tank wooden pipes distributed water to the consumer so infrequently did we receive intelligence from the remoter parts of the world throughout the fifties that sometimes a report especially if apparently authentic when it finally reached here created real excitement I recall more or less vividly the arrival of the stages from the senator late in march and the stir made when the news was passed from mouth to mouth that livingston the explorer had at last been heard from in far off and unknown africa los angeles schools were then open only part of the year the school board being compelled in the spring to close them for want of money william wolfskill however rough pioneer though he was came to the board's rescue he was widely known as an advocate of popular education having as i have said his own private teachers and to his lasting honor he gave the board sufficient funds to make possible the reopening of one of the schools in eighteen fifty seven i again revisited san francisco during the four years since my first visit a complete metamorphosis had taken place tents and small frame structures were being largely replaced with fine buildings of brick and stone many of the sand dunes had succumbed to the march of improvement gardens were much more numerous and the uneven character of streets and sidewalks had been wonderfully improved in a word the spirit of western progress was asserting itself and the city by the golden gate was taking on a decidedly metropolitan appearance notwithstanding various attempts at citrus culture in southern california some time elapsed before there was much of an orange or lemon industry in this vicinity in 1854 a dr halsey started an orange and lime nursery on the roland place which he soon sold to william wolfskill for four thousand dollars and in april 1857 when there were not many more than a hundred orange trees bearing fruit in the whole county wolfskill planted several thousand and so established what was to be for that time the largest orange orchard in the united states he had thrown away a good many of the lemon trees received from halsey because they were frostbitten but he still had some lemon orange and olive trees left later under the more scientific care of his son joseph wolfskill who extended the original wolfskill grove this orchard was made to yield very large crops in eighteen fifty seven a group of germans living in san francisco bought twelve hundred acres of waste sandy land at two dollars an acre from don pacifico Ontiveros, and on it started the town of anaheim a name composed of the spanish ana from santa ana and the german heim for home and this was the first settlement in the county founded after my arrival this land formed a block about one and one quarter miles square some three miles from the santa ana river and five miles from the residence of don bernardo yorba from whom the company received special privileges a langenberger a german who married yorba's daughter was probably one of the originators of the anaheim plan at any rate his influence with his father-in-law was of value to his friends in completing the deal 
there were fifty shareholders who paid seven hundred and fifty dollars each with an executive council composed of otmar kaler president g charles kohler vice president cyrus bythine treasurer and john fisher secretary while john froling r emerson felix bachman who was a kind of sub-treasurer and louis jasinski made up the los angeles auditing committee george hansen afterward the colony's superintendent surveyed the tract and laid it out in fifty twenty-acre lots with streets and a public park around it a live fence of some forty to fifty thousand willow cuttings placed at intervals of a couple of feet was planted a main canal six to seven miles long with a fall of fifteen to twenty feet brought abundant water from the santa ana river while some three hundred and fifty miles of lateral ditches distributed the water to the lots on each lot some eight or ten thousand grapevines were set out the first as early as january eighteen fifty eight on december fifteenth eighteen fifty nine the stockholders came south to settle on their partially cultivated land and although but one among the entire number knew anything about wine making the dream of the projectors to establish there the largest vineyard in the world bade fair to come true the colonists were quite a curious mixture two or three carpenters four blacksmiths three watchmakers a brewer an engraver a shoemaker a poet a miller a bookbinder two or three merchants a hatter and a musician but being mostly of sturdy industrious german stock they soon formed such a prosperous and important little community that by eighteen seventy six the settlement had grown to nearly two thousand people a peculiar plan was adopted for investment sale and compensation each stockholder paid the same price at the beginning and later all drew for the lots the apportionment being left to chance but since the pieces of land were conceded to have dissimilar values those securing the better lots equalized in cash with their less likely associates soon after eighteen sixty when langenberger had erected the first hotel there anaheim took a leading place in the production of grapes and wine and this position of honor it kept until in eighteen eighty eight a strange disease suddenly attacked and within a single year killed all the vines after which the cultivation of oranges and walnuts was undertaken Kohler and Froling had wineries in both San Francisco and Los Angeles, the latter being adjacent to the present corner of Central Avenue and 7th Street, and this firm purchased most of Anaheim's grape crop, although some vineyard owners made their own wine. Morris L. Goodman, by the way, was here at an early period and was one of the first settlers of Anaheim. Hermann Heinsch, a native of Prussia, arrived in Los Angeles in 1857, and soon after engaged in the harness and saddlery business on march eighth eighteen sixty three he was married to mary hap having become proficient at german schools in both music and languages heinsch lent his time and efforts to the organization and drill of germans here and contributed much to the success of both the teutonia and the turnverein in eighteen sixty nine the heinsch building was erected at the corner of commercial and los angeles streets and as late as 1876, this was a shopping district, a Mrs. T.J. Baker having a dressmaking establishment there. After a prosperous career, Heinsch died on January 13, 1883. His wife followed him on April 14, 1906. R.C. Heinsch, a son, survives them. Major Walter Harris Harvey, a native of Georgia, once a cadet at West Point, but dismissed for his pranks, who about the middle of the 50s married Eleanor, eldest full sister of John G. Downey, and became the father of J. Downey Harvey, now living in San Francisco, settled in California shortly after the Mexican War. During the first week in May, 1857, or some four years before he died, Major Harvey arrived from Washington with an appointment as Register of the Land Office, in place of H. P. Dorsey. At the same time, Don Agustin Oliveira was appointed receiver, in lieu of General Andres Pico. These and other rotations in office were due, of course, to national administration changes, President Buchanan having recently been inaugurated. One of the interesting legal inquiries of the 50s was conducted in 1857 when, in the district court here, Antonio Maria Lugo, crowned with the white of 76 winters, testified at a hearing to establish certain claims to land as to what he knew of old ranchos hereabouts, recalling many details of the Pueblo and incidents as far back as 1785. He had seen the San Rafael Ranch, for example, in 1790, and he had also roamed as a young man over the still older Dominguez and Nietos Hills. 
Charles Henry Forbes, who was born at the Mission San Jose, came to Los Angeles County in 1857, and though but 22 years old, was engaged by Don Abel Stearns to superintend his various ranchos, becoming Stearns's business manager in 1866, with a small office on the ground floor of the Arcadia Block. In 1864, Forbes married Doña Luisa Oliveira, daughter of Judge Augustin Oliveira, and a graduate of the Sisters' School. On the death of Don Abel, in 1871, Forbes settled up Stearns's large estate, retaining his professional association with Doña Arcadia after her marriage to Colonel Baker, and even until he died in May 1894. As I have intimated, the principal industry throughout Los Angeles County, and indeed throughout Southern California up to the 60s, was the raising of cattle and horses, an undertaking favored by a people particularly fond of leisure and knowing little of the latent possibilities in the land so that this entire area of magnificent soil supported herds which provided the whole population in turn, directly or indirectly, with a livelihood. The livestock subsisted upon the grass growing wild all over the county, and the prosperity of Southern California therefore depended entirely upon the season's rainfall. This was true to a far greater extent than one might suppose, for water development had received no attention outside of Los Angeles. If the rainfall was sufficient to produce feed, dealers came from the north and purchased our stock, and everybody thrived. If, on the other hand, the season was dry, cattle and horses died, and the public's pocket book shrank to very unpretentious dimensions. As an incident in even a much later period than that which I here have in mind, I can distinctly remember that I would rise three or four times during a single meal to see if the overhanging clouds had yet begun to give that rain which they had seemed to promise and which was so vital to our prosperity. As for rain, I am reminded that every newspaper in those days devoted much space to weather reports or, rather, to gossip about the weather at other points along the coast, as well as to the consequent prospects here. The weather was the one determining factor in the problem of a successful or a disastrous season, and became a very important theme when ranchers and others congregated at our store. And here I may mention, apropos of this matter of rainfall and its general effects, that there were millions of ground squirrels all over this country that shared with other animals the ups and downs of the season. When there was plenty of rain, these squirrels fattened and multiplied, but when evil days came, they sickened, starved, and perished. On the other hand, great overflows, due to heavy rainfalls, drowned many of these troublesome little rodents. The raising of sheep had not yet developed any importance at the time of my arrival, most of the mutton then consumed in Los Angeles coming from Santa Cruz Island, in the Santa Barbara Channel, though some was brought from San Clemente and Santa Catalina Islands. On the latter there was a herd of from eight to 10,000 sheep, in which Oscar Macy later acquired an interest, and L. Harris, father-in-law of H. W. Frank, the well and favorably known president and member of the Board of Education, also had extensive herds there. They ran wild and needed very little care, and only semi-yearly visits were made to look after the shearing, packing, and shipping of the wool. Santa Cruz Island had much larger herds, and steamers running to and from San Francisco often stopped there to take on sheep and sheep products. Santa Catalina Island, for years the property of Don José María Covarrubias, and later of the eccentric San Francisco pioneer James Lick, who crossed the plains in the same party with the Lanfranco brothers and tried to entice them to settle in the north, was not far from San Clemente, and there, throughout the extent of her hills and vales, roamed herd after herd of wild goats. Early seafarers, I believe it has been suggested, accustomed to carry goats on their sailing vessels for a supply of milk, probably deposited some of the animals on Catalina, but however that may be, hunting parties to this day explore the mountains in search of them. Considering, therefore, the small number of sheep here about 1853, it is not uninteresting to note that according to old records of San Gabriel for the winter of 1828 and 29, there were then at the mission no less than 15,000 sheep, while in 1858, on the other hand, according to fairly accurate reports, there were fully 20,000 sheep in Los Angeles County. Two years later, the number had doubled. George Carson, a New Yorker who came here in 1852, and after whom Carson Station is named, was one of the first to engage in the sheep industry. Soon after he arrived, he went into the livery business, to which he gave attention even when, in partnership successively with Sanford, Dean, and Hicks in the hardware business, on Commercial Street. 
On July 30, 1857, Carson married Doña Victoria, a daughter of Manuel Dominguez, but it was not until 1864 that, having sold out his two business interests, the livery to George Butler and the hardware to his partner, he moved to the ranch of his father-in-law where he continued to live, assisting Dominguez with the management of his great property. Some years later, Carson bought four or five hundred acres of land adjoining the Dominguez acres and turned his attention to sheep. Later still, he became interested in the development of thoroughbred cattle and horses, but continued to help his father-in-law in the directing of his ranch. When rain favored the land, Carson, in common with his neighbors, amassed wealth, but during dry years he suffered disappointment and loss, and on one occasion was forced to take his flocks, then consisting of ten thousand sheep, to the mountains, where he lost all but a thousand head. It cost him ten thousand dollars to save the latter, which amount far exceeded their value. In this movement of stock he took with him, as his lieutenant, a young Mexican named Martin Cruz, whom he had brought up on the rancho. Carson was one of my cronies while I was still young and single, and we remained warm friends until he died. Almost indescribable excitement followed the substantiated reports, received in the fall of 1857, that a train of immigrants from Missouri and Arkansas, on their way to California, had been set upon by Indians near Mountain Meadow, Utah, on September 7th, and that 36 members of the party had been brutally killed. Particularly were the Gentiles of the Southwest stirred up when it was learned that the assault had been planned and carried through by one Lee, a Mormon, whose act sprang rather from the frenzy of a madman than from the deliberation of a well-balanced mind. The attitude of Brigham Young toward the United States government at that time, and his alleged threat to turn the Indians loose upon the whites, added color to the assertion that Young's followers were guilty of the massacre but fuller investigation has absolved the Mormons, I believe, as a society, from any complicity in the awful affair. Some years later the two Oatman girls were rescued from the Indians, by whom they had been tattooed, and for a while they stayed at Ira Thompson's where I saw them. In 1857, J.G. Nichols was re-elected mayor of Los Angeles, and began several improvements he had previously advocated, especially the irrigating of the plain below the city. By August 2nd, Zanja No. 2 was completed, and this brought about the building of the Aliso Mill and the further cultivation of much excellent land. One of the passengers that left San Francisco with me for San Pedro on October 18th, 1853, who later became a successful citizen of Southern California, was Edward N. MacDonald, a native of New York State. We had sailed from New York together, and together had finished the long journey to the Pacific Coast, after which I lost track of him. MacDonald had intended proceeding farther south, and I was surprised at meeting him on the street some weeks after my arrival in Los Angeles. Reaching San Pedro, he contracted to enter the service of Alexander and Banning, and remained with Banning for several years until he formed a partnership with John O. Wheeler's brother, who later went to Japan. MacDonald subsequently raised sheep on a large scale and acquired much ranch property, and in 1876 he built the block on Main Street bearing his name. Sixteen years later, he erected another structure opposite the first one. When MacDonald died at Wilmington on June 10, 1899, he left his wife an estate valued at about $160,000, which must have increased in value since then many-fold. N. A. Potter, a Rhode Islander, came to Los Angeles in 1855, bringing with him a stock of Yankee goods and opening a store, and two years later he bought a two-story brick building on Main Street opposite the Bella Union. Louis Jasinski was a partner with Potter for a while under the firm name of Potter & Company, but later Jasinski left Los Angeles for San Francisco. Potter died here, 1868. Possibly the first instance of an Angelino proffering a gift to the President of the United States, and that too of something characteristic of this productive soil and climate, was when Henry D. Barrows in September called on President Buchanan in Washington, and on behalf of William Wolfskill, Don Manuel Requena, and himself, gave the chief executive some California fruit and wine. I have before me a ledger of the year 1857. It is a medium-sized volume bound in leather, and on the outside cover is inscribed in the bold, old-fashioned handwriting of fifty-odd years ago the simple legend, Newmark, Kramer, and Company. Each page is headed with the name of some still-remembered worthy of that distant day who was a customer of the old firm, and in 1857 a customer was always a friend. 
according to the method of that period the accounts are closed not with balancing entries and red lines but in the blackest of black ink with the good straightforward and positive inscription settled the perusal of this old book carries me back over the vanished years as the skull in the hand of the ancient monk so does this antiquated volume recall to me how transitory is this life and all its affairs a few remain to tell a younger generation the story of the early days but the majority even as in eighteen fifty seven they carefully balanced their scores in this old ledger have now closed their accounts in the great book of life they have settled with their heaviest creditor they have gone before him to render their last account with few or no exceptions they were a manly sterling race and i have no doubt that he found their assets far greater than their liabilities end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of sixty years in southern california eighteen fifty three to nineteen thirteen by harris newmark this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand chapter sixteen marriage the butterfield stages eighteen fifty eight in january eighteen fifty eight i engaged in the sheep business after some investigation i selected and purchased for an insignificant sum just west of the present hollenbeck home on boyle avenue a convenient site which consisted of twenty acres of land through which a ditch conducted water to don felipe lugo's san antonio rancho a flow quite sufficient at the time for my herd these sheep i pastured on adjacent lands belonging to the city and as others often did the same no one said me nay everything progressed beautifully until the first of may when the ditch ran dry upon making inquiry i learned that the city had permitted lugo to dig a private ditch across his twenty-acre tract to his ranch and to use what water he needed during the rainy season but that in may when the authorities resumed their irrigation service the privilege was withdrawn i was thus deprived of water for the sheep despite the fact that there was an adobe on the land i could not dispose of the property at any price one day a half-breed known as the chicken thief called on me and offered a dozen chickens for the adobe but not a chicken for the land stealing chickens was this man's profession and i suppose that he offered me the medium of exchange he was most accustomed to have about him sheriff william c getman had been warned in the tragic days of eighteen fifty eight to look out for a maniac named reed but almost courting such an emergency getman once a dashing lieutenant of the rangers and bearing grapeshot wounds from his participation in the siege of mexico went on the seventh of january with francis baker to a pawnbroker whose establishment near los angeles and aliso streets was popularly known as the monte pio there the officers found reed locked and barricaded in a room and while the sheriff was endeavoring to force an entrance reed suddenly threw open the door ran out and to the dismay of myself and many others gathered to witness the arrest pulled a pistol from his pocket discharged the weapon and getman dropped on the spot the maniac then retreated into the pawnbroker's from which he fired at the crowd deputy baker later assistant to marshal warren who was shot by die finally killed the desperado but not before reed had fired twenty to thirty shots four or five of which passed through baker's clothing when the excited crowd broke into the shop it was found that the madman had been armed with two derringers two revolvers and a bowie knife a convenient little arsenal which he had taken from the money lender's stock the news of the affray spread rapidly through the town and everywhere created great regret baker who had sailed around the horn a couple of years before i arrived died on may seventeenth eighteen ninety nine after having been city marshal and tax collector so much trouble with men inclined to use firearms too freely was not confined to maniacs or those bent on revenge or robbery on one occasion for example about eighteen fifty eight while passing along the street i observed gabriel allen known among his intimates as gabe allen a veteran of the war with mexico and some years later a supervisor on one of his jollifications with sheriff getman following close at his heels having arrived in front of a building gabe suddenly raised his gun and aimed at a carpenter who was at work on the roof getman promptly knocked allen down whereupon the latter said you've got me billy allen's only purpose it appeared was to take a shot at the innocent stranger and thus test his marksmanship this gabe allen was really a notorious character though not altogether bad 
When sober, he was a peaceable man, but when on a spree, he was decidedly warlike and on such occasions always shot up the town. While on one of those jamborees, for example, he was heard to say, I'll shoot if I only kill six of them. In later life, however, Allen married a Mexican lady who seems to have had a mollifying influence, and thereafter he lived at peace with the world. During the changing half-century or more of which I write, Los Angeles has witnessed many exciting street scenes, but it is doubtful if any exhibition here ever called to doors, windows, and dusty streets a greater percentage of the entire population than that of the government camels driven through the town on January 8, 1858, under the martial and spectacular command of Ned, otherwise Lieutenant, and later General and Ambassador E. F. Beale, and the forebear of the so-called hundred-million-dollar McLean baby the same Lieutenant Beale, who opened up Beale's route from the Rio Grande to Fort Tejon. The camels had just come in from the fort, having traveled forty or more miles a day across the desert, to be loaded with military stores and provisions. As early as the beginning of the fifties, Jefferson Davis, then in Congress, had advocated, but without success, the appropriation of thirty thousand dollars for the purchase of such animals, believing that they could be used on the overland routes and would prove especially serviceable in desert regions, and when Davis, in 1854, as Secretary of War, secured the appropriation for which he had so long contended, he dispatched American Army officers to Egypt and Arabia to make the purchase. Some seventy or seventy-five camels were obtained and transported to Texas by the store ship Supply, and in the Lone Star State the herd was divided into two parts, half being sent to the Gadsden Purchase, afterward Arizona, and half to Albuquerque. In a short time the second division was put in charge of Lieutenant Beale, who was assisted by native camel drivers brought from abroad. Among these was Philip Tedro, or High Jolly, who had been picked up by Commodore Dave Porter, and Greek George, years afterward host to Bandit Vasquez, and camels and drivers made several trips back and forth across the southwest country. Once headquartered at Fort Tejon, they came to Los Angeles every few weeks for provisions, each time creating no little excitement among the adult population and affording much amusement as they passed along the streets to the small boy. To return to Pancho Daniel, the escaped leader of the Barton murderers. He was heard from occasionally as foraging north toward San Luis Obispo, and was finally captured after repeated efforts to entrap and round him up by Sheriff Murphy on January 19, 1858, while hiding in a haystack near San Jose. When he was brought to Los Angeles, he was jailed and then released on bail. Finally, Daniel's lawyers secured for him a change of venue to Santa Barbara, and this was the last abuse that led the public again to administer a little law of its own. Early on the morning of November 30th, Pancho's body was found hanging by the neck at the gateway to the county jail yard, a handful of men having overpowered the keeper, secured the key and the prisoner, and sent him on a journey with a different destination from Santa Barbara. On February 25th, fire started in Childs and Hicks' store on Los Angeles Street and threatened both the Bella Union and El Palacio, then the residence of Don Abel Stearns. The brick in the building of the Felix Bachman and Company and the Volunteer Bucket Brigade prevented a general conflagration. Property worth thousands of dollars was destroyed, Bachman and Company alone carrying insurance. The conflagration demonstrated the need of a fire engine, and a subscription was started to get one. Weeks later, workmen rummaging among the debris found $5,000 in gold, which discovery produced no little excitement. Childs claimed the money as his, saying that it had been stolen from him by a thieving clerk, but the workmen, undisturbed by law, kept the treasure. A new four-page weekly newspaper appeared on March 24th, bearing the suggestive title The Southern Vineyard, and the name of Colonel J. J. Warner as editor. By December, it had become a semi-weekly. Originally Democratic, it now favored the Union Party. It was edited with ability, but died on June 8, 1860. On March 24th, I married Sarah, second daughter of Joseph Newmark, to whom I had been engaged since 1856. She was born on January 9, 1841, and had come to live in Los Angeles in 1854. The ceremony, performed by the bride's father, took place at the family home at what is now 501 North Main Street, almost a block from the plaza, on the site of the Brunswick Drug Company, and there we continued to live until about 1860. At four o'clock, a small circle of intimates was welcomed at dinner, and in the evening there was a house party and dance for which invitations printed on lace paper in the typography characteristic of that day had been sent out. 
Among the friends who attended were the military officers stationed at Fort Tejon, including Major Bell, the commanding officer, and Lieutenant John B. Magruder, formerly colonel at San Diego and later a major general in the Civil War, commanding Confederate forces in the peninsula and in Texas, and eventually serving under Maximilian in Mexico. Other friends still living in Los Angeles who were present are Mr. and Mrs. S. Lazard, Mrs. S. C. Foy, William H. Workman, C. E. Tom, and H. D. Barrows. Men rarely went out unarmed at night, and most of our male visitors doffed their weapons, both pistols and knives, as they came in, spreading them around in the bedrooms. Their ladies brought their babies with them for safekeeping, and the same rooms were placed at their disposal. Imagine, if you can, the appearance of this nursery arsenal. It was soon after we were married that my wife said to me one day, rather playfully, but with a touch of sadness, that our meeting might easily have never taken place. And when I inquired what she meant, she described an awful calamity that had befallen the Greenwich Avenue School in New York City, which she attended as a little girl, and where several hundred pupils were distributed in different classrooms. The building was four stories in height, the ground floor paved with stones, was used as a playroom, the primary department was on the second floor, the more advanced pupils occupied the third, while the top floor served as a lecture room. On the afternoon of November 20, 1851, Miss Harrison, the principal of the young ladies' department, suddenly fell in a faint, and the resulting screams for water, being misunderstood, led to the awful cry of fire. It was made known that the pupils made a dash for the various doors and were soon massed around the stairway, yet a difference of opinion existed as to the cause of the tragedy. My wife always said that the staircase, which led from the upper to the first floor, en caracol, gave way, letting the pupils fall, while others contended that the banister snapped asunder, hurling the crowded unfortunates over the edge to the pavement beneath. A frightful fatality resulted. Hundreds of pupils of all ages were precipitated in heaps on to the stone floor, with a loss of forty-seven lives and a hundred or more seriously crippled. My wife, who was a child of but eleven years, was just about to jump with the rest when a providential hand restrained and saved her. News of the disaster quickly spread, and in a short time the crowd of anxious parents, kinsfolk, and friends who had hastened to the scene in every variety of vehicle and on foot was so dense that the police had the utmost difficulty in removing the wounded dying and dead. From Geneva, Switzerland, in 1854, a highly educated French lady, Mademoiselle Theresa Bry, whose oil portrait hangs in the county museum, reached Los Angeles, and four years later married François Henrot, a gardener by profession, who had come from La Belle France in 1851. Together on First Street near Los Angeles, they conducted a private school which enjoyed considerable patronage, removing the institution in the early 80s to the Arroyo Seco district. This matrimonial transaction, on account of the unequal social stations of the respective parties, caused some little flurry. In contrast to her own beauty and ladylike accomplishments, Francois' manners were unrefined, his stature short and squatty, while his full beard, although it inspired respect, if not a certain feeling of awe, when he came to exercise authority in the school, was scraggy and unkempt. Madame Enois died in 1888, aged 87 years, and was followed to the grave by her husband five years later. In 1858, the outlook for business brightened in Los Angeles, and Don Abel Sterns, who had acquired riches as a ranchero, built the Arcadia Block, on the corner of Los Angeles and Arcadia Streets, naming it after his wife, Doña Arcadia, who, since these memoirs were commenced, has joined the silent majority. The structure cost about $80,000 and was talked of for some time as the most notable business block south of San Francisco. The newspapers hailed it as an ornament to the city and a great step toward providing what the small and undeveloped community then regarded as a fireproof structure for business purposes. Because, however, of the dangerous overflow of the Los Angeles River in rainy seasons, Stearns elevated the building above the grade of the street to such an extent that for several years his storerooms remained empty. But the enterprise at once bore some good fruit. To make the iron doors and shutters of the block, he started a foundry on New High Street, and soon created some local iron-casting trade. On April 24th, Senora Guadalupe Romero died at the age, it is said, of 115 years. She came to Los Angeles, I was told, as far back as 1781, the wife of one of the earliest soldiers sent here, and had thus lived in the Pueblo about 77 years. Some chapters in the life of Henry Mellis are of more than passing interest. Born in Boston, he came to California in 1835, 
with Richard Henry Dana, in Captain Thompson's brig Pilgrim, made famous in the story of Two Years Before the Mast. Clerked for Colonel Isaac Williams when that Chino worthy had a little store where the later Bella Union stood, returned to the East in 1837, and came back to the coast the second time as supercargo. Settling in San Francisco, he formed with Howard the well-known firm of Howard and Mellis, which was wiped out by the Great Fire in 1851. Again Mellis returned to Massachusetts, and in 1858, for a third time, came to California, at length casting his fortune with us in growing Los Angeles. On Dana's return to San Pedro and the Pacific Coast in 1859, Mellis, who had married a sister of Francis Mellis's wife and had become a representative citizen, entertained the distinguished advocate and author, and drove him around Los Angeles to view the once familiar but little altered scenes. Dana bore all his honors modestly, apparently quite oblivious of the curiosity displayed toward him, and quite as unconscious that he was making one of the memorable visits in the early annals of the town. Dana Street serves as a memorial to one who contributed in no small degree to render the vicinity of Los Angeles famous. Just what hotel life in Los Angeles was in the late fifties, or about the time when Dana visited here, may be gathered from an anecdote often told by Dr. W. F. Edgar, who came to the City of the Angels for the first time in 1858. Dr. Edgar had been ordered to join an expedition against the Mojave Indians, which was to start from Los Angeles for the Colorado River, and he put up at the old Bella Union, expecting at least one good night's rest before taking to the saddle again and making for the desert. Dr. Edgar found, however, to his intense disgust, that the entire second story was overcrowded with lodgers. Singing and loud talking were silenced in turn by the protests of those who wanted to sleep. But finally a guest, too full for expression but not so drunk that he was unable to breathe hoarsely, staggered in from a Sonora town ball, tumbled into bed with his boots on, and commenced to snort much like a pig. Under ordinary circumstances this infliction would have been grievous enough but the inner walls of the bella union were never over thick and the rhythmic snoring of the latecomer made itself emphatically audible and proportionately obnoxious quite as emphatic however were the objections soon raised by the fellow guests who not only raised them but threw them one after another boots boot jacks and sticks striking with heavy thud the snorer's portal but finding that even these did not avail the remonstrance in various forms of deshabille rushed out and began to kick the door of the objectional bedroom. Just at that moment the offender turned over with a grunt, and the excited army of lodgers, baffled by the unresisting apathy of the sleeper, retreated each to his nest. The next day, breathing a sigh of relief, Edgar forsook the heavenly regions of the Bella Union and made for Cajon Pass, eventually reaching the Colorado and the place where the expedition found the charred remains of emigrant wagons, the mournful evidence of Indian treachery and atrocity. Edgar's nocturnal experience reminds me of another in the good old Bella Union. When Cameron E. Tom arrived here in the spring of 1854, he engaged a room at the hotel, which he continued to occupy for several months, or until the rains of 1855 caused both roof and ceiling to cave in during the middle of the night, not altogether pleasantly arousing him from his slumbers. It was then that he moved to Joseph Newmark's, where he lived for some time, through which circumstance we became warm friends. Big, husky, hardy Jacob Kurtz, by birth a German and now living here at 81 years of age, left home as a mere boy for the sea, visiting California on a vessel from China as early as 1848, and rushing off to Placer County on the outbreak of the gold fever. Roughing it for several years and narrowly escaping death from Indians, Jake made his first appearance in Los Angeles in 1858, soon after which I met him when he was eking out a livelihood doing odd jobs about town a fact leading me to conclude that his success at the mines was hardly commensurate with the privations endured. It was just about that time, when he was running a dray, that attracted by a dance among Germans, Jake dropped in as he was. But how sorry an appearance he made may perhaps be fancied when I say that the doorkeeper, eyeing him suspiciously, refused him admission, and advised him to go home and put on his Sunday go-to-meetings. Jake went, and, what is more important, fortunately returned for while spinning around on the knotty floor he met fell in love with an ogled fraulein susan bunn whom somewhat later he married in eighteen sixty four kurtz had a little store on spring street near the adobe city hall and there he prospered so well that by eighteen sixty six he had bought the northwest corner of main and first streets and put up the building he still owns 
For twelve years he conducted a grocery and a part of that structure, living with his family in the second story, after which he was sufficiently prosperous to retire. Active as his business life has been, Jake has proved his patriotism time and again, devoting his efforts as a city father and serving, sometimes without salary, as superintendent of streets, chief of the fire department, and fire commissioner. In 1858, John Temple built what is now the south wing of the Temple Block, standing directly opposite the Bullard Building, but the main street stores being, like Stanza's Acadia Block, above the level of the sidewalk and therefore reached only by several steps, proved unpopular and did not rent, although Tischler and Schlesinger, heading a party of grain buyers, stored some wheat in them for a while or until the grain, through its weight, broke the flooring and was precipitated into the cellar. And even as late as 1859, after telegraph connection with San Francisco had been completed, only one little space on the Spring Street side, in size not more than eight by ten feet, was rented, the telegraph company being the tenants. One day, William Wolfe's kill, pointing to the structure, exclaimed to his friends, What a pity that Temple put all his money there. Had he not gone into building so extravagantly, he might now be a rich man. Wolf's kill himself, however, later commenced the construction of a small block on Main Street, opposite the Bella Union, to be occupied by S. Lazard and Company, but which he did not live to see completed. Later on the little town grew, and as this property became more central, Temple removed the steps and built the stores flush with the sidewalk, after which wide-awake merchants began to move into them. One of Temple's first important tenants on Main Street was Daniel Desmond, the Hatter. His store was about eighteen by forty feet. Henry Slaughterbeck, the well-known gunsmith, was another occupant. He always carried a large stock of gunpowder, which circumstance did not add very much to the security of the neighborhood. On the Court Street side, Jake Philippi was one of the first to locate, and there he conducted a sort of knip. His was a large room, with a bar along the west side. The floor was generously sprinkled with sawdust, and in comfortable armchairs around the good old-fashioned red wood tables frequently sat many of his German friends and patrons, gathered together to indulge in a game of Pedro, Scat, or Whist, and to pass the time pleasantly away. Some of those who thus met together at Jake Philippi's, at different periods of his occupancy, were Dr. Joseph Kurtz, H. Heinsch, Conrad Jacobi, Abe Haas, C. F. Heinzemann, P. Lazarus, Edward Pulitz, A. Alessasser, and B. F. Dreckenfeld, who was a brother-in-law of Judge Erskine M. Ross and claimed descent from some dwellers on the Rhine. He succeeded Frank Le Corvier as a bookkeeper for H. Newmark and Company, and was in turn succeeded, on removing to New York, by Pulitz, while the latter was followed by John S. Stower, an Englishman now residing in London, whose immediate predecessor was Richard Astle. Drakenfeld attained prominence in New York and both Altstuhl and Pollitz in San Francisco. Of these, Drakenfeld and Pollitz are dead. Most of these convivial frequenters of Philippi's belonged to a sort of Deutscher Club, which met, at another period, in a little room in the rear of the corner of Main and Rakina streets, just over the cool cellar then conducted by Bayer and Sattler. A stairway connected the two floors, and by means of that communication, the club attained its supply of lager beer. This fact recalls an amusing incident. When Philip Louth and Louis Schwartz succeeded Christian Henne in the management of the brewery at the corner of Main and Third Streets, the club was much dissatisfied with the new brew and forthwith had Bayer and Sattler send to Milwaukee for beer made by Philip Best. Getting wind of the matter, Louth met the competition by, at once, putting on the market a brand more wittily than appropriately known as Philip's Best. Sattler left Los Angeles in the early 70s and established a coffee plantation in South America, where one day he was killed by a native wielding a machete. The place, which was then known as Joe Bayer's, came to belong to Bob Eckert, a German of ruddy complexion and auburn hair, whose good nature brought him so much patronage that in course of time he opened a large establishment at Santa Monica. John D. Woodworth, a cousin, so it was said, of Samuel Woodworth, the author of The Old Oaken Bucket, and father of Wallace Woodworth, who died in 1883, was among the citizens active here in 1858, being appointed postmaster on May 19th of that year by President Buchanan. Then the post office, for a twelve-month in the old Lanfranco block, was transferred north on Main Street, until a year or two later it was located near Temple and Spring Streets. 
in june the surveyor general of california made an unexpected demand on the authorities of los angeles county for all the public documents relating to the county history under spanish and mexican rule the request was at first refused but finally despite the indignant protests of the press the invaluable records were shipped to san francisco i believe it was late in the fifties that o w childs contracted with the city of los angeles to dig a water ditch perhaps sixteen hundred feet long eighteen inches wide and about eighteen inches deep as i recollect the transaction the city allowed him one dollar per running foot and he took land in payment while i cannot remember the exact location of this land it comprised in part the wonderfully important square beginning at sixth street and running to twelfth and taking in everything from main street as far as and including the present figueroa when childs put this property on the market his wife named several of the streets because of some grasshoppers in the vicinity she called the extension of pearl street now figueroa grasshopper or calle de los chapules footnote mexican corruption of the aztec chapulin grasshopper and footnote her faith street has been changed to flower for the next street to the east she selected the name of hope while as if to complete the trio of the graces she christened the adjoining roadway since become grand charity the old child's home place sold to henry e huntington some years ago and which has been subdivided was a part of this land none of the old settlers ever placed much value on real estate and childs had no sooner closed this transaction than he proceeded to distribute some of the land among his own and his wife's relatives he also gave to the catholic church the block later bounded by sixth and seventh streets between broadway and hill where until a few years ago stood st vincent's college opened in eighteen fifty five on the plaza on the site now occupied by the pekin curio store in the boom year of eighteen eighty seven the church authorities sold this block for one hundred thousand dollars and moved the school to the corner of charity and washington streets andrew a boyle for whom the eastern suburb of los angeles boyle heights was named by william h workman arrived here in eighteen fifty eight as early as eighteen forty eight boyle had set out from mexico where he had been in business to return to the united states taking with him some twenty thousand mexican dollars at that time his entire fortune safely packed in a fortified claret box while attempting to board a steamer from a frail skiff at the mouth of the rio grande the churning by the paddle wheels capsized the skiff and boyle and his treasure were thrown into the water boyle narrowly escaped with his life but his treasure went to the bottom never to be recovered it was then said that boyle had perished and his wife on hearing the false report was killed by the shock quite as serious perhaps was the fact that an infant daughter was left on his hands the same daughter who later became the wife of my friend william h workman confiding this child to an aunt boyle went to the isthmus where he opened a shoe store and later coming north after a san francisco experience in the wholesale boot and shoe business he settled on the bluff which was to be thereafter associated with his family name he also planted a small vineyard and in the early seventies commenced to make wine digging a cellar out of the hill to store his product the brick house built by boyle on the heights in eighteen fifty eight and always a center of hospitality is still standing although recently remodeled by william h workman jr brother of boyle workman the banker who added a third story and made a cozy dwelling and it is probably therefore the oldest brick structure in that part of the town mendel was a younger brother of sam meyer and it is my impression that he arrived here in the late fifties he originally clerked for his brother and for a short time was in partnership with him and hilliard lowenstein in time meyer engaged in business for himself during a number of his best years mendel was well thought of socially with his fiddle often affording much amusement to his friends all in all he was a good-hearted jovial sort of a chap who too readily gave to others of his slender means about eighteen seventy five he made a visit to europe and spent more than he could afford at any rate in later life he did not prosper he died in los angeles a number of years ago thomas copley came here in eighteen fifty eight having met with many hardships while driving an ox team from fort leavenworth to salt lake and tramped the entire eight hundred miles between the mormon capital and san bernardino on arriving he became a waiter and worked for a while for the sisters hospital subsequently he married a lady of about twice his stature retiring to private life with a competence another rival of the late fifties was manuel ravenna an italian 
he started a grocery store and continued the venture for some time then he entered the saloon business on main street ravenna commissioned wells fargo and company to bring by express the first ice shipped to los angeles for a commercial purpose paying for it an initial price of twelve and a half cents per pound the ice came packed in blankets but the loss by melting plus the expense of getting it here made the real cost about twenty four cents a pound nevertheless it was a clever and profitable move and brought ravenna nearly all the best trade in town john butterfield was originally a new york stage driver and later the organizer of the american express company as well as projector of the morse telegraph line between new york and buffalo as the head of john butterfield and company he was one of my customers in eighteen fifty seven he contracted with the united states in eighteen fifty eight as president of the overland mail company to carry mail between san francisco and the missouri river to make this possible sections of the road afterward popularly referred to as the butterfield route were built and the surveyors bishop and beale were awarded the contract for part of the work it is my recollection that they used for this purpose some of the camels imported by the united states government and that these animals were in charge of greek george to whom i have already referred butterfield chose a route from san francisco coming down the coast to gilroy san jose and through the mountain passes on to visalia and fort tejon and then to los angeles in all some four hundred and sixty two miles from los angeles it ran eastward through el monte san bernardino temecula and warner's ranch to fort yuma and then by way of el paso to st louis in this manner butterfield arranged for what was undoubtedly the longest continuous stage line ever established the entire length being about two thousand eight hundred and eighty miles the butterfield stages began running in september eighteen fifty eight and when the first one from the east reached los angeles on october seventh just twenty days after it started there was a great demonstration accompanied by bonfires and the firing of cannon on this initial trip just one passenger made the through journey w l ormsby a reporter for the new york herald this stage reached san francisco on october tenth and there the accomplishment was the occasion as we soon heard of almost riotous enthusiasm stages were manned by a driver and a conductor or messenger both heavily armed Provender and relief stations were established along the route, as a rule not more than twenty miles apart, and sometimes half that distance. The schedule first called for two stages a week, then one stage in each direction every other day, and after a while this plan was altered to provide for a stage every day. There was little regularity, however, in the hours of departure, and still less in the time of arrival, and I recollect once leaving for San Francisco at the unearthly hour of two o'clock in the morning so uncertain indeed were the arrival and departure of stages that not only were passengers often left behind but mails were actually undelivered because no authorized person was on hand in the lone hours of the night to receive and distribute them such a ridiculous incident occurred in the fall of eighteen fifty eight when bags of mail destined for los angeles were carried on to san francisco and were returned by the stage making its way south and east fully six days later local newspapers were then more or less dependent for their exchanges from the great eastern centers on the courtesy of drivers or agents and editors were frequently acknowledging the receipt of such bundles from which with scissors and paste they obtained the so-called news items furnished to their subscribers george leckler here in 1853 who married henry hazard's sister drove a butterfield stage and picked up orders for me from customers along the route b w pyle a virginian by birth arrived in los angeles in eighteen fifty eight and became as far as i can recall the first exclusive jeweler and watchmaker although charlie ducomun as i have said had handled jewelry and watches for some years before in connection with other things pyle's store adjoined that of newmark kramer and company on commercial street and i soon became familiar with his methods he commissioned many of the stage drivers to work up business for him on the butterfield route and as his charges were enormous he was enabled within three or four years to establish himself in new york he was an exceedingly clever and original man and a good student of human affairs and i well remember his prediction that if lincoln should be elected president there would be civil war when the united states government first had under consideration the building of a trans isthmus canal pyle bought large tracts of land in nicaragua believing that the nicaraguan route would eventually be chosen 
Shortly after the selection of the Panama survey, however, I read one day in a local newspaper that B. W. Pyle had shot himself at the age of seventy years. In 1857, Phineas Banning purchased from one of the Dominguez brothers an extensive tract some miles to the north of San Pedro, along the arm of the sea, and established a new landing, which, in a little while, was to monopolize the harbor business and temporarily affect all operations at the old place. Here, on September 25, 1858, he started a community called, at first, both San Pedro New Town and New San Pedro, and later Wilmington the latter name suggested by the capital of Banning's native state of Delaware. Banning next cultivated a tract of 600 acres planted with grain and fruit, where, among other evidences of his singular enterprise, there was soon to be seen a large well connected with a steam pump of sufficient force to supply the commercial and irrigation wants of both Wilmington and San Pedro. Banning's founding of the former town was due, in part, to heavy losses sustained through a storm that seriously damaged his wharf, and, in part, to his desire to outdo J. J. Tomlinson, his chief business rival. The inauguration of the new shipping point on October 1, 1858, was celebrated by a procession on the water, when a line of barges loaded with visitors from Los Angeles and vicinity, and with freight, was towed to the decorated landing. A feature of the dedication was the assistance rendered by the ladies, who even tugged at the hawser, following which host and guests liberally partook of the sparkling beverages contributing to enliven the festive occasion. In a short time, the shipping there gave evidence of Banning's wonderful go-ahead spirit. He had had built, in San Francisco, a small steamer and some lighters for the purpose of carrying passengers and baggage to the large steamships lying outside the harbor. The enterprise was a shrewd move, for it shortened the stage trip about six miles, and so gave the new route a considerable advantage over that of all competitors. Banning, sometimes dubbed the Admiral, about the same time presented town lots to all of his friends, including Eugene Meyer and myself. And with Tim's Landing, the place became a favorite beach resort, but for want of foresight, most of these same lots were sold for taxes in the days of long ago. I kept mine for many years and finally sold it for twelve hundred dollars, while Meyer still owns his. As for Banning himself, he built a house on Canal Street, which he occupied many years, until he moved to a more commodious home situated half a mile north of the original location. At about this period, three packets plied between San Francisco and San Diego every ten days, leaving the Commercial Street Wharf of the northern city and stopping at various intermediate points, including Wilmington. These packets were the Clipper Brig Pride of the Sea, Captain Joseph S. Garcia, the Clipper Brig Boston, Commander W. H. Martin, and the Clipper Schooner Lewis Perry, then new and in charge of Captain Hughes. In the fall of 1858, finding that our business was not sufficiently remunerative to support four families, Newmark, Kramer, and Company dissolved. In the dissolution, I took the clothing part of the business, Newmark and Kramer retaining the dry goods. In November or December, Dr. John S. Griffin acquired San Pascual Rancho, the fine property which had once been the pride of Don Manuel Garfias. The latter had borrowed $3,000 at 4% per month to complete his manorial residence, which cost some $6,000 to build. But the ranch proving unfavorable for cattle, and Don Manuel being a poor manager, the debt of $3,000 soon grew into almost treble the original amount. When Griffin purchased the place, he gave Garfias an additional $2,000 to cover the stock, horses, and ranch tools, but even at that the doctor drove a decided bargain. As early as 1852, Garfias had applied to the Land Commission for a patent, but this was not issued until April 3, 1863, and the document, especially interesting because it bore the signature of Abraham Lincoln, brought little consolation to Garfias or his proud wife, nay Abila, who had then signed away all claim to the splendid property which was in time to play such a role in the development of Los Angeles, Pasadena, and their environs. On November 20th, Don Bernardo Yorba died, bequeathing to numerous children and grandchildren an inheritance of $110,000 worth of personal property, in addition to 37,000 acres of land. Sometime in December 1858, Juan Domingo, or as he was often called, Juan Cojo, or Lame John, because of a peculiar limp, died at his vineyard on the south side of Aliso Street, having for years enjoyed the esteem of the community as a good, substantial citizen. Domingo, 
who successfully conducted a wine and brandy business, was a Hollander by birth, and in his youth had borne the name of Johann Groningen. But after coming to California and settling among the Latin element, he had changed it, for what reason will never be known, to Juan Domingo, the Spanish for John Sunday. The coming of Domingo in 1827 was not without romance. He was a ship's carpenter and one of a crew of twenty-five on the brig Danube, which sailed from New York and was totally wrecked off San Pedro, only two or three souls, among them Domingo, being saved and hospitably welcomed by the citizens. On February 12, 1839, he married a Spanish woman, Raimunda Feliz, by whom he had a large family of children. A son, J. A. Domingo, was living until at least recently. A souvenir of Domingo's lameness in the county museum is a cane with which the doughty sailor often defended himself. Samuel Prentice, a Rhode Islander, was another of the Danube's shipwrecked sailors who was saved. He hunted and fished for a living and, about 1864 or 1865, died on Catalina Island. And there, in a secluded spot not far from the seat of his labors, he was buried. As a result of a complicated lumber deal, Captain Joseph S. Garcia, of the Pride of the Sea, obtained an interest in a small vineyard owned by Juan Domingo and San Savain, and through this relation, Garcia became a minor partner of San Savain in the Cucamonga winery. Mrs. Garcia is living in Pomona. The captain died some ten years ago at Ontario. Apropos of the three Louis referred to, Breer, Lichtenberger, and Roeder, all of that German stock which makes for good American citizenship, I do not suppose that there is any record of the exact date of Breer's arrival, although I imagine that it was in the early 60s. Lichtenberger, who served both as a city father and city treasurer, arrived in 1864, while Roeder used to boast that the ship on which he sailed to San Francisco, just prior to his coming to Los Angeles, in 1856, brought the first news of Buchanan's election to the presidency. Of the three, Breer, who was known as Iron Louis, on account of his magnificent physique, suggesting the poet's smith with large and sinewy hands, and muscles as strong as iron bands, was the least successful, and truly, till the end of his days, he earned his living by the sweat of his brow. In 1865, Lichtenberger and Roeder formed a partnership which, in a few years, was dissolved, each of them then conducting business independently, until, in comfortable circumstances, he retired. Roeder, an early and enthusiastic member of the Pioneers, is never so proud as when paying his last respects to a departed comrade, his unfeigned sorrow at the loss apparently being compensated for, if one may so express it, by the recognition he enjoyed as one of the Society's official committee. Two of the three Louis are dead. Footnote. Louis Roeder died on February 20th, 1915. End footnote. Other early wheelwrights and blacksmiths were Richard Maloney on Aliso Street, near Lambourne and Turner's Grocery, and Page and Gravel, who took John Goller's shop when he joined F. Foster at his Aliso Street Forge. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of Sixty Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 17 Admission to Citizenship, 1859. In 1858, my brother, to whom the greater opportunities of San Francisco had long appealed, decided upon a step that was to affect considerably my own modest affairs. This was to remove permanently to the north with my sister-in-law, and in the Los Angeles Star of January 22, 1859, there appeared the following. Mr. Joseph P. Newmark has established a commission house in San Francisco with a branch in this city. From his experience in business, Mr. Newmark will be a most desirable agent for the sale of our domestic produce in the San Francisco market, and we have no doubt will obtain the confidence of our merchants and shippers. This move of my brother's was made, as a matter of fact, at a time when Los Angeles, in one or two respects at least, seemed promising. On September 30th, the building commenced by John Temple in the preceding February, on the site of the present Bullard Block, was finished. Most of the upper floor was devoted to a theater, 
and I am inclined to think that the balance of the building was leased to the city, the courtroom being next to the theatre, and the ground floor being used as a market. To the latter move there was considerable opposition affecting, as the expenditures did, taxes and the public treasury, and one newspaper, after a spirited attack on the black Republicans, concluded its editorial with this patriotic appeal. Citizens, attend to your interests, guard your pocketbooks. This building is one of the properties to which I refer as sold by Hinchman, having been bought by Dr. J. S. Griffin and B. D. Wilson, who resold it in time to the county. A striking feature of this market building was the town clock, whose bell was pronounced fine-toned and sonorous. The clock and bell, however, were destined to share the fate of the rest of the structure, which, all in all, was not very well constructed. At last, the heavy rains of the early sixties played havoc with the tower, and, toward the end of 1861, the clock had set such a pace for itself, regardless of the rest of the universe, that the newspapers were full of facetious jibes concerning the once serviceable timepiece, and many were the queries as to whether something could not be done to roof the mechanism. The clock, however, remained uncovered until Bullard demolished the building to make room for the present structure. Elsewhere, I have referred to the attempt, shortly after I arrived here, or during the session of the legislature of 1854-55, to 55, to divide California into two states, the proposition, be it added, of a San Bernardino County representative. A committee of thirteen from different sections of the Commonwealth later substituted a bill providing for three states, Shasta in the north, California at the middle, Colorado in the south, but nothing evolving as a result of the effort, our assemblyman, Andres Pico, in 1859 fathered a measure for the segregation of the southern counties under the name of Colorado, when this bill passed both houses and was signed by the governor. It had to be submitted to the people, however, at the election in September 1859, and although nearly 2,500 ballots were cast in favor of the division, as against 800 in the negative, the movement was afterward stifled in Washington. Damien Marchesol and Victor Beaudry, having enthusiastically organized the Santa Anita Mining Company in 1858, N. H. Alexander, agent at Los Angeles for Wells Fargo and Company, in 1859 announced that the latter had provided scales for weighing gold dust and were prepared to transact a general exchange business. This was the same firm that had come through the crisis with unimpaired credit when Adams and Company and many others went to the wall in the great financial crash of 1855. I have mentioned the Mormon colony at San Bernardino and its connection as an offshoot with the great Mormon city, Salt Lake. Now I may add that each winter, for fifteen or twenty years, or until railroad connection was established, a lively and growing trade was carried on between Los Angeles and Utah. This was because the Mormons had no open road toward the outside world, except in the direction of Southern California, for snow covered both the Rockies and the Sierra Nevadas, and closed every other highway and trail. A number of Mormon wagon trains, therefore, went back and forth every winter over the 700 miles or more of fairly level, open roadways between Salt Lake and Los Angeles, taking back not only goods bought here, but much that was shipped from San Francisco to Salt Lake via San Pedro. I remember that in February 1859, these Mormon wagons arrived by the overland route almost daily. The third week in February witnessed one of the most interesting gatherings of rancheros characteristic of Southern California life I have ever seen. It was a typical rodeo, lasting two or three days, for the separating and regrouping of cattle and horses, and took place at the residence of William Workman at La Puente Rancho. Strictly speaking, the rodeo continued but two days or less, for inasmuch as the cattle to be sorted and branded had to be deprived for the time being of their customary nourishment, the work was necessarily one of despatch. Under the direction of a judge of the plains, on this occasion the polished cavalier Don Felipe Lugo, they were examined, parted and branded, or rebranded, with hot irons impressing a mark, generally a letter or odd monogram, duly registered at the courthouse, and protected by the county recorder's certificate. Never have I seen finer horsemanship than was there displayed by those whose task it was to pursue the animal and throw the lasso around the head or leg. And as often as most of those present had probably seen the feat performed, great was their enthusiasm when each vaquero brought down his victim. 
Among the guests were most of the rancheros of wealth and note, together with their attendants, all of whom made up a company ready to enjoy the unlimited hospitality for which the workmen were so renowned. Aside from the business in hand of disposing of such an enormous number of mixed-up cattle in so short a time, what made the occasion one of keen delight was the remarkable, almost astounding ability of the horseman in controlling his animal, for lassoing cattle was not his only forte. The vaquero of early days was a clever rider and handler of horses, particularly the bronco, so often erroneously spelled B-R-O-N-C-H-O, sometimes a mustang, sometimes an Indian pony. Out of a drove that had never been saddled, he would lasso one, attach a halter to his neck, and blindfold him by means of a strap some two or three inches in width fastened to the halter, after which he would suddenly mount the bronco and remove the blind when the horse, unaccustomed to discipline or restraint, would buck and kick for over a quarter of a mile, and then stop only because of exhaustion. With seldom a mishap, however, the vaquero almost invariably broke the mustang to the saddle within three or four days. This little Mexican horse, while perhaps not so graceful as his American brother, was noted for endurance, and he could lope from morning till night if necessary without evidence of serious fatigue. Speaking of this dexterity, I may add that now and then the early Californian vaquero gave a good exhibition of his prowess in the town itself. Runaways, due in part to the absence of hitching posts, but frequently to carelessness, occurred daily, and sometimes a clever horseman who happened to be near would pursue, overtake, and lasso the frightened steed before serious harm had been done. Among the professional classes, J. Lancaster Brent was always popular, but never more welcomed than on his return from Washington on February 26, 1859, when he brought the United States patent to the Dominguez Rancho, dated December 18, 1858, and the first document of land conveyance from the American government to reach California. In mercantile circles, Adolf Portugal became somewhat prominent, conducting a flourishing business here for a number of years after opening in 1854, and accumulating, before 1865, about $75,000. With this money, he then left Los Angeles and went to Europe, where he made an extremely unprofitable investment. He returned to Los Angeles and again engaged in mercantile pursuits, but he was never able to recover and died a pauper. Corbett, who at one time controlled with Dibley great ranch areas near Santa Barbara, and in 1859 was in partnership with Barker, owned the Santa Anita Rancho, which he later sold to William Wolfskill. From Los Angeles, Corbett went to Oregon, where he became, I think, a leading banker. Louis Mesmer arrived here in 1858, then went to Fraser River, and there, in eight months, he made $20,000 by baking for the Hudson Bay Company's troops. A year later, he was back in Los Angeles, and on Main Street, somewhere near Rakina, he started a bakery. In time, he controlled the local bread trade, supplying, among others, the government troops here. In 1864, Mesmer bought out the United States Hotel, previously run by Weber and Haas, and finally purchased from Don Juan and Padilla the land on which the building stood. This property, costing $3,000, extended 140 feet on Main Street and ran through to Los Angeles, on which street it had a frontage of about 60 feet. Mesmer's son, Joseph, is still living and is active in civic affairs. William Nordholt, a 49er, was also a resident of Los Angeles for some time. He was a carpenter and worked in partnership with Jim Barton, and when Barton was elected sheriff, Nordholt continued in business for himself. At length, in 1859, he opened a grocery store on the northwest corner of Los Angeles and First Streets, which he conducted for many years. Even in 1853, when I first knew him, Nord Holt had made a good start, and he soon accumulated considerable real estate on First Street, extending from Los Angeles to Maine. He shared his possessions with his Spanish wife, who attended his grocery, but after his death, in perhaps the late 70s, his children wasted their patrimony. Notwithstanding the opening of other hotels, the Bella Union continued throughout the 50s to be the representative headquarters of its kind in Los Angeles, and for a wide area around. On April 19, 1856, Flashner and Hamill took hold of the establishment, and a couple of years after that, Dr. J. B. Winston, who had local hotel experience, joined Flashner, and together they made improvements, adding the second story, 
which took five or six months to complete this step forward in the hostelry was duly celebrated on april fourteenth eighteen fifty nine at a dinner the new dining-room being advertised far and wide as one of the finest in all california shortly after this however marcus flashner who owned some thirty-five acres at the corner of maine and washington streets where he managed either a vineyard or an orange orchard met a violent death he used to travel to and from his property in a buggy and one day june twenty ninth eighteen fifty nine his horse ran away throwing him out and killing him in eighteen sixty john king flashner's brother-in-law entered the management of the bella union and by eighteen sixty one dr winston had sole control strolling again in imagination into the old bella union of this time i am reminded of a novel method then employed to call the guests to their meals when i first came to los angeles the hotel waiter rang a large bell to announce that all was ready but about the spring of eighteen fifty nine the fact that another meal had been concocted was signalized by the blowing of a shrill steam whistle placed on the hotel's roof this brought together both the regulars and transients everyone scurrying to be first at the dining-room door about the middle of april wells fargo and company's writer made a fast run between san pedro and los angeles bringing all the mail matter from the vessels and covering the more than twenty seven miles of the old roundabout route in less than an hour the protestant church has been represented in los angeles since the first service in mayor nichols's home and the missionary work of adam bland but it was not until may fourth eighteen fifty nine that any attempt was made to erect an edifice for the protestants in the community then a committee including isaac s k ogier a j king columbus sims thomas foster william h shore n a potter j r gitchell and henry d barrows began to collect funds rev william e boardman an episcopalian was invited to take charge but subscriptions coming in slowly he conducted services first in one of the school buildings and then in the courthouse until eighteen sixty two when he left despite its growing communications with san francisco los angeles for years was largely dependent upon sail and steamboat service and each year the need of a better highway to the north for stages became more and more apparent finally in may eighteen fifty nine General Ezra Drown was sent as a commissioner to Santa Barbara to discuss the construction of a road to that city, and on his return he declared the project quite practicable. The supervisors had agreed to devote a certain sum of money, and the Santa Barbarinos, on their part, were to vote on the proposition of appropriating $15,000 for the work. Evidently, the citizens voted favorably, for in July of the following year, james thompson of los angeles contracted for making the new road through santa barbara county from the los angeles to the san luis obispo lines passed through ventura or san buenaventura as it was then more poetically called santa barbara and out by the gaviota pass all in all a distance of about one hundred and twenty five miles some five or six months were required to finish the rough work and over thirty thousand dollars was expended for that alone Winfield Scott Hancock, whom I came to know well and who had been here before, arrived in Los Angeles in May 1859 to establish a depot for the quartermaster's department, which he finally located at Wilmington, naming it Drum Barracks after Adjutant General Richard Coulter Drum, for several years at the head of the Department of the West. Hancock himself was quartermaster and had an office in a brick building on Main Street near 3rd, and he was in charge of all government property here and at yuma arizona territory then a military post he thus both bought and sold advertising at one time for example a call for three or four hundred thousand pounds of barley and again offering for sale on behalf of poor uncle sam the important item of a lone braying mule hancock invested liberally in california projects and became interested with others in the bear valley mines and at length had the good luck to strike a rich and paying vein of gold quartz Beaudry and march assault were among the first handlers of ice in los angeles having an ice house in eighteen fifty nine where in the springtime they stored the frozen product taken from the mountain lakes fifty miles away the ice was cut into cubes of about 100 pounds each, packed down the canyons by a train of 30 to 40 mules, and then brought in wagons to Los Angeles. By September 1860, wagon loads of San Bernardino ice, or perhaps one would better say compact snow, 
were hawked about town and bought up by saloon keepers and others having been transported in the way i have just described a good seventy-five miles later ice was shipped here from san francisco and soon after it reached town the saloons displayed signs soliciting orders considering the present popularity of the silver dollar along the entire western coast it may be interesting to recall the stamping of these coins for the first time in california at the san francisco mint this was in the spring of 1859, soon after which they began to appear in Los Angeles. A few years later, in 1863, and for ten or fifteen years thereafter, silver half-dimes, coined in San Francisco, were to be seen here occasionally, but they were never popular. The larger silver piece, the dime, was more common, although for a while it also had little purchasing power. As late as the early 70s it was not welcome, and many a time I have seen dimes thrown into the street as if they were worthless. This prejudice against the smaller silver coins was much the same as the feeling which even today obtains with many people on the coast against the copper cent. When the nickel in the 80s came into use, the old Californian tradition as to coinage began to disappear, and this opened the way for the introduction of the one cent piece, which is more and more coming into popular favor. In the year 1859, the Hellman brothers, Isaias W. and Herman W., arrived here in a sailing vessel with Captain Morton. I. W. Hellman took a clerkship with his cousin, I. M. Hellman, who had arrived in 1854 and was establishing in the stationary line in Mellis's Row, while H. W. Hellman went to work in June 1859 for Phineas Banning at Wilmington. I. W. Hellman immediately showed much ability and greatly improved his cousin's business. By 1865, he was in trade for himself, selling dry goods at the corner of Main and Commercial Streets as the successor to A. Portugal, while H. W. Hellman, father of Marco H. Hellman, the banker, and father-in-law of the public-spirited citizen Louis M. Cole, became my competitor, as will be shown later in the wholesale grocery business. John Philbin, an Irishman, arrived here penniless late in the 50s, but with my assistance started a small store at Fort Tejon, then a military post necessary for the preservation of order on the Indian Reservation, and there, during the short space of 18 months, he accumulated $20,000. Illness compelled him to leave, and I bought his business and property. After completing this purchase, I engaged a clerk in San Francisco to manage the new branch. As John Philman had been very popular, the new clerk also called himself John, and soon enjoyed equal favor. It was only when Bob Wilson came into town one day from the fort and told me, That chap John is gambling your whole damned business away. He plays seven up at twenty dollars a game, and when out of cash puts up blocks of merchandise, that I investigated and discharged him, sending Caspar Cohn, who had recently arrived from Europe, to take his place. It was in 1859, or a year before Abraham Lincoln was elected president, that I bought out Philbin, and at the breaking out of the war, the troops were withdrawn from Fort Tejon, thus ending my activity there as a merchant. We disposed of the stock as best we could, but the building, which had cost $3,000, brought at forced sale just 50. Fort Tejon, established about 1854, I may add, after it attained some fame as the only military post in Southern California where snow ever fell, and also as the scene of the earthquake phenomena I have described, was abandoned altogether as a military station on September 11, 1864. Philbin removed to Los Angeles, where he invested in some 50 acres of vineyard along San Pedro Street, extending as far south as the present Pico, and I still have a clear impression of the typical old adobe there, so badly damaged by the rains of 1890. Caspar remained in my employ until he set up in business at Red Bluff, Tahama County, where he continued until January 1866. In more recent years, he has come to occupy an enviable position as a successful financier. Somewhat less than six years after my arrival, or, to be accurate, on the 15th day of August 1859, about the time of my mother's death at Lebeau, and satisfying one of my most ardent ambitions, I entered the family of Uncle Sam, carrying from the district court here a red sealed document to me of great importance, my newly acquired citizenship being attested by Charles R. Johnson, clerk, and John O. Wheeler, deputy. On September 3rd, the Los Angeles Star made the following announcement and salutation. Called to the bar. At the present term of the district court for the first judicial district, 
Mr. M. J. Newmark was called to the bar. We congratulate Mr. Newmark on his success and wish him a brilliant career in his profession. This kindly reference was to my brother-in-law, who had read law in the office of E. J. C. Kewen, then on Main Street, opposite the Bella Union, and had there, in the preceding January, when already eleven attorneys were practicing there, hung out his shingle as notary public and conveyancer, an office to which he was reappointed by the governor in 1860, soon after he had been made commissioner for the state of Missouri to reside in Los Angeles. About that same time he began to take a lively interest in politics, being elected on October 13, 1860, a delegate to the Democratic County Convention. A.J. King was also admitted to the bar toward the end of that year. We who have such praise for the rapid growth of the population in Los Angeles must not forget the faithful midwives of early days, when there was not the least indication that there would ever be a lying-in hospital here. First, one naturally recalls old Mrs. Simmons, the Sarah Gamp of the 50s, while her professional sister of the 60s was Lydia Rebick, whose name also will be pleasantly spoken by old-timers. A brother of Mrs. Rebick was James H. Whitworth, a rancher, who came to Los Angeles County in 1857. Residents of Los Angeles today have but a faint idea, I suppose, of what exertion we cheerfully submitted to, 40 or 50 years ago, in order to participate in a little pleasure. This was shown at an outing in 1859, on and by the sea, made possible through the courtesy of my hospitable friend Phineas Banning, details of which illustrate the social conditions then prevailing here. Banning had invited fifty or sixty ladies and gentlemen to accompany him to Catalina, and at about half-past five o'clock on a June morning the guests arrived at Banning's residence, where they partook of refreshments. Then they started in decorated stages for New San Pedro, where the host, who, by the way, was a man of most genial temperament, fond of a joke, and sure to infuse others with his good-heartedness, regaled his friends with a hearty breakfast, not forgetting anything likely to both warm and cheer. After ample justice had been done to this feature, the picnickers boarded Banning's little steamer Comet and made for the outer harbor. There they were transferred to the United States Coast Survey Ship Active, which steamed away so spiritedly that in two hours the passengers were off Catalina, nothing meanwhile having been left undone to promote the comfort of everyone aboard the vessel. During this time, Captain Alder and his officers, resplendent in their naval uniforms, held a reception and unwilling that the merrymakers should be exposed without provisions to the wilds of the less trodden island they set before them a substantial ship's dinner once ashore the visitors strolled along the beach and across that part of the island then most familiar and at four o'clock the members of the party were again walking the decks of the government vessel steaming back slowly san pedro was reached after sundown and having again been bundled into the stages the excursionists were back in los angeles about ten o'clock I have said that most of the early political meetings took place at the residence of Don Ignacio de Valle. I recall, however, a mass meeting and a barbecue in August 1859 in a grove at El Monte owned by innkeeper Thompson. Benches were provided for the ladies, prompting the editor of the Star to observe, with characteristic gallantry, that the seats were fully occupied by an array of beauty such as no other portion of the state ever witnessed. On September 11th, Eberhard and Cole opened the Lafayette Hotel on Main Street, on the site opposite the Belle Union, where once had stood the residence of Don Eluio de Celis. Particular inducements to families desiring quiet and the attraction of a table supplied with the choicest viands and delicacies of the season were duly advertised, but the proprietors met with only a moderate response. On January 1st, 1862, Eberhard withdrew, and Frederick W. Cole took into partnership Henry Dockweiler, father of two of our very prominent young men, J. H. Dockweiler, the civil engineer, and in 1889, city surveyor, and Isidore B. Dockweiler, the attorney, and Chris Fleur. In two years, Dockweiler had withdrawn, leaving Fleur as sole proprietor, and he continued as such until, in the 70s, he took Charles Gerson in partnership with him. It is my recollection, in fact, that Fleur was associated with this hotel in one capacity or another until its name was changed, first to the Cosmopolitan, and then to the St. Elmo. Various influences contributed to causing radical social changes, particularly throughout the county. 
when dr john s griffin and other pioneers came here they were astonished at the hospitality of the ranch owners who provided for them however numerous shelter food and even fresh saddle horses and this bounteous provision for the wayfarer continued until the migrating population had so increased as to become something of a burden and economic conditions put a break on unlimited entertainment then a slight reaction set in and by the sixties a movement to demand some compensation for such service began to make itself felt in eighteen fifty nine don vicente de la osa advertised that he would afford accommodation for travelers by way of his ranch el encino but that to protect himself he must consider it an essential part of the arrangement that visitors should act on the good old rule and pay as one goes in eighteen fifty nine c h clausen a native of germany opened a cigar factory in the signoret building on main street north of arcadia and believing that tobacco could be successfully grown in los angeles county he sent to cuba for some seed and was soon making cigars from the local product i fancy that the plants degenerated because although others experimented with los angeles tobacco the growing of the leaf here was abandoned after a few years h newmark and company handled much tobacco for sheep wash and so came to buy the last southern california crop when i speak of sheep wash i refer to a solution made by steeping tobacco in water and used to cure a skin disease known as scab it was always applied after shearing for then wool could not be affected and the process was easier talking of tobacco i may say that the commercial cigarette now for sale everywhere was not then to be seen people rolled their own cigarettes generally using brown paper but sometimes the white which came in reams of sheets about six by ten inches in size which came in reams of sheets about six by ten inches in size kentucky leaf was most in vogue and the first brand of granulated tobacco that i remember was known as sultana clay pipes then packed in barrels were used a good deal more than now and briar pipes much less there was no duty on imported cigars and their consequent cheapness brought them into general consumptions there was no duty on imported cigars and their consequent cheapness brought them into general consumption practically all of the native female population smoked cigarettes for it was a custom of the country but the american ladies did not indulge while spending an enjoyable hour at the county museum recently i noticed a cigarette case of finely woven matting that had once belonged to antonio maria lugo and a bundle of cigarettes rolled up like so many matches by andres pico and both the little cigarillos and the holder will give a fair understanding of these customs of the past besides the use of tobacco in cigar and cigarette form and for pipes there was much consumption of the weed by chewers peach brand a black plug saturated with molasses and packed in caddies a term more commonly applied to little boxes for tea was the favorite chewing tobacco fifty years or more ago it would hardly be an exaggeration to say that nine out of ten americans in los angeles indulged in this habit some of whom certainly exposed us to the criticism of charles dickens and others who found so much fault with our manners the pernicious activity of rough or troublesome characters brings to recollection an aged indian named polonia whom pioneers will easily recollect as having been bereft of his sight by his own people because of his unnatural ferocity he was six foot four inches in height and had once been endowed with great physical strength he was clad for the most part in a tattered blanket so that his mere appearance was sufficient to impress if not to intimidate the observer only recently in fact mrs solomon lazard told me that to her and her girl playmates polonia and his fierce countenance were the terror of their lives he may thus have deserved to forfeit his life for many crimes but the idea of cutting a man's eyes out for any offense whatever no matter how great is revolting in the extreme the year i arrived and for some time thereafter polonia slept by night in the corridor of don manuel raquina's house with the aid of only a very long stick this blind indian was able to find his way all over the town sometime in eighteen fifty nine daniel sexton a veteran of the battles of san bartolo and the mesa became possessed of the idea that gold was secreted in large sacks near the ruins of san juan capistrano and getting permission he burrowed so far beneath the house of a citizen that the latter fearing his whole home was likely to cave in frantically begged the gold digger to desist 
Sexton, in fact, came near digging his own grave instead of another's, and was for a while the good-natured butt of many a pun. Jacob A. Morenhout, a native of Antwerp, Belgium, who had been French consul for a couple of years at Monterey, in the later days of the Mexican regime, removed to Los Angeles on October 29, 1859, on which occasion the consular flag of France was raised at his residence in this city. As early as January 13, 1835, President Andrew Jackson had appointed Mornhout U.S. Consul to the Otaheite and the rest of the Society Islands. The original consular document, with its quaint spelling and signed by the vigorous pen of that president, existing today in a collection owned by Dr. E. M. Clinton of Los Angeles, and the Belgian had thus so profited by experience in promoting trade and amicable relations between foreign nations that he was prepared to make himself persona grata here. Salvos of cannon were fired, while the French citizens, accompanied by a band, formed in procession and marched to the plaza. In the afternoon, Don Louis Sansevain, in honor of the event, set a groaning and luxurious table for a goodly company at his hospitable residence. Their patriotic toasts were gracefully proposed and as gracefully responded to. The festivities continued until the small hours of the morning, after which Consul Morenhout was declared a duly initiated Angeleno. Surrounded by most of his family, Don Juan Bandini, a distinguished Southern Californian and a worthy member of one of the finest Spanish families here, after a long and painful illness, died at the home of his daughter and son-in-law, Doña Arcadia and Don Abel Stearns, in Los Angeles on November 4, 1859. Don Juan had come to California far back in the early 20s, and to Los Angeles so soon thereafter that he was a familiar and welcome figure here many years before I arrived. It is natural that I should look back with pleasure and satisfaction to my association with a gentleman so typically Californian, warm-hearted, genial, and social in the extreme, and one who dispensed so large and generous a hospitality. He came with his father, who eventually died here and was buried at the old San Gabriel Mission, and at one time possessed the Jerupa Rancho, where he lived. Don Juan was a lawyer by profession and had written the best part of a history of early California, the manuscript of which went to the State University. The passing glimpse of Bandini, in sunlight and in shadow, recorded by Dana in his classic Two Years Before the Mast, adds to the fame already enjoyed by this native Californian. Himself of a good-sized family, Don Juan married twice. His first wife, courted in 1823, was Dolores, daughter of Captain José Estudillo, a comandante at Monterey, and of that union were born Doña Arcadia, first the wife of Abel Stearns, and later of Colonel R. S. Baker, Doña Isadora, who married Lieutenant Cave J. Coutts, a cousin of General Grant, Doña Josefa, later the wife of Pedro C. Carrillo, father of J. J. Carrillo, formerly marshal here and now justice of the peace at Santa Monica, and the sons José María Bandini, and Juanito Bandini. Don Juan's second wife was Refugio, a daughter of Santiago Arguello and a granddaughter of the governor who made the first grant of land to Rancheros of Los Angeles. She it was who nursed the wounded Kearney and who became a friend of Lieutenant William T. Sherman, once a guest in her home. And she was also the mother of Doña Dolores, later the wife of Charles R. Johnson, and of Doña Margarita, whom Dr. James B. Winston married after his rollicking bachelor days. By Bandini's second marriage there were three sons, Juan de la Cruz Bandini, Alfredo Bandini, and Arturo Bandini. The financial depression of 1859 affected the temperament of citizens so much that little or no attention was paid to holidays, with the one exception, perhaps, of the Bella Union's poorly patronized Christmas dinner, and during 1860 many small concerns closed their doors altogether. I have spoken to the fact that brick was not much used when I first came to Los Angeles and have shown how it soon after became more popular as a building material. This was emphasized during 1859 when 31 brick buildings, such as they were, were put up. In December, Benjamin Hayes, then district judge and holding court in the dingy old adobe at the corner of Spring and Franklin Streets, ordered the sheriff to secure and furnish another place, and despite the fact that there was only a depleted treasury to meet the new outlay of five or six thousand dollars, few persons attempted to deny the necessity. The fact of the matter 
was that when it rained water actually poured through the ceiling and ran down the courtroom walls splattering all over the judge's desk to such an extent that umbrellas might very conveniently have been brought into use all of which led to the limit of human patience if not of human endurance in 1859 one of the first efforts toward the formation of a public library was made when felix bachman meyer j newmark william h workman sam foy h s allinson and others organized a library association with john temple as president j j warner vice president francis mellis treasurer and israel fleischman secretary the association established a reading room in don abel stearns's arcadia block an immediate and important acquisition was the collection of books that had been assembled by Henry Mellis for his own home. Other citizens contributed books, periodicals, and money, and the messengers of the overland mail undertook to get such eastern newspapers as they could for the perusal of the library members. Five dollars was charged as an initiation fee and a dollar for monthly dues, but insignificant as was the expense, the undertaking was not well patronized by the public, and the project, to the regret of many, had to be abandoned. This effort to establish a library recalls an Angeleno of the fifties, Ralph Emerson, a cousin, I believe, though somewhat distantly removed, of the famous Concord philosopher. He lived on the west side of Alameda Street, in an adobe known as Emerson's Row, between First and Aliso Streets, where Miss Mary E. Hoyt, assisted by her mother, had a school, and where at one time Emerson, a strong competitor of mine in the Hyde business, had his office fire destroyed part of their home late in 1859 and again in the following september emerson served as a director on the library board both he and his wife being among the most refined and attractive people of the neighborhood it must have been late in november that miss hoyt announced the opening of her school at number two emerson row in doing which she followed a custom in vogue with private schools at that time and published the endorsements of leading citizens or patrons Again in 1861, Miss Hoyt advertised to give instruction in the higher branches of English education with French drawing and ornamental needlework for $5 a month, while $3 was asked for the teaching of the common branches and needlework, and only $2 for teaching the elementary courses. Miss Hoyt's move was probably due to the inability of the Board of Education to secure an appropriation with which to pay the public school teachers. This lack of means led not only to a general discussion of the problem, but to the recommendation that Los Angeles schools be graded and a high school started. Following a dry year and especially a fearful heat wave in October, which suddenly ran the mercury up to 110 degrees, December witnessed heavy rains in the mountains inundating both valleys and towns. On the 4th of December, the most disastrous rain known in the history of the Southland set in, precipitating within a single day and night 12 inches of water and causing the rise of the San Gabriel and other rivers to a height never before recorded and such a cataclysm that sand and debris was scattered far and wide. Lean and weakened from the ravaging drought through which they had just passed, the poor cattle, now exposed to the elements of cold rain and wind, fell in vast numbers in their tracks. The bed of the Los Angeles River was shifted for perhaps a quarter of a mile many houses in town were cracked and otherwise damaged and some caved in altogether the front of the old church attacked through a leaking roof disintegrated swayed and finally gave way filling the neighborhood street with impassable heaps i have spoken of the market house built by john temple for the city on december twenty ninth there was a sale of the stalls by mayor d marchesault and all except six booths were disposed of each for the term of three months one hundred and seventy three dollars was the rental agreed upon and dodson and company bid successfully for nine out of thirteen of the stalls by the following month however complaints were made in the press that though the city fathers had condescended to let the suffering public have another market they still prevented the free competition desired and by the end of august it was openly charged that the manner in which the city market was conducted showed a gross piece of favoritism and that the city treasury on this account would suffer a monthly loss of one hundred dollars in rents alone about 1859, John Murat, following in the wake of Henry Kuhn, proprietor of the New York Brewery, established the Gambrinus in the block bounded by Los Angeles, San Pedro, and First, and what has become Second Streets. The brewery, notwithstanding its spacious yard, was anything but an extensive institution, and the quality of the product dispensed to the public left much to be desired. But it was beer, and Murat has the distinction of having been one of the first Los Angeles brewers the new york's spigot a suggestive souvenir of those convivial days picked up by george w hazard 
now enriches a local museum. These reminiscences recall still another brewer, Christian Henny, at whose popular resort on Main Street on the last evening of 1859, following some conferences in the old Round House, 38 Los Angeles Germans met and formed an association which they called the Teutonia Concordia. The object was to promote social intercourse, especially among Germans, and to further the study of German song. C. H. Clausen was chosen first president, H. Hamel vice president, H. Heinz secretary, and Lorenzo Leck treasurer. How great were the problems confronting the national government in the development of our continent may be gathered from the strenuous efforts and the results to encourage an overland mail route. $600,000 a year was the subsidy granted the Butterfield Company for running two mail coaches each way a week, yet the postal revenue for the first year was but $27,000, leaving a deficit more than half a million. But this was not all that was discouraging. Politicians attacked the stage route administration, and then the newspapers had to come to the rescue and point out the advantages as compared with the ocean routes. Indians also were an obstacle, and with the arrival of every stage, one expected to hear the sensational story of ambushing and murder rather than the yarn of a monotonous trip. When new reports of such outrages were brought in, new outcries were raised, and new petitions calling on the government for protection were hurriedly circulated. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Sixty Years in Southern California, eighteen fifty three to nineteen thirteen by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter eighteen First Experience with the Telegraph. Eighteen sixty. In eighteen sixty, Maurice Kramer was elected county treasurer, succeeding H. N. Alexander, who had entered the service of Wells Fargo and Company and he attended to this new function at his store on Commercial Street, where he kept the county funds. I had my office in the same place, and the salary of the treasurer at the time being but $125 a month, with no allowance for an assistant, I agreed to act as deputy treasurer without pay. As a matter of fact, I was a sort of emergency deputy only, and accepted the responsibility as an accommodation to Kramer, in order that when he was out of town there might be someone to take charge of his affairs. It is very evident, however, that I did not appreciate the danger connected with this little courtesy, since it often happened that there were from forty to fifty thousand dollars in the money chest. An expert burglar could have opened the safe without special effort, and might have got scot free, for the only protector at night was my nephew, Caspar Cohn, a mere youth, who clerked for me and slept on the premises. Inasmuch as no bank had as yet been established in Los Angeles, Kramer carried the money to Sacramento twice a year. Nor was this transportation of the funds, first by steamer to San Francisco, thence by boat inland, without danger. The state was full of desperate characters who would cut a throat or scuttle a ship for a great deal less than the amount involved. At the end of five or six years, Kramer was succeeded as county treasurer by J. Huber, Jr., I may add, incidentally, that the funds in question could have been transported north by Wells Fargo and Company, but their charges were exorbitant. At a later period, when they were better equipped and rates had been reduced, they carried the state money. On January 2nd, Joseph Paulding, a Marylander, died. Twenty-seven years before, he came by way of the Gila, and boasted having made the first two mahogany billiard tables constructed in California. The same month, attention was directed to a new industry, the polishing and mounting of abalone shells, then as now found on the coast of Southern California. A year or so later, G. Fisher was displaying a shell brooch, colored much like an opal and mounted in gold. By 1866, the demand for abalone shells had so increased that over $14,000 worth was exported from San Francisco while a year later consignments valued at not less than $36,000 were sent out through the Golden Gate. Even though the taste of today considers this shell as hardly deserving of such a costly setting, it is nevertheless true that these early ornaments, much handsomer than many specimens of quartz jewelry, soon became quite a fad in Los Angeles. 
natives and indians especially took a fancy to the abalone shell and even much later earrings of that material were worn by the crow scout curly a survivor of the custer massacre in 1874 r w jackson a shell jeweler on montgomery street san francisco was advertising here for the rarities offering as much as forty and fifty dollars for a single sound red black or silver shell and from fifty to one hundred dollars for a good green or blue one incidentally it is interesting to note that the chinese consumed the abalone meat in large quantities broom making was a promising industry in the early sixties the carpenters of los nietos and f w gibson of el monte being among the pioneers in this handiwork several thousand brooms were made in that year and since they brought three dollars a dozen and cost but eleven cents each for the handles and labor exclusive of the corn a good profit was realized major edward harold fitzgerald well known for campaigns against both indians and bandits died on january ninth and was buried with military honors on january tenth bartholomew's rocky mountain circus held forth on the plaza people coming in from miles around to see the show it was then that the circus proprietor sought to quiet the nerves of the anxious by the large lettered announcement a strict police is engaged for the occasion the printing of news editorials and advertisements in both english and spanish recalls again not only some amusing incidents in court activities resulting from the inability of jurists and others to understand the two languages but also the fact that in the early sixties sermons were preached in the catholic church at los angeles in english and spanish the former being spoken at one mass the latter at another english proper names such as john and benjamin were spanished into juan and benito and common spanish terms persisted in english advertisements as when don juan avila and fernando sepulveda in january announced that they would run the horse coyote one thousand varas for three thousand dollars in eighteen sixty two also when Siriaco arza was executed for the murder of frank riley the peddler and the prisoner had made a speech to the crowd the sheriff read the warrant for the execution in both english and spanish still another illustration of the use of spanish here side by side with english is found in the fact that in 1858 the los angeles assessment rolls were written in spanish although by 1860 the entries were made in english only a letter to the editor of the star published on january 28 1860 will confirm my comments on the primitive school conditions in los angeles in the first decade or two after i came the writer complained of the filthy condition of the boys department school number one in which to judge by the mud the floor did not seem to have been swept for months the editor then took up the cudgel saying that the board formerly paid a man for keeping the schoolroom clean but that the common council had refused any longer to pass the janitor's bills adding that in his opinion the council had acted wisely if the teacher had really wished the schoolroom floor to be cleaned contended the economical editor he should have appointed a pupil to swing a broom each day or at least each week and otherwise perform the necessary duties on behalf of the health of the school the year eighteen sixty witnessed the death of don antonio maria lugo brother of don jose ignacio lugo grandfather of the wolfskills uncle of general vallejo and the father-in-law of colonel isaac williams who preceded lugo to the grave by four years for a long time lugo lived in a spacious adobe built in eighteen nineteen near the present corner of east second and san pedro streets and there the sons for whom he obtained the san bernardino rancho were born in earlier days or from eighteen thirteen don antonio lived on the san antonio ranch near what is now compton and so well did he prosper there that eleven leagues were not enough for the support of his cattle and flocks it was a daughter of lugo who having married a perez and being made a widow became the wife of stephen c foster her daughter in turn marrying wallace woodworth and becoming maria antonia perez de woodworth and lugo who used to visit them and the business establishments of the town was a familiar figure as a sturdy caballero in the streets of los angeles his ornamental sword strapped in spanish soldier fashion to his equally ornamental saddle don antonio died about the first of february aged eighty-seven years 
about the middle of february john temple fitted up the large hall over the city market as a theatre providing for it a stage some forty-five by twenty feet in size in those days considered an abundance of platform space and a private box on each side whose possession became at once the ambition of every los angeles gallant temple brought an artist from san francisco to paint the scenery los angeles then boasting of no one clever enough for the work and the same genius supervised the general decoration of the house what was considered a record-breaking effort at making the public comfortable was undertaken in furnishing the parquet with armchairs and in filling the gallery with two tiers of raised benches guaranteeing some chance of looking over any broad sombreros in front and to cap the enterprise temple brought down a company of players especially to dedicate his new house about february twentieth the actors arrived on the old senator and while i do not recall who they were or what they produced i believe that they first held forth on washington's birthday when it was said the scenery is magnificent surpassing anything before exhibited in this city the spring of eighteen sixty was notable for the introduction of the pony express as a potent factor in the despatch of transcontinental mail and although this new service never included los angeles as one of its terminals it greatly shortened the time required and naturally if indirectly benefited the southland speed was indeed an ambition of the new management and some rather extraordinary results were attained about april twentieth soon after the pony express was started messages were rushed through from st louis to san francisco in eight and a half days and it was noised about that the butterfields planned a rival pony express over a route three hundred miles shorter that it would reach the coast in seven days about the end of april mail from london and liverpool reached los angeles in twenty or twenty one days and i believe that the fastest time that the pony express ever made was in march eighteen sixty one when president lincoln's message was brought here in seven days and seventeen hours this was somewhat quicker than the passage of the report about fort sumter a month afterward which required twelve days and considerably faster than the transmission by the earlier methods of eighteen fifty of the intelligence that california had been admitted to the union a bit of news of the greatest possible importance yet not at all known here i have been told until six weeks after congress enacted the law which reminds me that the death of elizabeth barrett browning the poet although occurring in italy on june twenty ninth eighteen sixty one was first announced in los angeles on the seventeenth of the following august in february or march the sewer crossing los angeles street and connecting the bella union with the zanja which passed through the premises of francis mellis burst probably as the result of recent rains discharging its contents into the common yard and in short order mellis found himself minus two very desirable tenants for a while he thought of suing the city and then he decided to stop the sewer effectually as soon as it was plugged up however the bella union found itself cut off from its accustomed outlet and there was soon a great uproar in the busy hostelry the upshot of the matter was that the bella union proprietors commenced suit against mellis this was the first sewer really a small square wooden pipe whose construction inaugurated an early chapter in the annals of sewer building and control in los angeles competition for government trade was keen in the sixties and energetic efforts were made by merchants to secure their share of the crumbs as well as the loaves that might fall from uncle sam's table for that reason captain winfield scott hancock easily added to his popularity as quartermaster early in eighteen sixty by preparing a map in order to show the war department the relative positions of the various military posts in this district and to emphasize the proximity of los angeles one day in the spring a stranger called upon me with the interesting information that he was an inventor which led me to observe that someone ought to devise a contrivance with which to pluck oranges an operation then performed by climbing into the tree and pulling the fruit from the branches shortly after the interview many of us went to the grove of jean louis saint savin to see a simple but ingenious appliance for picking the golden fruit a pair of pincers on a light pole were operated from below by a wire and when the wire was pulled the fruit quite unharmed by scratch or pressure fell safely into a little basket fastened close to the pincers in the same year pierre sansevain established the first california wine house in new york and bought the cucamonga vineyard where he introduced new and better varieties of grapes 
but bad luck overtook him. In 1870, grasshoppers ate the leaves and destroyed the crop. Small as was the population of Los Angeles County at about this time, there was nevertheless for a while an exodus to Texas, due chiefly to the difficulty experienced by white immigrants in competing with Indian ranch and vineyard laborers. Toward the middle of March, much interest was manifested in the welfare of a native Californian named Serbo, sometimes erroneously given as Serbolo and even Servolo, Varela, who, under the influence of bad whiskey, had assaulted and nearly killed a companion, and who seemed certain of a long time in the state prison. It was recalled, however, that when, in the fall of 1846, the fiendish Flores, resisting the invasion of the United States forces, had captured a number of Americans and condemned them to be dragged out and shot, Varela, then a soldier under Flores, and a very brave fellow, broke from the ranks, denounced the act as murder, declared that the order should never be carried out except over his dead body, and said and did such a number of things more or less melodramatic that he finally saved the lives of the American prisoners. Great sympathy was expressed, therefore, when it was discovered that this half-forgotten hero was in the toils, and few persons, if any, were sorry when Varela was induced to plead guilty to assault and battery, enabling the court to deal leniently with him. Varela became more and more addicted to strong drink, and some years later he was the victim of foul play, his body being found in an unfrequented part of town. A scrapbook souvenir of the 60s gives us an idyllic view of the contemporaneous Pueblo life, furnishing at the same time an idea of the newspaper English of that day. It reads as follows. With the exception of a little legitimate shooting affair last Saturday night, by which some fellow had well nigh the top of his head knocked off, and one or two knockdowns and drag outs, we have had a very peaceful week indeed. Nothing has occurred to disturb the even tenor of our way, and our good people seem to be given up to the quiet enjoyment of delicious fruits and our unequaled climate, each one literally under his own vine and fig tree, reveling in fancy's flights, or luxuriating among the good things which he finds temptingly at hand. The demand for better lighting facilities led the Common Council to make a contract, toward the end of March, with Tiffany and Wetherid who were given a franchise to lay pipes through the streets and to establish gas works here, but the attempt proved abortive. In this same year, the trip east by the Overland stage route, which has formerly required nearly a month, was accomplished in 18 or 19 days, and toward the end of March the Overland Company replaced the mud wagons they had been using between Los Angeles and San Francisco with brightly painted and better upholstered Concord coaches. Then the Los Angeles office was on Spring Street between 1st and 2nd, on the lot later bought by Louis Roder for a wagon shop, and now the site of Roder Block. And there, for the price of $200, tickets could be obtained for the entire journey to St. Louis. Foreign coin circulated in Los Angeles, as I have said, for many years, and even up to the early 60s, Mexican money was accepted at par with our own. Improved facilities for intercourse with the outside world, however, affected the markets here, and in the spring of that year several merchants refused to receive the specie of our southern neighbor at more than its actual value as silver. As a result, these dealers, though perhaps but following the trend elsewhere, were charged openly with a combination to obtain an illegitimate profit. In 1860, while Dr. T.J. White was postmaster, a regulation was made ordering all mail not called for to be sent to the dead letter office in Washington, within a week after such mail had been advertised. But it was not until the fall of 1871 that this order was really put into operation in our neighborhood. For some time, this worked great hardship on many people living in the suburbs who found it impossible to call promptly for their mail, and who learned too late that letters intended for them had been returned to the sender or destroyed. Political enthusiasm was keen in early days, as is usual in small towns, and victorious candidates, at least, knew how to celebrate. On Monday, May 7, 1860, Henry Mellis was elected mayor. The next day, he and the other city officers paraded our streets in a four-horse stagecoach with a brass band. The mayor-elect and his confreres were stuffed inside the hot, decorated vehicle, while the puffing musicians bounced up and down on the swaying top outside, like popcorn in a frying pan. More than a ripple of excitement was produced in Los Angeles about the middle of May, when Jack Martin, Billy Holcomb, and Jim Ware, in from Bear Valley, 
ordered provisions and paid for the same in shining gold dust it was previously known that they had gone out to hunt for bear and their sudden return with this precious metal together with their desire to pick up a few appliances such as are not ordinarily used in trapping made some of the hangers-on about the store suspicious the hunters were secretly followed and were found to return to what is now holcomb valley and then it was learned that gold had been discovered there about the first of the month for a year or two many mining camps were formed in holcomb and upper holcomb valleys and in that district the town of belleville was founded but the gold at first apparently so plentiful soon gave out and the excitement incidental to the discovery subsided while some men were thus digging for treasure others sought fortune in the deep spearing sharks as well as whales was an exciting industry at this period sharks running in large numbers along the coast and in the waters of san pedro bay in may orrin smith of los angeles with the aid of his son in one day caught one hundred and three sharks from which he took only the livers these when boiled yielding oil which burned fairly well even in its crude state during the next year shark hunting near rattlesnake island continued moderately remunerative sometime in the spring another effort was made to establish a tannery here and hopes were entertained that an important trade might thus be founded but the experiment came to naught and even today los angeles can boast of no tannery such as exists in several other california cities with the approach of summer elijah and william h workman built a brick dwelling on main street next to tom rowan's bakery and set around it trees of several varieties the residence then one of the prettiest in town was built for the boy's mother and there with her they dwelt that sectarian activity regarding public schools is nothing new in los angeles may be shown from an incident not without its humorous side of the year 1860 tj harvey appeared with a broadside in the press protesting against the reading of the bible in schoolrooms saying that he for one would never stand it come what may some may still remember his invective and his pyrotechnical conclusion revolution war blood during downey's incumbency as governor the legislature passed a law popularly known as the bulkhead bill authorizing the san francisco dock and wharf company to build a stone bulkhead around the waterfront of the northern city in return for which the company was to have the exclusive privilege of collecting tolls and wharfage for the long period of fifty years a franchise the stupendous value of which even the projectors of that date could scarcely have anticipated downey when the measure came before him for final action vetoed the bill and thus performed a judicious act perhaps the most meritorious of his administration whether downey who on january ninth had become governor was really popular for any length of time even in the vicinity of his home may be a question but his high office and the fact that he was the first governor from the southland assured him a hearty welcome whenever he came down here from the capital in june downey returned to los angeles accompanied by his wife and took rooms at the bella union hotel and besides the usual committee visits receptions and speeches from the balcony arranged in honor of the distinguished guests there was a salute of thirteen guns fired with all ceremony which echoed and re-echoed from the hillsides in eighteen sixty a number of delegates including caspar Berend and myself were sent to san francisco to attend the laying of the cornerstone on the twenty fifth of june of the masonic temple at the corner of post and montgomery streets we made the trip when the weather was not only excessively hot but the sand was a foot deep and headway very slow so that although we were young men and enjoyed the excursion we could not laugh down all of the disagreeable features of the journey it was no wonder therefore that when we arrived at visalia where we were to change horses barent wanted a shave while he was in the midst of this tonsorial refreshment the stage started on its way to san francisco and as barent heard it passing the shop he ran out with one side of his face smooth and clean while the other side was whiskered and grimy and tried to stop the disappearing vehicle despite all of his yelling and running however the stage did not stop and finally barent fired his pistol several times into the air this attracted the attention of the sleepy driver who took the puffing passenger on board whereupon the rest of us chaffed him about his singular appearance barent footnote died november nineteenth nineteen thirteen and footnote did not have much peace of mind until we reached the plaza hotel at san juan bautista a relic as someone has said of the distant past where men and women played billiards on horseback and trees bore human fruit 
situated in a sweet little valley, mountain-girdled and well-watered, where he was able to complete his shave and thus restore his countenance to its normal condition. In connection with this anecdote of the trip to San Francisco, I may add another story. On board the stage was Frederick J. McCrellish, author of the Alta California, the principal coast paper, bought by McCrellish and Company in 1858, and also secretary of the Telegraph Company at that time building its line between San Francisco and Los Angeles. When we reached a point between Gilroy and Visalia, which was the temporary terminus of the Telegraph from San Francisco, McCrellish spoke with some enthusiasm of the Morse invention and invited everybody on the stage to send telegrams, at his expense, to his friends. I wrote out a message to my brother in San Francisco, telling him about the trip as far as I had completed it, and passed the copy to the operator at the clicking instrument. It may be hard for the reader to conceive that this would be an exciting episode in a man's life, but since my first arrival in the Southland there had been no telegraphic communication between Los Angeles and the outside world, and the remembrance of this experience at the little wayside station was never to be blotted from my mind. I may also add that of that committee sent to the Masonic festivities in San Francisco, Barrent and I are now the only surviving members. It has been stated that the population of Los Angeles in 1850 was but 1610. How true that is, I cannot tell. When I came to the city in 1853, there were some 2,600 people. In the summer of 1860, a fairly accurate census was made, and it was found that our little town had 4,399 inhabitants. Two distinguished military men visited Los Angeles in the midsummer of 1860. The first was General James Shields, who, in search of health, arrived by the overland route on the 24th of July, having just finished his term in the Senate. The effect of the wounds received at the Battle of Cerro Gordo years before and reports as to the climate of California started the general westward, and quietly he alighted from the stage at the door of the Bella Union. After a while, General Shields undertook the superintending of a Mexican mine, but at the outbreak of the Civil War, although not entirely recovered, he hastened back to Washington and was at once appointed as a brigadier general of volunteers. The rest of his career is known. A week later, General, or as he was then entitled, Colonel John C. Fremont, drew up at the plaza, his coming to this locality in connection with the Tecumseh tin mine and Mariposa forestry interests had been heralded from Godey's ranch some days before. And when he arrived on Tuesday, July 31st, in company with Leonidas Haskell and Joseph C. Palmer, the Republicans were out in full force and fired a salute of twenty-five guns. In the evening, Colonel Fremont was waited upon in the parlors of the Bella Union by a goodly company under the leadership of the Republican Committee, although all classes, irrespective of politics, united to pay the celebrated California pioneer the honors due him. Alexander Godey, to whose rancho I have just referred, was a man of importance with a very extensive cattle range in Kern County, not far from Bakersfield, where he later lived. He occasionally came to town and was an invariable visitor at my store, purchasing many supplies from me. These and other provisions, which Godey and his neighbors sent for, were transported by burrow or mule train to the ranches in care of Miguel Ortiz, who had his headquarters in Los Angeles. Leading these so-called pack trains was an art. By means of rope and slats of wood, merchandise was strapped to the animal's sides and back in such a fashion that it could not slip, and thus a heavy, well-balanced load was conveyed over the plain and the mountain trails. By 1860, the Germans were well organized and active here in many ways. A German benevolent society called Eintracht, which met Tuesday and Friday evenings in the Arcadia block for music drill under director Heinsch, affording stimulating entertainment and accomplishing much good. The turn Verein, on the other hand, took an interest in the success of the roundhouse, and on March 12th put up a liberty pole on top of the oddly shaped building. Lager beer and other things deemed by the Teutonic brethren essential to a garden of paradise, and to such an occasion, were freely dispensed, and on that day Layman was in all his glory. A particular feature of this garden of paradise was a cabbage, about which have grown up some traditions of the Brobdingnagian sort that the reader may accept in toto or with a grain of salt. It was planted when the place was opened, and is said to have attained, by December 1859, a height of twelve feet, with a circumference, 
so averred an ambiguous chronicler of the period, referring doubtless to crinolines, equal to that of any fashionably attired city bell measuring eight or ten feet. By July 1860, the cabbage attained a growth, so the story goes, of fourteen feet four inches, although, George always claimed, it had been cropped twenty or more times, and its leaves used for coleslaw, sauerkraut, and goodness knows what. I can afford the modern reader no better idea of layman's personality and resort than by quoting the following contemporaneous, if not very scholarly, account. The Garden of Paradise. Our friend George of the Round House, who there keeps a garden with the above captivating name, was one of the few who done honor to the fourth. He kept the national ensign at the fore, showed his fifteen-foot cabbage, and dealt lager to admiring crowds all day. Among the popular pleasure resorts of 1860 was the Tivioli Garden on the Wolfskill Road, conducted by Charles Kaiser, who called his friends together by placarding the legend, Hurrah for the Tivioli! Music and other amusements were provided every Sunday from two o'clock, and dancing could be enjoyed until late in the night, and as there was no charge for admission, the place was well patronized. When the 4th of July, 1859, approached, and no preparation had been made to observe the holiday, some children, who were being instructed in calisthenics by A. F. Tilden, began to solicit money, their childish enthusiasm resulting in the appointing of a committee, the collecting of $400, and a picnic in Don Luis San Savain's enclosed garden. A year later, Tilden announced that he would open a place for gymnastic exercises in Temple's New Block, charging men three dollars for the use of the apparatus and the privilege of a shower bath and training boys at half rates this was the origin of systematic physical culture in los angeles end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of sixty years in southern california eighteen fifty three to nineteen thirteen by harris newmark this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 19. Steam Wagon. Odd Characters. 1860. Early in 1860, Phineas Banning and J. J. Tomlinson, the energetic rivals in lighterage and freighting at San Pedro, embarked as lumber merchants thereby anticipating the enormous trade that has flowed for years past from the north through Los Angeles to Southern California and Arizona. Having many teams, they hauled lumber, when traffic was not sufficient to keep their wagon trains busy, from the harbor to the city, or even, when there was need, to the ranchos. It must have been in the same year that F. P. F. Temple, at a cost of about $40,000 for lumber alone, fenced in a wide acreage, at the same time building large and substantial barns for his stock. By the summer of that year, Banning was advertising lumber delivered in Los Angeles, and from October 1st, Banning and Hinchman had an office near the northern junction of Main and Spring Streets. A couple of years before, Banning in person had directed the driving of 17 mule teams from San Pedro to Fort Yuma, covering, in 12 or 13 days, the 230 miles of barely passable road. The following March, Banning and Tomlinson, who had so often opposed each other even in the courts, came to an understanding and buried the hatchet for good. At this time, Joseph Everhart, who, with Frederick W. Cole, had conducted the Lafayette Hotel, sold out and moved to San Francisco, marrying Mrs. R. Mayer, now John Lang's widow, sister-in-law of Kiln Messer. Later, Everhart went to Sonoma and then to Victoria, B.C., in each place making his mark, and in the latter city he died. Like both Messer and Lang, Everhart had passed through varied and trying experiences. The owner of the Russ Garden Restaurant in 1849, in lively San Francisco, he came to Los Angeles and took hold of the Hotel Lafayette. With him was a partner named Fucht. But a free fight and display of shooting irons, such as often enlivened a California hotel, having sent the guests and hangers on scurrying to quarters, induced Fucht to sell out his interests in very short order, whereupon Everhard took in with him Frederick W. Cole, who lived on a site now the southeast corner of Seventh and Spring Streets, where he had an orange grove. 
Pursuing Indians was dangerous in the extreme, as Robert Wilburn found when he went after some twenty head of cattle stolen from Felix Bachman by Paiute or Paiute Indians in January 1860, during one of their marauding expeditions into California. Wilburn chased the red men, but he never came back, and when his body was found it was pierced with three or four arrows, probably shot at him simultaneously by as many of the cattle thieves. Don Tomas A. Sanchez, sheriff from 1860 to 1867, had a record for physical courage and prowess, having previously been an officer under Pico in the Mexican War days, and having later aided Pico in his efforts to punish Barton's murderers. Sanchez had property, and in 1887 a patent was granted his estate for 4,000 or more acres in the ranch known as Siniega o Paso de la Tijera. Destructive fires in the open country, if not as common as now, still occasionally stirred our citizens. Such a fire broke out in the San Fernando Valley in the middle of July, and spread so rapidly that a square mile and a half of territory was denuded and charred. Not only were there no organized means to fight such fires, but men were compelled to sound the alarm through couriers on horseback, and if the wind happened to be blowing across the plains, even the fleetest horseman had all he could do to avoid the flames and reach in time the widely separated rancheros. Here I may add that as late as the sixties, all of the uninhabited parts of Los Angeles, especially to Main Street, were known as plains, and crossing the plains was an expression commonly used with a peculiarly local significance. So wretched were the roads in the early decades after my arrival, and so many were the plans proposed for increasing the rapidity of travel, that great curiosity was excited in 1860, when it was announced that Phineas Banning had bought a steam wagon, and would soon introduce a kind of vehicle such as Los Angeles, at least, had never seen. This steam wagon was a traction engine built by J. Whitman and Sons at Leeds, England, and was already on its way across the ocean. It had been ordered by Richard A. Ogden of San Francisco for the Patagonia Copper Mining Company, a trial before shipping having proved that with a load of 38 tons, the engine could attain a speed of five miles an hour. And Banning paid handsomely for the option of purchasing the vehicle, on condition that it would ultimately prove a success. The announcement was made in April, and by early June the engine had reached San Francisco, where it made the run to Mission Dolores in three quarters of an hour. All the San Francisco papers told of the truly wonderful machine, one reporter averring that the engineer had so perfect control that a visit was made to various parts of the city, to the astonishment and gratification of the multitude. And since these accounts were immediately copied by the Los Angeles papers, which added the official announcement that Captain Hughes had loaded the engine on board his schooner, the Lewis Perry, and was bringing it south as fast as he could, popular excitement rose like the mercury in summer and but one more report was needed to make it the absorbing talk of the hour. That came on the 28th of July when the star announced the steam wagon has arrived at San Pedro. And it was not long before many persons went down to the port to get a sight of the wonderful object. And wait they did. Although the star said that all our citizens were anxiously hourly expecting to see Major Banning heave in sight at the foot of Main Street, no Banning hove. Instead, on the 4th of August, the same star broke forth with this lament. The steam wagon is at San Pedro, and we regret to learn that it is likely to remain there. So far, all attempts to reach this city with freight have failed. And that was the end of the steam wagon experiment here. In every community there are characters who, for one reason or another, develop among their fellows a reputation for oddity. We have all seen the good-natured, rather stout old gentleman, whose claim to dignity is his old-fashioned Prince Albert and rather battered-looking silk hat, but who, although he boasts many friends, is never successful in the acquisition of this world's goods. We have seen, too, the vendor of ice cream, tamales, or similar commodity, who in his youth had been an opera singer or actor, but whose too intensive thirst rendered him impossible in his profession and brought him far down in the world. Some were dangerous criminals, some were harmless but obnoxious, others still were harmless and amusing. Many such characters I have met during my sixty years in Los Angeles, and each filled a certain niche, 
even those whose only mission was to furnish their fellows with humor or amusement having thus contributed to the charm of life viejo cholo or old half-breed a mexican over sixty years of age who was never known by any other name was such an eccentric character he was half blind wore a pair of white linen pantaloons and for a mantle used an old sheet this he threw over his shoulders and thus accoutred he strutted about the streets like a spanish cavalier his cane was a broom handle his lunch counter the swill bucket and when times were particularly bad viejo bagged the youngsters of the pueblo were the bane of cholo's existence and the torment of his infirmity and old age cholo was succeeded by pinicati who was half indian and half mexican he was not over four feet in height and had a flat nose a stubby beard and a face badly pockmarked and he presented altogether as unkempt and obnoxious an appearance as one might imagine pinicati was generally attired in a well-worn straw hat the top of which was missing and his long hair stuck out in clumps and snarls a woolen undershirt and a pair of overalls completed his costume while his toes as a rule protruded from his enormous boots unlike viejo cholo pinicati was permitted to go unmolested by the juvenile portion of the population inasmuch as though half-witted he was somewhat of an entertainer for it was natural for him to play the flute and what was really interesting he made his own instruments out of the reed that grew along the river banks pinicati cut just the holes i suppose that produced what seemed to him proper harmony and on these homemade flutes performed such airs as his wandering fancy suggested he always played weird tunes and danced strange indian dances and through these crude gifts he became as i have said sufficiently popular to enjoy some immunity nevertheless he was a professional beggar and whatever he did to afford amusement was done after all for money this was easily explained for money alone would buy aguardiente and pinicati had little use for anything else aguardiente as the word was commonly used in southern california was a native brandy full of hellfire and so the poor half-breed was always drunk one day pinicati drank a glass too much and this brought about such a severance of his ties with beautiful los angeles that his absorption of one spirit released at last the other sometime in the eventful sixties a tall angular muscular looking woman was here who went by the singular sobriquet of captain jinx a title which she received from a song then very popular the first couplet of which ran something like this i'm captain jinx of the horse marines i feed my horse on pork and beans she half strode half jerked her way along the street as though scanning the lines of that ditty with her feet she was strong for women's rights she said and she certainly looked it chinamen were not only more numerous by 1860 but they had begun to vary their occupations many working as servants laundrymen or farmhands in march a chinese company was also organized to compete for local fish trade in 1860 emile bourdonnais and company opened the louisiana coffee saloon as a french restaurant roast duck and oysters were their specialty and they charged fifty cents a meal but they also served a plate at one bit footnote twelve and one half cents and footnote some years later there was a two-bit restaurant known as brown's on main street near the united states hotel where a good substantial meal was served james often called santiago johnson who for a short time prior to his death about 1860 or 1861 was forwarder of freight at san pedro came to los angeles in 1833 with a cargo of mexican and chinese goods and after that owned considerable ranch property in addition to ranching he also engaged extensively in cattle raising peter popularly known as pete or bully wilson a native of sweden came to los angeles about 1860 he ran a one-horse dray and as soon as he had accumulated sufficient money he bought for twelve hundred dollars the southeast corner of spring and first streets where he had his stable he continued to prosper and his family still enjoy the fruits of his industry the same year george smith started to haul freight and baggage he had four horses hitched to a somber looking vehicle nicknamed the black swan j d yates was a grocer and provision dealer of eighteen sixty with a store on the plaza 
I have referred to Bishop Amat as presiding over the diocese of Monterey and Los Angeles, but Los Angeles was linked with Monterey for a while, even in judicial matters. Beginning with 1860 or 1861, when Fletcher M. Haight, father of Governor H. H. Haight, was the first judge to preside, the United States Court for the Southern District of California was held alternately in the two towns mentioned, Colonel J. O. Wheeler serving as clerk in the court for the southern term, occupying seven rooms of the second story of John Temple's block. These alternate sessions continued to be held until about 1866, when the tribunal for the southern district ceased to exist and Angelenos were compelled to apply to the court in San Francisco. For years, such was the neglect of the Protestant burial ground that in 1860, caustic criticism was made by each newspaper discussing the condition of the cemetery. There was no fence, headstones were disfigured or demolished, and there was little or no protection to the graves. As a matter of fact, when the cemetery on Fort Hill was abandoned, but few of the bodies were removed. By 1860, the New England Fire Insurance Company of Hartford, Connecticut, was advertising here through its local agent, H. Hamilton, our friend of the Los Angeles Star. Hamilton used to survey the applicants' premises, forward the data to William Faulkner, the San Francisco representative, who executed the policy and mailed the document back to Los Angeles. After a while, Samuel Briggs, with Wells Fargo and Company, represented the Phoenix Insurance Company. H. Newmark and Company also sold insurance somewhat later, representing the Commercial Union Insurance Company. About 1880, however, they disposed of their insurance interests to Maurice Kramer, whose main competitor was W. J. Broderick, and from this transaction developed the firm of Kramer, Campbell, and Company, still in that business. Not only in this connection, but elsewhere in these memoirs, it may be noted how little specialization there was in earlier days in Los Angeles. In fact, it was not until about 1880 that this process, distinctive of economic progress, began to appear in Los Angeles. I myself have handled practically every staple that makes up the very great proportion of merchandising activity, whereas my successors of today, as well as their competitors, deal only in groceries and kindred lines. Two brothers, Emile and Theophile Vache, in the fall of 1860, started what has become the oldest firm, Vache Frères, in the local wine business, at first utilizing the Bernard residence at Alameda and Third Streets, in time used by the government as a bonded warehouse. Later they removed to the building on Aliso Street, once occupied by the medical college, where the cellars proved serviceable for the winery. There they attempted the manufacture of cream of tartar from wine crystals, but the venture was not remunerative. In 1881, the Vaches, joined by their brother Adolf, began to grow grapes in the Barton Vineyard in San Bernardino County, and sometime afterward they bought nearby land and started the famous Brookside Vineyard. Emile is now dead, while Theophile, who retired and returned to Europe in 1892, retaining an interest in the firm of T. Vache and Company, passes his hours pleasantly on the picturesque island of St. George de Laurent in the Charente in Furerere in his native France. On September 21st, Captain W. S. Hancock, who first came to Los Angeles in connection with the expedition against the Mojave Indians in 1858, sought to establish a new kind of express between Los Angeles and Fort Mojave, and sent out a camel in charge of Greek George to make the trial trip. When they had been gone two and a half days, the regular express messenger bound for Los Angeles met them at Lane's Crossing, apparently in none too promising a condition, which later gave rise to a report that the camel had died on the desert. This occasioned the numerous newspaper squibs apropos of both the speed and the staying powers of the camel as contrasted with those of the burro, and finally in October the following announcement appeared placarded throughout the town. By Poulterer, DeRoe, and Eldridge. Office and Sales Room, Corner California and Front Streets, San Francisco. Preemptory sale of Bactrian camels imported from the Amor River, ex Caroline E. Foot. On Wednesday, October 10, 1860, we will sell at public auction in lots to suit purchasers for cash, 13 Bactrian camels. From a cold and mountainous country comprising six males and seven females, five being with the young, all in fine health and condition. For further particulars, inquire of the auctioneers. In 1858, Richard Garvey came to Los Angeles and entered the government service as a messenger, 
between this city and New Mexico for Captain W. S. Hancock. Later he went to the Holcomb Valley Mines, where he first met Lucky Baldwin, and by 1872 he had disposed of some San Bernardino mine properties at a figure which seemed to permit his retirement and ease for the rest of his life. For the next twenty years he was variously employed, at times operating for Baldwin. Garvey is at present living in Los Angeles. What was one of the last bullfights here, towards the end of September, when a little child was trodden upon in the ring, reminds me not only of the succeeding sports, including horse racing, but as well that Francis Temple should be credited with encouraging the importation and breeding of good horses. In 1860 he paid $7,000, then considered an enormous sum, for Black Warrior, and not long afterward he bought Billy Blossom at a fancy figure. A political gathering or two enlivened the year 1860. In July, when the local sentiment was, to all appearances, strongly in favor of Breckinridge and Lane, the Democratic candidates for president and vice president, one hundred guns were fired in their honor, and great was the jubilation of the Democratic hosts. A later meeting, under the auspices of the Breckinridge Club, was held in front of the Montgomery Saloon on Main Street. Judge Dryden presided, and Senator Milton S. Latham was the chief speaker. A number of ladies graced the occasion, some seated in chairs nearby, and others remaining in their vehicles drawn up in a semicircle before the speaker's stand. As a result of all this effort, the candidates in question did lead in the race here, but only by four votes. On counting the ballots the day after election, it was found that Breckinridge had 267 votes, while Douglas, the independent Democratic nominee, had polled 263. Of permanent interest, perhaps, as showing the local sentiment on other questions of the time, is that Lincoln received in Los Angeles only 179 votes. Generally, a candidate persuaded his friends to nominate and endorse him, but now and then one came forward and addressed the public directly. In the fall of 1860, the following announcement appeared in the Southern News. To the voters of Los Angeles Township, I am a candidate for the office of the Justice of the Peace, and I desire to say to you frankly that I want you all to vote for me on the 6th of November next. I aspire to the office for two reasons, first because I am vain enough to believe that I am capable of performing the duties required, with credit to myself and to the satisfaction of all good citizens, second because I am poor and am desiring of making an honest living thereby. William G. Still during my first visit to San Francisco in the fall of 1853, and while en route to Los Angeles, my attention was called to a line of electrical telegraph, then just installed between the Golden Gate and the town, for use in reporting the arrival of vessels. About a month later, a line was built from San Francisco to Sacramento, Stockton, and around to San Jose. Nothing further, however, was done toward reaching Southern California with the electric wire until the end of May or the beginning of June 1860, when President R. E. Raymond and Secretary Fred J. McCrellish, promoters of the Pacific and Atlantic Telegraph Company, organized in 1858 to reach San Antonio, Texas and Memphis, Tennessee, came to Los Angeles to lay the matter before our citizens. Stock was soon subscribed for a line through the city and as far as Fort Yuma, and in a few days Banning had 50 teams ready to haul the telegraph poles, which were deposited in time along the proposed route. In the beginning, interest was stimulated by the promise that the telegraph would be in operation by the 4th of July, but Independence Day came and went, and the best that the telegraph company could do was to make the ambiguous report that there were so and so many holes in the ground. Worse than that, it was announced toward the end of July that the stock of wire had given out, and still worse that no more could be had this side of the Atlantic States. That news was indeed discouraging, but by the middle of August, 20 tons of wire were known to be on a clipper bound for San Francisco around the Horn, and five tons were being hurried here by steamer. The wire arrived in due season, and the most energetic efforts were made to establish telegraphic communication between Los Angeles and San Francisco. It was while McCrellish was slowly returning to the north in June that I met him as narrated in a previous chapter. Finally, at eight o'clock on October 8, 1860, a few magic words from the North were ticked out in the Los Angeles office of the Telegraph Company. Two hours later, as those familiar with our local history know, Mayor Henry Mellis sent the following memorable message to H. F. Teschemacher, President of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. 
allow me on behalf of the citizens of los angeles to send you greeting of fellowship and good feeling on the completion of the line of telegraph which now binds the two cities together whereupon the next day president teschemacher who by the way was a well-known importer having brought the first almond seed from the mediterranean in the early fifties replied to mayor mellis your dispatch has just been received on behalf of the citizens of san francisco i congratulate los angeles trusting that the benefit may be mutual a ball in los angeles fittingly celebrated the event as will be seen from the following dispatch penned by henry d barrows who was then southern california correspondent of the bulletin los angeles october ninth eighteen sixty ten forty five a m here is the maiden salutation of los angeles to san francisco by lightning this dispatch the first to the press from this point the correspondent of the bulletin takes pleasure in communicating in behalf of his fellow citizens the first intelligible communication by the electric wire was received here last night at about eight o'clock and a few hours later at a grand and brilliant ball given in honor of the occasion despatches were received from san francisco announcing the complete working of the entire line speeches were made in the crowded ballroom by e j c kewen and j mccrellish news of colonel baker's election in oregon to the united states senate electrified the republicans but the breckinridges doubted it at first just before leaving yesterday senator latham planted the first telegraph pole from this point east assisted by a concourse of citizens barrows's telegram concluded with the statement highly suggestive of the future commercial possibilities of the telegraph that the steamer senator would leave san pedro that evening with three thousand or more boxes of grapes on october sixteenth the steamer j t wright named after the boat owner and widely advertised as new elegant and fast arrived at san pedro in charge of captain robert haley and many persons professed to see in her appearance on the scene new hope for beneficial coastwise competition after three or four trips however the steamer was withdrawn leonard john rose a german by birth and brother-in-law of h k s o Mulvaney, arrived with his family by the butterfield stage route in november having fought and conquered so to speak every step of his way from illinois from which state two years before he had set out rose and other pioneers tried to reach california along the thirty-fifth parallel a route surveyed by lieutenant beale but presenting terrific hardships on the sides of mountains at times they had to let down their wagons by ropes and again they almost died of thirst the mojave indians too set upon them and did not desist until seventeen indians had been killed and nine whites were slain or wounded rose himself not escaping injury with the help of other emigrants rose and his family managed to reach albuquerque where within two years in the hotel business he acquired fourteen thousand dollars then coming to los angeles he bought from william wolfskill one hundred and sixty acres near the old mission of san gabriel and so prospered that he was soon able to enlarge his domain to over two thousand acres he laid out a splendid vineyard and orange grove and being full of ambition enterprise and taste it was not long before he had the show place of the county apparently temple really inaugurated his new theater with the coming to los angeles in november of that year of the great star company of stark and ryer as well as with the announcement made at the time by their management this is the first advent of a theatrical company here stark and ryer were in los angeles for a week or two and though i should not vouch for them as stars the little hall was crowded each night and almost to suffocation there were no fire ordinances then as to filling even the aisles and the window sills nor am i sure that the conventional fire pail more often empty than filled with water stood anywhere about but just as many tickets were sold regardless of the seating capacity tragedy gave way alternately to comedy one of the evenings being devoted to the honeymoon and as this was not quite long enough to satisfy the onlookers who had neither trains nor boats to catch there was an afterpiece in those days when los angeles was entirely dependent on the north for theatrical and similar talent it sometimes happened that the steamer was delayed or that the star failed to catch the ship and so could not arrive when expected as a result of which patrons who had journeyed in from the ranches had to journey home again with their curiosity and appetite for the histrionic unsatisfied prisoners especially indians were employed on public works as late as november eighteen sixty the water overseer was empowered to take out any indians who might be in the calaboose and to use them for repairing the highways and bridges 
About 1860, Nathan Jacoby came to Los Angeles on my invitation, as I had known him in Europe, and he was with me about a year. When I sold out, he entered the employ of M. Kramer and later went into business for himself. As the senior partner of Jacoby Brothers, he died suddenly in 1911. Associated with Nathan at different periods were his brothers Herman, Abraham, Morris, Charles, and Lesser Jacoby, all of them early arrivals. Of this group, Charles and Lesser, both active in business circles in their day, are also dead. Toward the end of 1860, Solomon Lazard returned to France to visit his mother, but no sooner had he arrived at his old homeland and registered, according to law with the police, than he was arrested, charged with having left his fatherland at the age of 17, without having performed military duty. In spite of his American citizenship, he was tried by court-martial and sentenced to a short imprisonment. But through the intervention of the United States minister, Charles J. Faulkner, the author of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, and the clemency of the Emperor Napoleon III, he was finally released. He had to furnish a substitute, however, or pay a fine of 1,500 francs, and he paid the fine. At length, notwithstanding his unpleasant experience, Lazard arrived in Los Angeles about the middle of March, 1861. Tired of the wretched sidewalks, John Temple, in December 1860, set to work to introduce an improvement in front of his Main Street block, an experiment that was watched with interest. Bricks were covered with a thick coating of asphalt brought from La Brea Ranch, which was smoothed while still warm and then sprinkled with sand, the combination promising great durability. In the summer season, however, the coating became soft and gluey and was not comfortable to walk upon. I have already spoken of the effect of heat and age on foodstuffs such as eggs and butter when brought over the hot desert between San Bernardino and Los Angeles. This disadvantage continued for years, nor was the succeeding plan of bringing provisions from San Francisco and the north by way of the ocean without its obstacles. A. Olyard, the baker, realized the situation, and in December advertised, fresh crackers baked in Los Angeles, a superior to those half-spoiled by the sea voyage. Previous to the days of warehouses and much before the advent of railroads, the public hay scale was an institution, having been constructed by Francis Mellis in the dim past. Exposed to the elements, it stood alone out in the center of Los Angeles Street, somewhat south of Aliso, and in the lawless times of the young town was a silent witness to the numerous crimes perpetrated in the adjacent Calle de los Negros. On to its rough platform the neighboring farmers drove their heavy loads, often waiting an hour or two for the arrival of the owner, who alone had the key to his mysterious mechanism. Speaking of this lack of a warehouse brings to my mind the pioneer of 1850, Edward Nod, who first attracted attention as a clever pastryman with a little shop on Commercial Street where he made a specialty of lady fingers, selling them at fifty cents a dozen. Engaging in the wool industry, he later became interested in wool, and this led him, in 1878, to erect Nouds Warehouse on Alameda Street, at present known as the Union Warehouse. Footnote. Destroyed by fire on September 22, 1915. End footnote. Nowd died in 1881. His son Edward, born in Los Angeles, is famous as an amateur chef who can prepare a French dinner that even a professional might be proud of. In May, as elsewhere stated, Henry Mellis was elected mayor of Los Angeles, and on the 26th of December he died, the first to yield that office to the inexorable demands of death. The news of his demise called forth unfeigned expressions of regret, for Mellis was not only a man of marked ability, but he was of genial temperament and the soul of honor. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of 60 Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 20 The Rumblings of War, 1861. The year 1861 dawned dark and foreboding. On the 20th of the preceding December, South Carolina had seceded, and along the Pacific, as elsewhere, men were anxiously wondering what would happen next. Threats and counter-threats clearly indicated the disturbed state of the public mind. And when, near Charleston Harbor, a hostile shot was fired at the Star of the West, with the certainty of further trouble, particularly with the coming inauguration of Lincoln, was everywhere felt. Aside, however, from these disturbing events so much affecting commercial life, 
the year sandwiched between two wet seasons was in general a prosperous one there were evil effects of the heavy rains and business in the spring was rather dull but cattlemen upon whose success so many other people depended took advantage of the favoring conditions and profited accordingly during the period of the flood in eighteen fifty nine to sixty the river as we have seen was impassable and for months there was so much water in the bed ordinarily dry that foot passage was interrupted in january eighteen sixty one therefore the common council under the influence of one of its members e moulton whose dairy was in east los angeles provided a flimsy footbridge in his neighborhood if my memory serves me construction was delayed and so the bridge escaped the next winter's flood though it went down years later on january ninth the schooner lewis perry arrived at anchorage to be towed across the bar and to the wharf by the little steamer comet footnote a term locally applied to tugs and footnote this was the first seagoing vessel that had ever visited new san pedro with a full cargo and demonstrated it was thought by many that the port was easy navigable by vessels drawing eleven feet of water or less comments of all kinds were made upon this event one scribe writing we expect to see coasting steamers make their regular trips to newtown discharging freight and loading passengers on the wharf safe from the dangers of rough weather instead of lying off at sea subjecting life and property to the perils of southeast gales and the breakers the senator even in the opinion of experienced persons might easily enter the channel on the easterly side of dead man's island and thence find a safe passage in the creek it will yet happen john m griffith came to los angeles in eighteen sixty one having four years previously married a sister of john j tomlinson with the latter he formed a partnership in the passenger and freight carrying business their firm competing with banning and company until eighteen sixty eight when tomlinson died this same year at the age of about eighteen eugene meyer arrived he first clerked for solomon lazard in the retail dry goods business and in eighteen sixty seven he was admitted into partnership on november twentieth of that year meyer married miss harriet the youngest daughter of joseph newmark who officiated felix bachman who came in eighteen fifty three was at various times in partnership with philip cycle after whom cycle street is named and councilman in eighteen sixty two samuel lobheim and ben schloss the firm being known as bachman and company and on los angeles street near commercial they carried on the largest business in town bachman secured much salt lake trade and in eighteen sixty one opposed high freight rates but although well off when he left here he died a poor man in san francisco at the age of nearly one hundred years in eighteen sixty one adolph young arrived and established a drug store in the temple block his only competitor being theodore Woolweber, and there he continued for nearly twenty years one of his prescription books now in the county museum evidencing his activity for a while f j guise the well-known druggist for so many years on North Main Street, and an arrival of 74, clerked for Young. At the beginning of the 60s, Dr. A. B. Hayward practiced medicine here, his office being next to Workman Brothers' saddlery on Main Street. Wall Weber's name recalls a practical joke of the late 60s when some waggish friend raised the cry that there was a bear across the river, and induced my Teutonic neighbor to go in hot pursuit. After bracing himself for the supreme effort, Wallweber shot the beast dead, only to learn that the bear, a blind and feeble animal, was a favorite pet, and that it would take just $25 to placate the irate owner. The absence in general of shade trees was so noticeable that when John Temple, on January 31st, planted a row facing Temple Building, there was the usual town gossip. Charlie Ducommon followed Temple's example. Previously, there had been several wide-spreading trees in front of the Bella Union Hotel, and it came to pass within the next five years that many pepper trees adorned the streets. In 1861, the post office was removed from North Spring Street to a frame building on Main Street, opposite Commercial. About the same time, when owing to the floods, no mail arrived for three or four weeks, and someone facetiously hung out a sign announcing the office to let, the Washington Postal Authorities began issuing stamped envelopes of the values of 12 and 24 cents for those businessmen of Los Angeles and the Pacific Coast who were likely to use the recently developed Pony Express. 
Matthew Keller, or Don Mateo, as he was called, who died in 1881, was a quaint personality of real ability, who had a shop on the northwest corner of Los Angeles and Commercial Streets, and owned the adjoining store in which P. Beaudry had been in business. His operations were original and his advertising unique, as will be seen from his announcement in the Star in February. M. Keller to his customers. You are hereby notified that the time has at last arrived when you must pay up, without further delay, or I shall be obliged to invoke the aid of the law and the lawyers. Your most obedient servant, M. Keller. Which warning was followed in the next issue by this. M. Keller to his customers. The right of secession admitted. You are hereby notified that the time has arrived when you must pay up without further delay, or I shall be obliged to invoke the aid of the law and the lawyers. After such settlement, slow payers are requested to secede. M. Keller. To be augmented next week. This later advertisement, with the line in parentheses, continued to be printed week after week without change for at least twelve months. The following year, Keller, in flaring headlines, offered for sale the front of his Los Angeles vineyard facing on Aliso Street, in building lots of twenty by one hundred feet, saying in his prospectus, Great improvements are on the tapis in this quarter. Governor Downey and the intrepid Beaudry propose to open a street to let the light of day shine in upon their dark domains. On the aquary side of Aliso Street, what fine legs your master has, must run to give way for more permanent fixtures. Further on, the prior estates are about to be improved by the astute and far-seeing Templito, and Keller sells lots on the sunny side of Aliso Street. The map is on view at my office. Come in and make your selections. First come, first served. Terms will be made handy. M. Keller. Nathaniel Pryor, sometimes known as Don Miguel N. Pryor, or Pryor, is the pioneer referred to by Keller. At the age of 30, it is said, in 1820, he came here, and fifteen or twenty years later, about the time that he was a regidor, or councilman, was one of eight or ten Easterners who had farms within the Pueblo district. His property, in part a vineyard, included what is now commercial to First Streets, and possibly from Los Angeles Street to the river. On it was an adobe which is still standing on Jackson Street, and is the only mud-brick structure in that section. For a while, and probably because he had loaned Pryor some money, F. P. F. Temple had an interest in the estate. Pryor was twice married, having a son, Charles, by his first wife, and a son, Nathaniel, Jr., by his second. Pablo Pryor of San Juan was another son. The first Mrs. Pryor died about 1840, and is one of the few, with the mother of Pio Pico, buried inside of the old church at the plaza. The second Mrs. Pryor, who inherited the property, died about 1857. A granddaughter, Mrs. Lottie Pryor, is a surviving member of this family. During the administration of Padre Blas Rajo, a genial, broad-minded Italian, several attempts were made, beginning with 1857 or 1858, to improve the old church at the plaza, and in 1861 the historic edifice, so long unchanged, was practically rebuilt. The front adobe wall, which had become damaged by rains, was taken down and reconstructed of brick. Some alterations were made in the tower, and the interesting old tiled roof was replaced, to the intense regret of later and more appreciative generations, with modern, less durable shingles. A fence was provided, and trees, bushes, and plants were set out. The church was also frescoed, inside and out, by Henri Penelon, the French pioneer artist and photographer, who painted upon the wall the following inscription. Los fieles de esta parroquia a la reina de los ángeles 1861 footnote the faithful of this parish to the queen of the angels and footnote early in march sanchez street was opened by the common council it was opposite the northern section of arcadia block passed through the properties of sancho pico coronel and others and terminated at the plaza the los angeles mounted rifles part of the 5,000 militia wanted by California, was organized on March 6th at a meeting in the courthouse, presided over by George W. Gift with M. J. Newmark, who became an officer in the company as secretary. Late in March, John Froling rented from the city fathers a space under the temple market for building a wine cellar, and in December 1860, at the close of his vintage, 
when he had conducted a hearty harvest home celebration he filled the vault with pipes and other casks containing twenty thousand or more gallons of native wines in a corner a bar was speedily built and many angelenos that day not associated with at least one pilgrimage to froling's cool and rather obscure recesses was considered incomplete few who witnessed the momentous events of eighteen sixty one will forget the fever heat of the nation the startling news of the attack on Fort Sumter took twelve days by Pony Express to reach the coast, the overland telegraph not being completed until six months later. But when, on the 24th of April, the last messenger in the relay of riders dashed into San Francisco with the story, an excited population was soon seething about the streets. San Francisco instantly flashed the details south, awakening here much the same mingled feelings of elation and sorrow. When the war thus broke out, Albert Sidney Johnston, a fellow townsman who had married a sister of Dr. J. S. Griffin, and who, in 1857, had successfully placed Utah under federal control, resigned from his command as head of the Department of the Pacific, General Edwin V. Sumner seceding him, and, being a Southerner, left for the South, by way of Warner's Ranch and the Overland Route, with about a hundred companions, most of whom were intercepted at Fort Yuma through the orders of Captain W. S. Hancock. According to Senator Cornelius Cole, Sumner arrived at Johnston's headquarters in San Francisco after dark, and in spite of Johnston's protest, insisted on assuming command at once. Johnston took up arms for the Confederacy and was made a brigadier general, but at Shiloh he was killed, the news of his death causing here the sincerest regret. I shall speak of the loss of one of General Johnston's son in the disaster to the Ada Hancock, Another son, William Preston, became president of Tulane University. Others of our more enthusiastic Southerners, such as Cameron E. Tom and J. Lancaster Brent, also joined the rebellion and proceeded to the seat of war. Tom, who has since attained much distinction, returned to Los Angeles, where he is still living. Footnote. Captain Tom died on February 2, 1915. End footnote. Brent never came back here, having settled near New Orleans, and there I again met him while I was attending the exposition. He had fought through the war, becoming a general before its close, and he told me that he had been arrested by federal officers while on his way to the south from Los Angeles, but had made his escape. Among the very few who went to the front on the Union side and returned here was Charles Myers Jenkins, already referred to as a city zanjero. Owing to the possible need of troops here, as well as to the cost of transportation, volunteers from the Pacific Slope were not called for, and Jenkins joined an Eastern Cavalry Battalion organized in October 1862. Even then, he and his comrades were compelled to pay their own way to the Atlantic seaboard, where they were incorporated into the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry. Jenkins engaged in twenty battles, and for fifteen months was a prisoner of war confined at both Andersonville and Libby suffering such terrible hardships that he was but one of three out of a hundred and fifty of his battalion who came out alive not every one possibly even among those familiar with the building of the los angeles and san pedro railroad knows that an effort was made as far back as eighteen sixty one to finance a railroad here about the middle of february in that year murray morrison and abel stearns assemblymen learned of the willingness of eastern capitalists to build such a road within eighteen months providing the county would subscribe one hundred thousand dollars toward the undertaking and the city fifty thousand the legislature therefore on may seventeenth eighteen sixty one granted the franchise but important as was the matter to our entire district nothing further was done until eighteen sixty three to give life to the movement for almost a decade after i came here st valentine's day was seldom observed in los angeles but about eighteen sixty one or eighteen sixty two the annual exchange of decorated cards with their sentimental verses, came to be somewhat general. Phineas Banning was a staunch Republican and an ardent abolitionist, and it was not extraordinary that on May 25th, at a grand Union demonstration in Los Angeles, he should have been selected to present to the Union Club, in his characteristically vigorous manner, an American flag made for the occasion. Columbus Sims, as president, accepted the emblem, after which there was a procession, led by the First Dragoons Band, many participants being on horseback. In those days, such a procession had done its duty when it tramped along Main Street and around the plaza and back, by way of Spring Street, as far as First. 
and every one was in the right frame of mind to hear and enjoy the patriotic speeches made by Captain Winifield Scott Hancock, General Ezra Drown, and Major James Henry Carleton, while in the distance was fired a salute of thirty-four guns, one for each state in the Union. Senator William McKendry Gwynne was another man of prominence, following his search for gold with the 49ers, due, he used to say, to advice from John C. Calhoun, who, probably taking his cue from Dana's prophecy in two years before the mast, one day put his finger on the map and predicted, should the bay, now called San Francisco, ever be possessed by Americans, a city rivaling New York would spring up on its shores. Gwynne came to Los Angeles occasionally and never forgot to visit me at my home. In 1861, he was arrested by the federal government for his known sympathy with the South and was kept a prisoner for a couple of years, after which he went to France and there planned to carry through, under force of arms, the colonization of Sonora, Mexico, depending in vain on Napoleon III and Maximilian for support. Notwithstanding this futile effort, Gwyn became a leader in National Democratic Councils and was an intimate advisor of Samuel J. Tilden in his historic campaign. Oscar Macy, son of Dr. Obed Macy, having as a newspaper man enthusiastically advocated the selection of Fremont in 1856, was appointed, on Lincoln's inauguration, to the collectorship of customs at San Pedro, a post which he continued to fill even after the office had been reduced to an inspectorship, later resigning in favor of George C. Alexander. This recalls another appointment by Lincoln, that of Major Antonio Maria Pico, a nephew of Pio Pico, to the receivership of public monies at Los Angeles. Pico lived at San Jose, and finding that his new duties exiled him from his family, he soon resigned the office. Old-time barbers, as the reader may be aware, were often surgeons, and the arrival in Commercial Street in the early 60s of J. A. Meyer, late of San Francisco, was announced in part as follows. Gentlemen will be waited on and have shaving, hairdressing, and shampooing prepared in the most luxurious manner and in the finest style of the art, while cupping, bleeding, and teeth extracting will also be attended to. Fort Tejon had been pretty well broken up by June, when a good deal of the army property was moved to Los Angeles. Along with Uncle Sam's bag and baggage came thirty or more of the camels previously mentioned, including half a dozen youngins. For some months they were corralled uncomfortably near the genial quartermaster's Main Street office, but in October they were removed to a yard fixed up for them on D. Anderson's premises, opposite the 2nd Street schoolhouse. Starting with the cook brought to Los Angeles by Joseph Newmark, the Chinese population in 1861 had increased to 21 men and 8 women, a few of them cooks and servants, but most of them working in five or six laundries. About the middle of June of that year, Chun Chik arrived from San Francisco and created a flurry, not merely in Chinatown, but throughout our little city, by his announcement that he would start a store here, and by the 13th of July, this pioneer Chinese shop, a veritable curiosity shop, was opened. The establishment was on Spring Street, opposite the courthouse, and besides a general assortment of Chinese goods, there was a fine display of preserves and other articles hitherto not obtainable in town. Chun Chik was clever in his appeals of a Chinese merchant to the public but he nevertheless joined the celebrities advertised for delinquent taxes. Chun Chik, or as he appeared on the tax collector's list, Chik Chun, was down for $500 in merchandise with $1.25 for city and the same amount for school taxes. Sing Hop, Ching Hop, and Ah Hong were other Chinamen whose memory failed at the critical tax time of that year. For years, until wharves made possible for thousands the pleasures of rod and reel, clams, since used for bait, were almost a drug on the market, being hawked about the streets in 1861 at a dollar a bucket, a price not very remunerative, considering that they came from as far north as San Buenaventura. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Sixty Years in Southern California 1853 to 1913 by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 21. Hancock, Lady Franklin, The Deluge, 1861. When the Civil War began, California and the neighboring territory showed such pronounced southern sympathies 
that the national government kept both under close surveillance for a time stationing major afterward general james henry carleton in eighteen sixty two sent across the colorado river when the government drove out the texans with a force at camp latham near bayona and dispatching another force to drum barracks near wilmington the government also established a thorough system of espionage over the entire southwest in los angeles and vicinity many people some of whom i mention elsewhere were arrested among them being henry schaefer who was taken to wilmington barracks but through influential friends was released after a few days on account of the known political views of their proprietors some of the hotels also were placed under watch for a while but beyond the wrath of the innkeepers at the sentinels pacing up and down their verandas nothing more serious transpired men on both sides grew hot-headed and abused one another roundly but few bones were broken and little blood was shed a policy of leniency was adopted by the authorities and sooner or later persons arrested for political offenses were discharged the ominous tidings from beyond the colorado and their effect presaging somewhat the great intercene conflict recalls an unpublished anecdote of winfield scott hancock who was a graduate of west point an intense patriot and a natural born fighter one day in 1861, coincident with the Texan invasion, and while I was visiting him in his office on Main Street near 3rd, after he had removed from the upstairs rooms adjoining the Odd Fellows Hall in the Temple Building, John Goller dropped in with the rumor that conspirators, in what was soon to become Arizona, were about to seize the government stores. Hancock was much wrought up when he heard the report, and declared with angry vehemence that he would treat the whole damned lot of them as common thieves. In the light of this demonstration and his subsequent part as a national character of great renown, Hancock's speech at the 4th of July celebration in 1861, when the patriotic Angelenos assembled at the plaza and marched to the shady grove of Don Luis Sansevain, is worthy of special note. Hancock made a sound argument for the preservation of the Union and was heartily applauded, and a few days afterward one of the local newspapers, in paying him a deserved tribute, almost breathed in augury in saying, Captain Hancock's loyalty to the Stars and Stripes has never for a moment been doubted, and we hope he may be advanced in rank and honors, and live to a green old age, to see the glorious banner of our country yet waving in peaceful glory over a united, prosperous, and happy people. Few of us, however, who heard Hancock speak on that occasion, dreamed to what high position he would eventually attain. Soon after this episode, that is, in the early part of August, 1861, Hancock left for the front. In company with his wife and taking with him his military band he departed from san pedro on the steamer senator some of my readers may know that mrs hancock after whom the ill-fated ada hancock was named was a southern woman and though very devoted to her husband had certain natural sympathies for the south but none i dare say will have heard how she perpetrated an amusing joke upon him on their way north when once out upon the briny deep she induced the musicians to play dixie to the great amusement of the passengers like many southerners mrs hancock was an episcopalian and frequently contributed her unusual musical talent to the service of the choir of st athanasius church the little edifice for a while at the foot of pound cake hill first the location of the los angeles high school and now of the county courthouse and the forerunner of the episcopal pro cathedral on olive street opposite central park Having in mind the sojourn in Los Angeles for years of these representative Americans, the following editorial from the Los Angeles Star on the departure of the future general and presidential nominee seems to me now of more than passing significance. While resident here, Captain Hancock took great interest in our citizens, the development of our resources, and the welfare of this section of the country and as a public-spirited enterprising gentleman he will be missed from among us and his most estimable lady will long live in the hearts of her many friends we desire their prosperity happiness and long life wherever their lot may be cast the establishing of drum barracks and camp drum at wilmington was a great contribution to the making of that town for the government not only spent over a million dollars in buildings and works there and constantly drew on the town for at least part of its supplies but provisions of all kinds were sent through Wilmington to troops in Southern California, Utah, Yuma, Tucson, and vicinity, and New Mexico. P. H., popularly known as Major Downing, was employed by Banning for some time during the war to take charge of the great wagon trains of government supplies sent inland, and later he opened a general merchandise store in Wilmington, 
after which he transacted a large volume of business with H. Newmark and Company. At the breaking out of the war, the Southern Overland Mail Route was discontinued and a contract was made with Butterfield for service along a more central course by way of Great Salt Lake. There was then a stage six times a week, and a branch line ran to Denver, the terminus having been changed from St. Joseph to Omaha. Twenty days was the time allowed the company to get its stages through during eight months of the year, and twenty-three days for the more uncertain winter months. This contract was made for three years, and one million dollars a year was the compensation allowed the Butterfields. After the war, the old route was resumed. J. DeBarth Shorb came to Los Angeles at the commencement of the war as assistant superintendent of the Philadelphia and California Oil Company, and in 1867 he bought the Tecumseh Grant and began to mine upon the property. The same year he married a daughter of B. D. Wilson, establishing a relationship which brought him a partnership in the San Gabriel Wine Company, of which he eventually became manager. His position in this community, until he died in 1895, was important, the little town of Shorb testifying to one of his activities. Not only were the followers of the indefatigable Padres rather tardy in taking up the cultivation of olives, but the olive oil industry hereabouts was a still later venture. As an illustration, even in 1861, somewhat less than 500 gallons of olive oil was made in all Los Angeles County, and most of that was produced at the San Fernando Mission. How important was the office of the Janeiro may be gathered from the fact that in 1861 he was paid $1,200 a year, while the mayor received only $800 and the treasurer $200 less than the mayor. At the same time, the marshal, owing to the hazardous duties of his office, received as much as the mayor, the city attorney $100 less than the treasurer, and the clerk but 350 by 1861, there were serious doubts as to the future of cattle raising in Southern California, but Banning and Company came forward proposing to slaughter at New San Pedro and contracted with John Temple, John Raines, and others to do their killing. For a while, the enterprise was encouraged, Temple alone having 600 heads so disposed of and sold. In September, Columbus Sims, the popular attorney of unique personality, who from 1856 to 1860 had been clerk of the United States District Court, was appointed lieutenant colonel in the United States Army and placed in charge of Camp Alert at the Pioneer Race Course, San Francisco, where twelve companies were soon assembled, and a month or two later he was made colonel in the 2nd Cavalry. Late in December of that year, however, he had an altercation with D.D. Colton in San Francisco when blows were exchanged and Sims drew a deadly weapon. For this, the doughty colonel was arrested and held to await the action of the grand jury but I am under the impression that nothing very serious befell the belligerent Sims as a result. On September 11th, H. Stassforth, after having bought out A. W. Schultz, announced a change in the control of the United States Hotel, inviting the public at the same time to a free lunch at half-past four o'clock in the following Sunday. Stassforth was an odd but interesting character and stated in his advertisement that guests were at liberty when they had partaken of the collation to judge if he could keep a hotel. Whether successful or otherwise, Stassforth did not long continue in control, for in November 1862 he disposed of the business to Weber and Haas, who in turn sold it to Louis Mesmer. In the fall, an atrocious murder took place here, proving but the first in a series of vile deeds for which eventually the culprit paid with his own life at the hands of an infuriated populace. On Sunday evening, September 30th, some Frenchmen were assembled to sit up with the body of one of their recently deceased countrymen and about eleven o'clock a quarrel arose between two of the watchers, A.M.G., or Michel Le Chenet, a man once of good repute, who had cast some slurs at the French Benevolent Society, and Henry de Laval, a respected employee of the Aliso Mills, who spiritedly defended the organization. La Chenet drew a weapon, approached de Laval, and tried to shoot him, but the pistol misfired. Thereupon, La Chenet, enraged, walked toward a lamp, adjusted two other caps, and deliberately shot de Laval through the body. The next day his victim died. La Chenet made his escape and so eluded the authorities that it was not until the middle of February 1866 that he surrendered himself to Deputy Sheriff Henderson. Then he was tried, but was acquitted. About October, Remy Nadeau, a Canadian, after whom Nadeau Street is named, and father of George A. Nadeau, came across the plains to Los Angeles, having spent the previous winter en route in Salt Lake City, and for a while he teamed between here and Montana. 
Within the year, believing that San Francisco offered a larger field, he moved to that city and continued his operations there. In the front part of a little building on Main Street between 2nd and 3rd, Lorenzo Leck, whom I have already mentioned, conducted a grocery, living with his family in the rear. He was a plain, unassuming, honest Dane of the old school, who attended scrupulously to his business and devoted his Sundays and holidays to modest amusements. On such days he would put his wife, Caroline, and their children on a little wagon that he owned and take them to his vineyard on the outskirts of the town. And there he would enjoy with them those rural pastimes to which he had been accustomed in the fatherland, and which to many early comers here were a source of rest and delight. On the afternoon of Saturday, October 17th, Francisco Cota, a Mexican boy fifteen years of age, entered Leck's store while he was out, and, taking advantage of the fact that Frau Leck was alone, whipped out a knife, stabbed her to death, stole what cash was in sight, and then escaped to a vineyard where he hid himself. John W. Henderson, the son of A. J. Henderson, a deputy sheriff still living in Los Angeles, came in soon after, and finding Mrs. Leck horribly disfigured, he gave the alarm. Neighbors and friends at once started in pursuit and caught Cota, and having tied a rope around the murderer's neck during the excitement, they dragged him down Alameda Street, where I witnessed the uproar. As they proceeded by way of Aliso Street, the mob became more and more infuriated, so that before it reached the spot which had been selected for his execution, the boy had been repeatedly stabbed and was nearly dead. At length he was strung up as a warning to other malefactors. A short time after this melancholy event, I was driving with my rife to the Sarritos Rancho, and, missing our road, we stopped at a Mexican home to inquire the way. The woman who answered our summons proved to be one who knew, and was known by all Los Angeles merchants, on account of her frequent excursions to town. She was, in fact, the mother of the Mexican boy who had been mobbed and hung for the murder of poor Lex's wife. The sight of gringos kindled anew her maternal wrath, and she set up such a hue and cry as to preclude any further intelligible conversation. California, being so far removed from the seat of war, did not awake to its full significance until the credit of the government began to decline. Four weeks were required, it is well to remember, to complete the trip from New York to San Francisco via Panama, and our knowledge of events in the East was far from perfect. Until the completion of the Continental Telegraph in October 1861, the only immediate news that reached the coast came privately, and we were, therefore, pretty much in the dark until the arrival of Eastern newspapers, and even after that telegraphing was so expensive that our poorly patronized little news sheets could not afford the outlay. A few of us, therefore, made up a purse of $100 a month, which small sum enabled us to allay our anxiety, at least, in the case of very important happenings. It must not be forgotten, though, that we then had a little relief from San Francisco, whose newspapers, containing some telegraphic dispatches, arrived in town perhaps three to four days after their publication. I may add, in fact, that it was not until about the beginning of the 80s that Los Angeles dailies could afford the luxury of regular direct telegrams. In other respects as well, editing a local newspaper during the war was apt to entail financial loss. The Los Angeles News, for instance, was outspoken for the Union and so escaped the temporary eclipse suffered by the Star through government censorship. But the Unionists being in a decided minority in the community, pickings for the News were mighty poor. Perhaps this want of patronage suggested the advisability, in 1863, when that paper was published by C. R. Conway and Alonzo Waite on Main Street, opposite the Express Office, of reducing the subscription rate to $5 a year. Probably one of the most interesting visits to Los Angeles ever made by a well-known personage was the sudden call with which Lady Franklin, the wife of the eminent lost Arctic explorer, honored our little town far back in 1861. The distinguished lady, accompanied by Mrs. Crickroft, her niece, Commodore and Madame Watkins, and Collector and Mrs. Rankin, arrived at San Pedro on the Golden State during the first week in November, and was driven with her companions to the Bella Union Hotel, from which she made such short excursions about the city as were then possible, and as sympathy for her in her sorrow, and admiration for her long years of plucky though vain search for her husband were still general, every courtesy possible was afforded her. During Lady Franklin's stay, Benjamin D. Wilson arranged a delightful garden party at his hospitable mansion at Lake Vineyard in her ladyship's honor, and Phineas Banning also entertained her with a reception and collation at his San Pedro home. And these receptions and collations were as enjoyable as they were notable. 
after a day or two lady franklin and her party left on the senator for san francisco being accorded as the vessel weighed anchor a marked ovation for many years funerals were attended by men on horseback and by women on foot as hacks were unknown in early days and while the good citizens were doubtless then conducted to their last resting place in a manner just as satisfactory to themselves as are their descendants who are buried according to present-day customs those who followed in the train were very seriously inconvenienced by the melancholy dusty processions to the old and now forgotten burial grounds for in those days the trip in summer exceedingly hot and in winter through rain and mud was a long fatiguing one speaking of funerals a strange sight was witnessed in our streets about the end of november eighteen sixty one attending the burial of a child the father and mother both native californians were seated in a wagon in which was also placed the strikingly plain little coffin or box containing the dead beside the wagon walked an old man playing a fiddle two or three persons followed in the deep mud the whole forming a weird picture said to be the relic of an almost obsolete backwoods custom banning and hitchman's comet proving insufficient the gondolier was put on in the fall of eighteen sixty one it became a familiar craft in the conveying of passengers and freight between new san pedro and the ships lying off the harbor two years previous to the completion of the telegraph from san francisco to los angeles that is in eighteen fifty eight the first continental telegraph was undertaken and by october eighteen sixty one governor downey of california sent a congratulatory message to president lincoln on november seventh the line was open to the public several months before all the companies in the state had consolidated into the california state telegraph company banning and hinchman having succeeded for a short season phineas banning the subcontractor for building of the first telegraph they made an effort following the establishment of communication between the atlantic and the pacific to secure a line to new san pedro and at the end of october eighteen sixty one the first telegraph pole in the long row from los angeles to the harbor was formally set about the middle of november this line was completed and though it was widely proclaimed as working like a charm the apparatus soon got out of order and by the following january there were many complaints that both poles and wire had fallen to the ground blocking the thoroughfares and entangling animals in such a way as to become a nuisance indeed there was soon a public demand either to repair the telegraph or to remove it altogether and throw the equipment away soon after the first of february eighteen sixty two the line was working again but by that time the telegraph to san francisco had gotten out of order and so great were the difficulties in repairing that line that los angeles was not again talking uninterruptedly over the wire with its neighbor until july on november fifteenth the first number of el amigo del pueblo printed in spanish appeared from the shop of jose e gonzalez and company but native support being withheld the friend of the people starved to death in the following may whaling like shark hunting continued brisk in eighteen sixty one and eighteen sixty two and many vessels were fitted out at san pedro los angeles merchants selling them most of their supplies the sea monsters usually moved up the coast about the first of the year the males keeping in toward the shore going up and the females hugging the coast coming down and small boats such as captain w clark's ocean used to take from four hundred and fifty to five hundred barrels of oil in five or six weeks for six days in march eighteen sixty two san pedro whalers harpooned a whale a day bringing to the landing over two hundred barrels of oil as a result of the week's labor the bitter fight between abolitionists and southern sympathizers was immediately reflected in the public schools defenders of the union worked for a formal oath of allegiance to the national government as a preliminary to granting teachers certificates while the confederates incensed at what they deemed a violation of personal rights assailed the institutions the result was that attendance at the public schools gradually fell off until in the winter of eighteen sixty five and sixty six only about three hundred and fifty children of school age were being instructed by public teachers another third of a thousand was in private schools while some three hundred and sixty nine were not on any roster the gloom naturally caused by the outbreak of war was sometimes penetrated by the brightness of social life and among the happier occasions of the winter of eighteen sixty one was the marriage on december twenty third in the presence of a large circle of friends of tom de mott to ascension daughter of don jose andres and doña francisca abila sepulveda the winter of eighteen sixty one to sixty two recorded the greatest of all floods especially in the north where in december and january something like thirty-five inches of rain was precipitated 
In Los Angeles County, the rivers soon rose and overflowed the lowlands, but the rise was gradual, causing the loss of but few or no lives and permitting the stock to reach the neighboring hills in safety. In Anaheim, the water was four feet deep in the streets and people had to seek flight to the uplands or retreat to the roofs of their little houses. Vineyards were sometimes half ruined with the layers of deep sand. Banks of streams were lined for miles with driftwood, and ranchers saw many a clod of their farms carried off and deposited to enrich their neighbors miles away. For a month it rained so steadily that the sun peeped out for scarcely an hour. I witnessed this inundation in Los Angeles, where much damage was done to business buildings, especially to Mellis's Row, and saw merchants in water up to their waists trying to save their goods. The wall of the room occupied by Sam Meyer fell first, whereupon Hellman and Brother became intensely interested in the removal of their stock, while poor Sam, knee-deep in water, sadly contemplated his losses. Before the Hellmans had made much headway, they observed a tendency on the part of their walls to crumble, and their exit was neither graceful nor delayed. After that, the store occupied by Meyer and Breslauer caved in, smashing showcases and shelves, and ruining a large amount of merchandise. The ludicrous picture of this rush for safety first is not a fit reflection of the feelings of those pioneers who saw the results of years of labor obliterated in a moment. Friends and neighbors lent assistance to the unfortunate and helped to save what they could. After this flood, Hellman and Brother and Sam Meyer removed to the Arcadia block, while Meyer and Breslauer secured accommodations north of the Plaza Church. End of chapter 21《Chapter Twenty Two of Sixty Years in Southern California, eighteen fifty three to nineteen thirteen, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter Twenty Two Droughts, the Ada Hancock Disaster, eighteen sixty two to eighteen sixty three. On the first of January, eighteen sixty two, after an experience of about five years, I retired from the selling of clothing which was never congenial to me. And as I had been buying hides and wool on a small scale since the middle of the fifties, I forthwith devoted myself to the commission business. Frenchmen from the Basque country, among whom were Miguel Leonis, Gaston Oxerart, Domingo Amistoy, and Domingo Bastanchuri, had commenced to appear here in 1858 and to raise sheep. So that in 1859, large flocks were brought into Southern California the sheep commanding a price of three dollars and a half per head. My own operations, exceedingly small in the beginning, increased in importance, and by 1862 I was fairly equipped for this venture. Corn, barley, and wheat were also then being raised, and I busied myself with these commodities as well. Most of the early sheepmen prospered, and in time bought large tracts of land for their flocks, and with all of them I had dealings of more or less importance. Amistoy's career is worthy of particular mention as exemplifying the three cardinal virtues of business, honesty, application, and frugality. He and his wife took in washing, and while the husband went from house to house, leading a horse with a large basket strapped to either side, to collect and deliver the clothes, the wife toiled at the tub. In the end, what they together had saved became the foundation of their important investments in sheep and land. Pedro La Ronde, another early sheepman, married the widow of his Basque fellow countryman, Echemende, the tippling baker. Having regularly established a commission business, I brought consignment of varied merchandise from San Francisco on the semi-monthly steamer Goliath, whose captain at one time was Robert Haley, and at another his brother Salisbury Haley, a brother-in-law of Tom Mott. And I disposed of them to small dealers, with whom I thus became pretty well acquainted. These consignments were sold almost as soon as they arrived. I was careful to bring in only staple articles in the grocery line, and it was long before I appreciated the advantage of carrying sufficient stock to supply a regular demand. On the return trips of the steamer to San Francisco, I forwarded such produce as I had accumulated. I do not recall any important changes in 1862, the declining months of which saw the beginning of the two years' devastating drought. The Civil War was in progress, but we were so far from the scene of strife that we were not materially affected. Sympathy was very general here for the Confederate cause, and the government therefore retained in Wilmington both troops and clerks who were paid in a badly depreciated currency, which they were obliged to discount at exorbitant rates, 
to get money at all, while other employees had to accept vouchers which were subject to a still greater discount. Notwithstanding these difficulties, however, payday increased the resources of the Pueblo considerably. Hellman and Brother, a partnership consisting of I. M. and Samuel Hellman, dissolved on January 2nd, I. M. continuing in the dry goods business while Sam took the books and stationery. Another brother and associate, H. M. Hellman, a couple of years before, had returned to Europe where he died. If my memory is accurate, I. W. remained with I. M. Hellman until the former, in 1865, bought out A. Portugal. Samuel A. Whitney, who later had a curio store, was in for a while with Sam Hellman in a partnership known as Hellman and Whitney. On January 17th, Don Louis Vignet passed away in Los Angeles at the age of 91 years. January also witnessed one of those typical scenes in the fitting out of a mule and wagon train never likely to be seen in Los Angeles again. 200 wagons and 1,200 mules, mostly brought from San Francisco on steamers, were assembled for a trip across the desert to convey government stores. M. J. Newmark became a partner, on February 1st, in the firm of Howard Butterworth and Newmark, federal and state attorneys with offices in the Temple Building, Los Angeles, and Armory Hall, San Francisco, and it was considered at the time a rapid advance for a man of but 23 years of age. The Los Angeles Star of that date, in fact, added a word of good fellowship. We congratulate friend Newmark on the association. The intimate relations characteristic of a small community such as ours, in the much more general effect then than nowadays of any tragical occurrence, have already been described. Deep sympathy was therefore awakened early in February on the arrival of the steamer Senator and the rapid dissemination of the report that Dr. Thomas Foster, the ex-mayor, had been lost overboard on January 29th on the boat's trip northward. Just what happened to Foster will never be known. In San Francisco it was reported that he had thrown himself into the sea, though others who knew him well looked upon the cause of his death as accidental. But slight attention was paid to the report, brought in by horsemen from San Bernardino on February 4th, that an earthquake had occurred there in the morning, until Captain Tom Seeley returned with the senator to San Pedro and told about a seismic disturbance at sea, during which he struck the wildest storm off Point Concepcion in all his seafaring experience. Sailors were then better all-around seamen than now, yet there was greater superstition in Jack Tarr's mind, and such a storm made a deep impression upon his imagination. I have alluded to the dependence of Los Angeles on the outside world, no better evidence of which, perhaps, can be cited than that on the 22nd of February. George W. Chapin and Company of San Francisco advertised here to furnish servants and other help to anyone in the Southland. About the same time, San Bernardino parties, wishing to bore a little artisan well, had to send to the northern metropolis for the necessary machinery. In October 1860, as I have intimated, Phineas Banning took A. F. Hinchman into partnership, the firm being known as Banning and Hinchman, and they seemed to prosper, but on February 12, 1862, the public was surprised at the announcement of the firm's dissolution. Banning continued as proprietor, and Hinchman became Banning's Los Angeles agent. Although cattle raising was the mainstay of Southern California for many years, and gold mining never played a very important part here, Wells Fargo and Company, during the spring, frequently shipped thousands of dollars worth of gold at a time, gathered from Santa Anita, San Gabriel, and San Fernando placers, while probably an equally large amount was forwarded out through other channels. I have already pointed to the clever foresight shown by Abel Stearns when he built the Arcadia block and profited by the unhappy experience of others with rain that flooded their property. But I have not stated that in elevating his new building considerably above the grade of the street, somewhat regardless of the rights of others, he caused the surplus water to run off into neighboring streets and buildings. Following the great storm of 1861-62, to 62, the city sued Stearns for damages, but he won his case. More than that, the overflow was a godsend to him, for it induced a number of people to move from Mellis's Row to Arcadia Block at a time when the owner of vast ranches and some of the best town property was already feeling the pinch of the alternate dry and overwet seasons. The fact is, as I shall soon make clear, that before Stearns had seen the end of two or three successive dry seasons yet to come, he was temporarily bankrupt and embarrassed to the utmost. By April, the walls and roof for the little Protestant church at Temple and New High Streets had been built, and there the matter rested for two years, when the structure, on which the taxes were unpaid, was advertised for sale. 
we have seen that the first jewish services here were held soon after the arrival of joseph newmark in eighteen fifty four under the same disadvantageous conditions as had hampered the protestant denominations mr newmark volunteered to officiate on the principal holidays until eighteen sixty two when the rev abraham wolf edelman arrived born at warsaw in eighteen thirty two rabbi edelman came to america in eighteen fifty one immediately after he was married to miss hannah pessa Cohn, and settled successively in new york patterson and buffalo coming to california in eighteen fifty nine he resided in san francisco until the eighteen sixty two when he was chosen rabbi of the orthodox congregation benai brith of los angeles and soon attained distinction as a talmudic scholar and a preacher the first services under rabbi edelman were held in stearns's or arcadia hall next the congregation worshipped in lex hall on main street between second and third and finally through the courtesy of judge ignacio sapoveda the courtroom was used in eighteen seventy three the jews of los angeles erected their first synagogue a brick building entered by a steep stairway leading to a platform and located on the east side of fort street between second and third on what is now the site of the cop building next to the city hall in 1886, when local Jewry instituted a much more liberal ritual, Rabbi Edelman's convictions induced him to resign. The purchase of a lot for a home on the corner of 6th and Main Streets proved a fortunate investment, later enabling him to enjoy a well-deserved comfort and to gratify his charitable inclinations. It is a strange coincidence that Rev. Edelman's first marriage ceremony was that which blessed Samuel Prager, while the last occasion on which he performed the solemn rites for the dead, shortly before his own death in 1907, was for the same friend. A. M. Edelman, the architect, and Dr. D. W. Edelman, both well-known here, are sons of the rabbi. As late in the season as April, hail and snow fell in and near Los Angeles. To the north of the city, the white mantle quite hid the mountains and formed a new lower snow line, while within the city, the temperature so lowered that at several intervals during the day, huge hailstones beat against the window panes a very unusual experience for angelenos because of political charges preferred against a j king then under sheriff of the county the latter on april tenth was arrested by henry d barrows united states marshal who had been appointed by president lincoln the year previous colonel carleton commander of the southern military division however soon liberated king on the last day of the year, the undersheriff married the estimable Miss Laura C. Evertson. Travelers to Europe have often suffered much annoyance through safe conduct regulations, but seldom have Americans had their liberty thus restricted by their own authorities. Toward the middle of June, word was received in Los Angeles that owing to the suspicion lest disloyalists were embarking for Aspinwall, all passengers for California via the Isthmus would be required to take out passports. Anticipating, by forty years or more, Luther Burbank's work, attention was directed as early as 1862 to the possibility of eating the cactus, and thus finding, in this half-despised plant of the desert, relief both from hunger and thirst. Half a century later, in 1913, Los Angeles established the cactus candy industry, through which the boiled pulp of the bisnaga, often spoken of as the fish hook, barrel and niggerhead variety is made deliciously palatable when syruped from ten to thirty days ignacio sepulveda declared by the los angeles star a young gentleman of liberal education and good natural endowments already versed in legal studies on september sixth was admitted to the district court bar on january eighteenth eighteen sixty the first number of the semi-weekly southern news appeared containing advertisements in both english and spanish it was issued by c r conway and alonzo waite who charged twenty-five cents a copy or seven dollars a year on october eighth eighteen sixty two the title was changed to the los angeles semi-weekly news in eighteen sixty the bella union as i have said was under the management of john king who came here in eighteen fifty six while in eighteen sixty one j b winston and company who were represented by henry reed controlled the hotel in 1862 or 1863 john king and henry hamill were the managers i have told of the purchase of the san pascual rancho by dr j s griffin on december eleventh dr and mrs griffin for five hundred dollars sold to b d wilson and wife some six hundred and forty acres of that property and a few hours afterward the wilsons disposed of two hundred and sixty two acres for one thousand dollars the purchaser was mrs eliza g johnston wife of general albert sidney johnston 
Mrs. Johnston at once built a neat residence on the tract and called it Fair Oaks, after the plantation in Virginia on which she had been born, and from this circumstance the name of the now well-known Fair Oaks Avenue in Pasadena is derived. At the time of her purchase, Mrs. Johnston had hoped to reside there permanently, but the tragic fate of her son in the Ada Hancock disaster, following the untimely death of her husband at Shiloh and the apparent uselessness of the land, led her to sell to Judge B. S. Eaton what today would be worth far more than thousands of acres in many parts of the southern states. A curious coincidence in the relations of General Sumner, who superseded General Johnston, to the hero of Shiloh is that, later in the war, Sumner led a corps of Union troops at Fair Oaks, Virginia. Don Ignacio Coronel, father of Antonio Franco Coronel, and the early school patron to whom I have referred, died in Los Angeles on December 19th, aged 70 years. He had come to California in 1834 and had long been eminent in political councils and social circles. I recall him as a man of strong intellect and sterling character, kind-hearted and popular. Another effort without success to use camels for transportation over the California and adjacent sands was made in January 1863 when a camel express was sent out from New San Pedro to Tucson. Elsewhere I have indicated the condition of the public cemetery. While an adobe wall enclosed the Roman Catholic burial place, and a brick wall surrounded the Jewish resting place for the dead, nothing was done until 1863 to improve the Protestant cemetery, although desecration went so far that the little railing around the grave of poor Mrs. Leck, the grocer's wife who had been murdered, was torn down and burned. Finally, the matter cried to heaven so audibly that in January, Los Angeles Masons appropriated $150 to be added to some $500 raised by popular subscription and the common council having appointed a committee to supervise the work william h perry put up the fence making no charge for his services about the middle of january word was received in los angeles of the death at baltimore of colonel b l beal commander for forty years of the fort tejon garrison and active in the mojave and kern river campaigns death entered our home for the first time when an infant daughter less than a month old died this year on february fourteenth in February, the editor of The News advertised the experiment of growing cotton as an additional activity for the Colorado Indians, who were already cultivating corn, beans, and melons. Whether this suggestion led William Workman into cotton culture, I do not know. At any rate, late in November of the same year, F.P.F. Temple was exhibiting about town some well-matured bowls of cotton raised on Workman's ranch, and the next spring saw in El Monte a number of fields planted with cotton seed. A year later, J. Morinhout sent Los Angeles cotton to an exhibition in France and received from across the water official assurance that the French judges regarded our product as quite equal to that grown in the southern states. This gave a slight impetus to cotton culture here, and by January 1865 a number of immigrants had arrived, looking for suitable lands for the production of this staple. They soon went to work, and in August of that year many fields gave promise of good crops, far exceeding the expectations of the experimenters. In the month of March, a lively agitation on behalf of a railroad began in the public press, and some bitter things were said against those who, for the sake of a little trade in horses or draying, were opposed to such a forward step. And under the leadership of E. J. C. Kewen and J. A. Watson, our assemblymen at that session, the legislature of 1863 passed an act authorizing the construction of the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad. A public meeting was called to discuss the details and to further the project, but once more no railroad was built or even begun. Strange as it seems, the idea of a railroad for Los Angeles County in 1863 was much too advanced for the times. Billed as one, who had had the honor of appearing before King William IV and all the principal crowned heads of Europe, Professor Cordier held forth with an exhibition of magic in the Temple Theater, drawing the usual crowd of royalty haters. In 1863, Santa Catalina was the scene of a gold-mining boom, which soon came to naught, and through an odd enough occurrence. About April, Martin M. Kimberly and Daniel E. Way staked out a claim or two, and some miners agreed on a coat of lofts for operations in what was to be known as the San Pedro Mining District, the boundaries of which were to include all the islands of the county. Extensive claims, chiefly in Cherry and Jolly Valleys, and on Mineral Hill, were recorded, and streets were laid out for a town to be known as Queen City. But just as the boom seemed likely to mature, the national government stepped in and gave a quietus to the whole affair. 
with or without foundation, reports had reached the federal authorities that the movement was but a cloak to establish their well-fortified Confederate headquarters for the fitting out and repair of privateers intended to prey upon the coastwise traders. And on February 5, 1864, Captain B. R. West, commanding the 4th California Infantry, ordered practically all of the miners and prospectors to leave the island at once. The following September, the national troops were withdrawn, and after the war, the federal authorities retained control of a point on the island deemed serviceable for lighthouse purposes. In the spring of 1863, feeling ill, I went to San Francisco to consult Dr. Toland, who assured me that there was nothing serious the matter with me, but wishing to satisfy myself more thoroughly, I resorted to the same means that I dare say many others have adopted, a medical examination for life insurance. Bernhard Gattel, general agent of the Germania Life Insurance Company at 315 Montgomery Street, wrote out my application, and on March 20th a policy, numbered 1472, was issued, making me, since the fall of 1913, the oldest living policyholder in the Southwest, and the twentieth oldest of the Germania's patrons in the world. Californians, during that period of the war when the North was suffering a series of defeats, had little use for greenbacks. At one time, a dollar in currency was worth but 35 cents, though early in April it was accepted at 65, late in August at 90, and about the 1st of October at 75 cents, even interest-bearing gold notes being worth no more. This condition of the money market saw little change until some time in the 70s, and throughout the war greenbacks were handled like any other commodity. Frank Le Couvrier, in one of these periods, after getting judgment in a suit against Deputy Surveyor William Moore for civil engineering services and being paid some $383 in greenbacks, was disconcerted enough when he found that his currency would command but $180 in gold. San Francisco merchants realized fortunes when a decline occurred as they bought their merchandise in the East for greenbacks and sold it on the coast for gold. Los Angeles people, on the other hand, enjoyed no such benefit as they brought their wares from San Francisco and were therefore obligated to liquidate in specie. Among the worst tragedies in the early annals of Los Angeles, and by far the most dramatic, was the disaster on April 27th to the little steamer Ada Hancock. While on a second trip in the harbor of San Pedro to transfer the senator the remainder of the passengers bound for the north, the vessel careened, admitting cold water to the engine room, and exploding the boiler with such force that the boat was demolished to the water's edge, fragments being found on an island even half to three-quarters of a mile away. Such was the intensity of the blast in the area of the devastation that of the fifty-three or more passengers known to have been aboard, twenty-six at least perished. Fortunate indeed were those, including Phineas Banning, the owner, who survived with minor injuries, after being hurled many feet into the air. Among the dead were Thomas W. Seeley, captain of the Senator, Joseph Bryant, captain of the Ada Hancock, Dr. H. R. Miles, the druggist who had been in partnership opposite the Bella Union with Dr. J. C. Welch, an arrival of the early fifties who died in 1869, Thomas H. Workman, Banning's chief clerk, Albert Sidney Johnston, Jr., William T. B. Sanford, once postmaster, Louis Schlesinger and William Ritchie, Wells Fargo's messenger, to whom was entrusted $10,000, which, as far as my memory goes, was lost. Two Mormon missionaries en route to the Sandwich Islands were also killed. Still another, who lost not only his treasure but his life, was Fred E. Curlin of Fort Tejon. $30,000 which he carried with him in greenbacks disappeared as mysteriously as did the jewelry on the persons of others, and from these circumstances it was concluded that, even in the presence of death, these bodies had been speedily robbed. Mrs. Banning and her mother, Mrs. Sanford, and a daughter of B. D. Wilson, were among the wounded, while Miss M. Herford, Mrs. Wilson's sister and the fiancé of Dr. Miles, was so severely injured that after long suffering she also died. Although the accident had happened about five o'clock in the afternoon, the awful news, casting a general and indescribable gloom, was not received in town until nearly eight o'clock, when Drs. Griffin and R. T. Hayes, together with an army surgeon named Todd, hastened in carriages to the harbor where soldiers from Camp Drum had already asserted their authority. Many of the victims were buried near the beach at New San Pedro. While I was calling upon Mrs. Johnston to express my sympathy, the body of her son was brought in, and words cannot describe the pathos of the scene when she addressed the departed as if he were but asleep. 
in june the government demanded a formal profession of loyalty from teachers when miss mary hoyt and miss eliza madigan took the oath but mrs thomas foster and william mckee refused to do so the incident provoked bitter criticism and nothing being done to punish the recalcitrants the los angeles board of education was charged with indifference as to the allegiance of its public servants during 1863, sectional feeling had grown so bitter on account of the war that no attempt was made to celebrate the 4th of July in town. At Fort Latham, however, on the Bayona Ranch, the soldiers observed the day with an appropriate demonstration. By the end of July, troops had been sent from drum barracks to camp in the city, for the protection, so it was asserted, of Union men whose lives were said to be in danger, although some people claimed that this movement was rather for the purposes of intimidating certain leaders with known sympathy for the South this military display gave northerners more backbone and on the twenty sixth of september a union mass meeting was held on main street in front of the lafayette hotel eldridge edwards hewitt a mexican war veteran who came to california in eighteen forty nine to search for gold arrived in los angeles on july thirty first and soon went on a wild goose chase to the weaver diggings in arizona actually tramping with luggage over five hundred miles of the way after his return he did odd jobs for his board working in a stationery and toy store on main street kept by the goldwater brothers joe and mike who had arrived in the early sixties and later he entered the employ of phineas banning at wilmington with whom he remained until the completion of the los angeles and san pedro railroad in eighteen seventy when he became its superintendent when the southern pacific obtained control of that road in eighteen seventy three hewitt was made agent and after the extension of the line from san francisco he was appointed division superintendent in that capacity he brought senator leland stanforth to me as i shall elsewhere relate to solicit h newmark and company's patronage it was in eighteen sixty three that dr j s griffin father of east los angeles purchased two thousand acres in that section at fifty cents an acre but even at that price he was only induced to buy it by necessity Griffin wanted sheep pasture and had sought to secure some 800 acres of city land along the river, but as this would prevent other cattle or sheep from approaching the water to drink, the Common Council refused Griffin's bid on the smaller area of land and he was compelled to buy the Mesa farther back. Seems to me that B.D. Wilson, J.G. Downey, and Hancock M. Johnston, General Johnston's son, also had something to do with this transaction. Both Downey and Griffin Avenues derived their names from the association of these two gentlemen with that section. A smallpox epidemic, which had started in the previous fall, spread through Los Angeles in 1863, and owing possibly to the bad sanitary and climactic conditions, much vigilance and time were required to eradicate it, compulsory vaccination not having been introduced, as it finally was at the suggestion of Dr. Walter Lindley, until the summer of 1876 the dread disease worked its ravages especially among the mexicans and indians as many as a dozen of them dying in a single day and these sufferers and their associates being under no quarantine and even bathing ad libitum in the zanjas the pest spread alarmingly for a time fatalities were so frequent and the nature of the contagion so feared that it was difficult to persuade undertakers to bury the dead even without funeral or other ceremony Following the opening of the Owens River Mines this year, Los Angeles merchants soon established a considerable trade with that territory. Banning inaugurated a system of wagon trains, each guarded by a detachment of soldiers. The San Fernando Mountains, impassable for heavy teaming, were an obstacle to regular trade with the new country and compelled the use of a circuitous route over poor roads. It became necessary, therefore, to consider a means of overcoming the difficulty, much money having already been spent by the county in an abortive attempt to build a tunnel. This second plan likewise came to naught, and it was in fact more than a decade before the Southern Pacific finally completed the famous bore. Largely because of political mistakes, including a manifestation of sympathy for the Southern Confederacy that drew him against Northern resentment and opposition, John G. Downey, the Democratic nominee for governor, was defeated at the election in September frederick f lowe a republican receiving a majority of over twenty thousand votes in october a peddler named brunn was murdered near chino brunn's brother living at san bernardino and subsequently a merchant of prominence there offered two hundred dollars of his slender savings as a reward for the capture of the slayer but nothing ever came of the search 
in november the stern necessities of war were at last driven home to angelinos when on the ninth of that somber month don juan warner deputy provost marshal appeared with his big blank books and began to superintend the registering of all able-bodied citizens suitable for military service to many the inquisition was not very welcome and had it not been for the union soldiers decamped at drum barracks this first step towards compulsory enrollment would undoubtedly have resulted in riotous disturbances i have frequently named tom mott but i may not have said that he was one of the representative local democratic politicians of his day he possessed indeed such influence with all classes that he was not only elected clerk of los angeles county in eighteen sixty three but succeeded himself in eighteen sixty five eighteen sixty seven and eighteen sixty nine afterwards sitting in the state assembly and in eighteen seventy six he was appointed a delegate to the national convention that nominated samuel j tilden for the presidency his relations in time with stanford crocker huntington and hopkins were very close and for at least twenty-five years he acted as their political adviser in all manners appertaining to southern california tall erect and dignified scrupulously attired and distinguished by his flowing beard tom was for more than half a century a striking figure in los angeles a most brutal murder took place on november fifteenth on the desert not far from los angeles but few days passing before it was avenged a poor miner named r a hester was fatally attacked by a border ruffian known as boston damewood while some confederates including the criminals chase ybarra and olivas stood by to prevent interference in a few hours officers and citizens were in the saddle in pursuit of the murderous band for damewood had boasted that hester was but the first of several of our citizens to whom he intended to pay his respects damewood and his three companions were captured and lodged in jail and on the twenty first of november two hundred or more armed vigilantes forced the jail doors seized the scoundrels and hung them to the portico of the old city hall on spring street tomas sanchez the sheriff talked of organizing a posse comitatus to arrest the committee leaders but so positive was public sentiment as reflected in the newspapers in support of the summary executions that nothing further was heard of the threat an incident of value in the study of mob psychology accentuated the day's events during the lynching the clattering of horses hoofs was heard when the cry was raised that cavalry from drum barracks was rushing to rescue the prisoners and in a twinkling those but a moment before most demonstrative were seen scurrying to cover in all directions instead however of federal soldiers the horsemen were the usual contingent of el monte boys coming to assist in the necktie party Besides the murderers lynched, there was an American boy named Wood, of about eighteen years, and although he had committed no offense more vicious than the theft of some chickens, he paid the penalty with his life, it having been the verdict of the committee that while they were at it, the jail might as well be cleared of every malefactor. A large empty case was secured as a platform on which the victim was to stand, and I shall never forget the spectacle of the youth, apparently oblivious of his impending doom, as he placed his hands upon the box and vaulted lightly to the top just as he might have done at an innocent gymnastic contest, and his parting salutation, I'm going to die a game hen chicken. The removal of the case a moment later, after the noose had been thrown over and drawn about the lad's head, left the poor victim suspended beyond human aid. On that same day a sixth prisoner barely escaped. When the crowd was debating the lynchings, John P. Lee, a resident of El Monte who had been convicted of murder, was already under the sentence of death and the vigilantes having duly considered his case decided that it would be just as well to permit the law to take its course some time later j lancaster brent lee's attorney appealed the case and obtained for his client a new trial finally clearing lee of the charges against him so that in the end he died a natural death i frequently saw lee after this episode and vividly recall an unpleasant interview years later the regularity of his visits had been interrupted and when he reappeared to get some merchandise for a customer at el monte i asked him where he had been he explained that a dog had bitten a little girl and that while she was suffering from hydrophobia she had in turn attacked him and so severely scratched his hands and face that for a while he could not show himself in public after that whenever i saw lee i was aware of a lurking if ridiculous suspicion that the moment might have arrived for a new manifestation of the rabies speaking of the civil war and the fact that in southern california there was less pronounced sentiment for the union than in the northern part of the state i am reminded of a relief movement that emphasized the distinction by the middle of november san francisco had sent over one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to the united states sanitary commission and an indignant protest was voiced in some quarters that los angeles up to that date had not participated 
In time, however, the friends of the Union here did make up a small purse. In 1863, interest in the old San Juan Capistrano mission was revived with the reopening of the historic structure so badly damaged by the earthquake of 1812, and a considerable number of townspeople went out to the first services under the new roof. When I first saw the mission near Don Juan Forster's home, there was in its open doors, windows, and cut stone and stucco ruins, its vines and wild flowers, much of the picturesque. On November 18, 1862, our little community was greatly stirred by the news that John Raines, one of Colonel Isaac Williams's son-in-law, and well known in Los Angeles, had been waylaid and killed on the highway near the Azusa Rancho the night before. It was claimed that one Ramon Carrillo had hired the assassins to do the foul deed, and about the middle of February 1863, a Mexican by the name of Manuel Serradel was arrested by Thomas Trafford, the city marshal, as a participant. In time, he was tried and sentenced to ten years in San Quentin prison. On December 9th, Sheriff Tomas Sanchez started to take the prisoner north, and at Wilmington boarded the little steamer Cricket to go out to the Senator, which was ready to sail. A goodly number of other passengers also boarded the tugboat, though nothing in particular was thought of the circumstance, but once out in the harbor, a group of vigilantes, indignant at the light sentence imposed, seized the culprit at a prearranged signal, threw a noose about his neck, and in a jiffy hung him to the flagstaff. When he was dead, the body was lowered and stones, brought aboard in packages by the committee, who had it evidently considered every detail, were tied to the feet, and the corpse was thrown overboard before the steamer was reached. This was one of the acts of the vigilantes that no one seemed to deprecate. Toward the end of 1861, J. E. Pleasance, while overseeing one of Wolfskill's ranches, hit the trail of some horse thieves, and, assisted by City Marshal William C. Warren, pursued and captured several, who were sent to the penitentiary. One, however, escaped. This was Charles Wilkins, a veritable scoundrel, who, having stolen a pistol and a knife from the Bella Union, and put the same into the hands of young Wood, whose lynching I have described, sent the lad on his way to the gallows. A couple of years later, Wilkins waylaid and murdered John Sanford, a rancher living near Fort Tejon, and a brother of Captain W. T. B. Sanford, the second postmaster of Los Angeles. And when the murderer had been apprehended and was being tried, an exciting incident occurred, to which I was an eyewitness. On November 16, 1854, Phineas Banning had married Miss Rebecca Sanford, a sister of the unfortunate man. And as Banning caught sight of Wilkins, he rushed forward and endeavored to avenge the crime by shooting the culprit. Banning was then restrained, but soon after, on December 17, 1863, he led the Vigilance Committee, which strung up Wilkins on Tomlinson and Griffith's Corral Gateway, where nearly a dozen culprits had already forfeited their lives. End of chapter 22Chapter 23 of 60 Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 22 Assassination of Lincoln, 1864 to 1865. Of all the years of adversity before, during, or since the Civil War, the seemingly interminable year of 1864 was for Southern California the worst. The varying moves in the great struggle, conducted mostly by Grant and Lee, Sherman and Farragut, buoyed now one, now the other side, but whichever way the tide of battle turned, business and financial conditions here altered but little and improved not a whit. The Southwest, as I have already pointed out, was more dependent for its prosperity on natural conditions, such as rain, than upon the victory of any army or fleet and as this was the last of three successive seasons of annihilating drought, ranchmen and merchant everywhere became downhearted. During the entire winter of 1862-63 to 63, no more than four inches of rain had fallen, and in 1864 not until March was there a shower, and even then the earth was scarcely moistened. With a total assessment of something like two million dollars in the county, not a cent of taxes, at least in the city, was collected. Men were so miserably poor that confidence mutually weakened, and merchants refused to trust those who, as land and cattle barons, but a short time before had been so influential, and most of whom, in another and more favorable season or two, were again operators of affluence. How great was the depreciation in values may be seen from the fact that notes given by Francis Temple, 
and bearing heavy interest, were peddled at about fifty cents on the dollar, and even then found few purchasers. As a result of these very infrequent rains, grass started up only to wither away, a small district around Anaheim, independent of the rainfall on account of its fine irrigation system, alone being green. And thither the lean and thirsty cattle came by thousands, rushing in their feverish state against the great willow fence I have elsewhere described. This stampede became such a menace, in fact, that the Anaheimers were summoned to defend their homes and property, and finally they had to place a mounted guard outside of the willow enclosures. Everywhere large numbers of horses and cattle died, as well as many sheep, the plains at length being strewn with carcasses and bleached bones. The suffering of the poor animals, beggar's description, and so distressed with hunger were they that I saw famished cattle, during the summer of 1864, while on a visit to the springs at Paso de Robles, crowd around the hotel veranda for the purpose of devouring the discarded matting containers which had held Chinese rice. I may also add that with the approach of summer the drought became worse and worse, contributing in no small degree to the spread of smallpox, then epidemic here. Stearns lost forty or fifty thousand head of livestock, and was much the greatest sufferer in this respect, and as a result he was compelled, about June 1865, to mortgage Los Alamitos Rancho, with its twenty-six thousand acres, to Michael Reese of San Francisco, for the almost paltry sum of twenty thousand dollars. Even this sacrifice, however, did not save him from still greater financial distress. In 1864, two Los Angeles merchants, Louis Schlesinger and Hyman Tischler, owing to the recent drought, foreclosed a mortgage on several thousand acres of land known as the Ricardo Vejar property, lying between Los Angeles and San Bernardino. Shortly after this transaction, Schlesinger was killed while on his way to San Francisco in the Ada Hancock explosion after which Tischler purchased Schlesinger's interest in the ranch and managed it alone. In January, Tischler invited me to accompany him on one of the numerous excursions which he made to his newly acquired possession, but though I was inclined to go, a business engagement interfered and kept me in town. Poor Edward Newman, another friend of Tischler's, took my place. On the way to San Bernardino from the rancho, the travelers were ambushed by some Mexicans, who shot Newman dead. It was generally assumed that the bullets were intended for Tischler, in revenge for his part in the foreclosure. At any rate, he would never go to the ranch again, and finally sold it to Don Luis Phillips, on credit for $30,000. The inventory included large herds of horses and cattle, which Phillips, during the subsequent wet season, drove to Utah, where he realized sufficient from their sale alone to pay for the whole property. Pomona and other important places now mark the neighborhood where once roamed his herds. Phillips died some years ago at the family residence which he had built on the ranch near Spadra. James R. Toberman, after a trying experience with Texan Redskins, came to Los Angeles in 1864, President Lincoln having appointed him United States Revenue Assessor here, an office which he held for six years. At the same time, as an exceptional privilege for a government officer, Toberman was permitted to become agent for Wells Fargo and Company. Again, the 4th of July was not celebrated here, the two factions in the community still opposing each other with bitterness. Hatred of the national government had increased through an incident of the previous spring which stirred the town mightily. On the 8th or 9th of May, a group stood discussing the Fort Pillow Massacre, when J. F. Bildermack indiscreetly expressed the wish that the Confederates would annihilate every Negro taken with arms, and every white man as well, who might be found in command of colored troops or some such equally dangerous and foolish sentiment. The indiscretion was reported to the government authorities, and Bilderback was straightway arrested by a lieutenant of cavalry, though he was soon released. Among the most rabid Democrats, particularly during the Civil War period, was Nigger Pete the Barber. One hot day in August, patriotic Biggs vociferously proclaimed his ardent attachment to the cause of secession, whereupon he was promptly arrested, placed in charge of half a dozen cavalrymen, and made to foot it, with an iron chain and ball attached to his ankle, all the way from Los Angeles to drum barracks at Wilmington. Not in the least discouraged by his uncertain position, however, Pete threw his hat up into the air as he passed some acquaintances on the road, and gave three hearty cheers for Jeff Davis, thus bringing about the completion of his difficulty. For my part, I have good reason to remember the drought and crisis of 1864, not alone because times were miserably hard and prosperity seemed to have disappeared forever, or that the important revenue from Uncle Sam, although it relieved the situation, was never sufficient to go around, but also because of an unfortunate investment. 
I bought and shipped many thousands of hides which owners had taken from the carcasses of their starved cattle, forwarding them to San Francisco by schooner or steamer, and thence to New York by sailing vessel. A large number had commenced to putrefy before they were removed, which fact escaped my attention, and on their arrival in the east the decomposing skins had to be taken out to sea again and thrown overboard, so that the net results of this venture were disastrous. However, we all met the difficulties of the situation as philosophically as we could. There were no railroads in California until the late sixties, and consequently there was no regular method of concentration nor any systematic marketing of products, and this had a very bad economic effect on the whole state. Prices were extremely high during her early history, and especially so in 1864. Barley sold at three and a half cents per pound, potatoes went up to twelve and a half cents, and flour reached fifteen dollars per barrel at wholesale. Much flour in wooden barrels was then brought from New York by sailing vessels, and my brother imported a lot during a period of inflation, some of which he sold at thirteen dollars. Isaac Friedlander, a San Francisco pioneer, who was not alone the tallest man in that city, but was as well a giant operator in grain and its products, practically monopolized the wheat and flour business of the town, and when he heard of this interference, he purchased all the remainder of my brother's flour at thirteen dollars a barrel, and so secured control of the situation. Just before this transaction, I happened to be in San Francisco, and noticing the advertisement of an approaching flour auction, I attended the sale. This particular lot was packed in sacks, which had been eaten into by rats and mice, and had, in consequence, to be resacked, sweepings and all. I bought one hundred barrels and shipped the flour to Los Angeles, and B. de Bourdieu, the corpulent little French baker, considered himself fortunate in obtaining it at fifteen dollars per barrel. Speaking of foodstuffs, I may note that red beans then commanded a price of twelve and a half cents per pound, until a sailing vessel from Chile unexpectedly landed a cargo in San Francisco and sent the price dropping to a cent and a quarter, when commission men, among them myself, suffered heavy losses. In 1864, F. Bachman and Company sold out. Their retirement was ascribed in a measure to the series of bad years, but the influence of their wives was a powerful factor in inducing them to withdraw. The firm had been compelled to accept large parcels of real estate in payment of accounts, and now, while preparing to leave, Bachman and Company sacrificed their fine holdings at prices considered ridiculous even then. The only one of these sales that I remember was that of a lot with a frontage of 120 feet on Fort Street and a one-story adobe house, which they disposed of for $400. I have told of Don Juan Forster's possessions, the Santa Margarita Rancho, where he lived until his death, and also the Los Flores. These he obtained in 1864, when land was worth but the merest song, buying the same from Pio Pico, his brother-in-law. The two ranches included over a 140,000 acres, and pastured some 25,000 cattle, 3,000 horses, and six or 7,000 sheep. Yet the transaction, on account of the season, was a fiscal operation of but minor importance. The hard times strikingly conduced to criminality, and since there were then probably not more than three or four policemen in Los Angeles, some of the desperados, here in large numbers and not confined to any particular nationality or color, took advantage of the conditions, even making several peculiar nocturnal assaults upon the guardians of the peace. The methods occasionally adopted satisfied the community that Mexican banditos were at work, Two of these worthies on horseback, while approaching a policeman, would suddenly dash in opposite directions, bringing a reata, in the use of which they were almost always proficient, taught to the level of their saddles, and striking the policeman with a hide or hair rope, they would throw him to the ground with such force as to disable him. Then the ingenious robbers would carry out their well-planned depredations in the neighborhood and disappear with their booty. J. Ross Brown, one of the active 49ers in San Francisco, and author of Crusoe's Island and various other volumes dealing with early life in California and along the coast, was on and off a visitor to Los Angeles, first passing through here in 1859 en route to the Washoe gold fields and stopping again in 1864. Politics enlivened the situation somewhat in the fall of this year of depression. In September, the troops were withdrawn from Catalina Island, and the following month most of the guard was brought in from Fort Tejon, and this, creating possibly a feeling of security, paved the way for still larger union meetings in October and November. Toward the end of November, Francisco P. Ramirez, formerly editor of El Clamor Publico, 
was made postmaster, succeeding William G. Still, upon whose life an attempt had been made while he was in office. As an illustration of how a fortunate plunger acquired property now worth millions, through the disinclination on the part of most people here to add to their taxes in this time of drought, I may mention two pieces of land included in the early Ord survey, 120 by 165 feet in size, one at the southwest corner of Spring and Fourth Streets, the other at the southeast corner of Fort and Fourth, which were sold on December 12, 1864, for $2.50 delinquent taxes. The tax on each lot was but $1.26, yet only one purchaser appeared. About that very time, there was another and noteworthy movement in favor of the establishment of a railroad between Los Angeles and San Pedro. In December, committees from outside towns met here with our citizens to debate the subject, but by the end of several days' conference, no real progress had been made. The year 1865 gave scant promise, at least in its opening, of better times to come. To be sure, northern arms were more and more victorious, and with the approach of Lincoln's second inauguration, the conviction grew that under the leadership of such a man, national prosperity might return. Little did we dream that the most dramatic of all tragedies in our history was soon to be enacted. In Southern California, the effects of the long drought continued, and the certainty that the cattle industry, once so vast and flourishing, was now but a memory, discouraged a people to whom the vision of a far more profitable use of the land had not yet been revealed. For several years, my family, including three children, had been shifting from pillar to post owing to the lack of residences such as are now built to sell or lease, and I could not postpone any longer the necessity of obtaining larger quarters. We had occupied, at various times, a little shanty on Franklin Street, owned by a carpenter named Wilson, a small one-story brick on Main Street near First, owned by Henny the brewer, and once we lived with the Kramers in a one-story house none too large on Fort Street. Again we dwelt on Fort Street in a little brick house that stood on the site of the present Chamber of Commerce building, next door to Governor Downey's, before he moved to Main Street. The nearest approach to convenience was afforded by our occupancy of Henry Dalton's two-story brick on Main Street near 2nd. One day a friend told me that Jim Easton had an adobe on Main Street near 3rd which he wished to sell, and on inquiry I bought the place, paying him a thousand dollars for fifty-four feet, the entire frontage being occupied by the house. Main Street beyond 1st was practically in the same condition as at the time of my arrival, no streets running east having been opened south of 1st. After moving in, we were inconvenienced because there was no driveway, and everything needed for housekeeping had to be carried, in consequence, through the front door of the dwelling. I therefore interviewed my friend and neighbor, Ignacio Garcia, who owned a hundred feet adjoining me, and asked him if he would sell or rent me twenty feet of his property, whereupon he permitted me the free use of twenty feet, thus supplying me with access to the rear of my house. A few months later, Alfred B. Chapman, Garcia's legal adviser, who, by the way, is still alive, footnote, died January 22, 1915, and footnote, brought me a deed to the twenty feet of land, the only expense being a fee of twenty-five dollars to Chapman for making out the document, and later Garcia sold his remaining eighty feet to Tom Mott for five dollars a foot. This lot is still in my possession. In due time I put up a large old-fashioned wooden barn with a roomy hayloft, stalls for a couple of horses or mules, and space for a large flat truck, the first of the kind for years in Los Angeles. John Simmons had his room in the barn and was one of my first porters. I had no regular driver for the truck, but John usually served in that capacity. Incidentally to this story of my selecting a street on which to live, I may say that during the 60s, Main and San Pedro streets were among the chief residential sections, and Spring Street was only beginning to be popular for homes. The fact that some people living on the west side of Main Street built their stables in backyards connecting with Spring Street retarded the latter's growth. Here I may well repeat the story of the naming of Spring Street, particularly as it exemplifies the influence that romance sometimes has upon affairs usually prosaic. Ord, the surveyor, was then more than prepossessed in favor of the delightful Senorita Trinidad de la Guerra, for whose hand he was, in fact, a suitor, and to whom he always referred to as Mi Primavera, my springtime. And when asked to name the new thoroughfare, he gallantly replied, Primavera, of course, Primavera. On February 3rd, a wind storm, the like of which the proverbial oldest inhabitant could scarcely recall, struck Los Angeles amidships, unroofing many houses and blowing down orchards. 
Wolfskill lost heavily, and Banning and Company's large barn at the northeast corner of Fort and Second Streets, near the old schoolhouse, was demolished, scarcely a post remaining upright. A curious sight, soon after the storm began to blow, was that of many citizens weighing down and lashing fast their roofs, just as they do in Sweden, Norway, and Switzerland, to keep them from being carried to unexpected, not to say inconvenient, locations. In early days, steamers plying up and down the Pacific coast, as I have pointed out, were so poor in every respect that it was necessary to make frequent changes in their names, to induce passengers to travel on them at all. As far back as 1860, one frequently heard the expression, the old tubs, and in 1865, even the best-known boat on the southern run was publicly discussed as the rotten old senator, the old hulk, and the floating coffin. At this time, there was a strong feeling against the steam navigation company for its arbitrary treatment of the public, its steamers sometimes leaving a whole day before the date on which they were advertised to depart, and this criticism and dissatisfaction finally resulted in the putting on of the opposition steamer Pacific, which for the time became popular. In 1865, Judge Benjamin S. Eaton tried another agricultural experiment which many persons of more experience at first predicted would be a failure. He had moved into the cottage at Fair Oaks, built by the estimable lady of General Albert Sidney Johnston, and had planted five thousand or more grapevines in the good though dry soil. But the lack of surface water caused vineyardists to shake their heads incredulously. The vines prospered so well that in the following year Eaton planted five or six times as many more. He came to the conclusion, however, that he must have water, and so arranged to bring some from what is now known as Eaton's Canyon. I remember that, after his vines began to bear, the greatest worry of the judge was not the matter of irrigation, but the wild beasts that preyed upon the clustering fruit. The visitor to Pasadena and Altadena today can hardly realize that in those very localities both coyotes and bears were rampant, and that many a night the irate judge was roused by the barking dogs as they drove the intruders out of the vineyard. Tomlinson and Company, always energetic competitors in the business of transportation in Southern California, began running about the 1st of April a new stage line between Los Angeles and San Bernardino, making three trips a week. On the 15th of April, my family physician, Dr. John S. Griffin, paid a professional visit to my house on Main Street, which might have ended disastrously for him. While we were seated together by an open window in the dining room, a man named Kane ran by on the street, shouting out the momentous news that Abraham Lincoln had been shot. Griffin, who was a staunch Southerner, was on his feet instantly, cheering for Jeff Davis. He gave evidence, indeed, of great mental excitement, and soon seized his hat and rushed for the door, hurrahing for the Confederacy. In a flash I realized that Griffin would be in awful jeopardy if he reached the street in that unbalanced condition, and by main force I held him back, convincing him at last of his folly. In the later years the genial doctor frankly admitted that I had undoubtedly saved him from certain death. This incident brings to mind another, associated with Henry Bear, whose father Abraham, a native of Bavaria, and one of the earliest tailors here, had arrived from New Orleans in 1854. When Lincoln's assassination was first known, Henry ran out of the house singing Dixie and shouting for the South, but his father, overtaking him, brought him back and gave him a sound whipping, an act nearly breaking up the Bear family, inasmuch as Mrs. Bear was a pronounced secessionist. The news of Lincoln's assassination made a profound impression in Los Angeles, though it cannot be denied that some Southern sympathizers, on first impulse, thought that it would be advantageous to the Confederate cause. There was, therefore, for the moment, some ill-advised exultation, but this was promptly suppressed, either by the military or by the firm stand of the more level-headed members of the community. Soon even radically inclined citizens, in an effort to hold up the fair name of the town, fell into line, and steps were taken fittingly to mourn the nation's loss. On the 17th of April, the Common Council passed appropriate resolutions, and Governor Lowe, having telegraphed that Lincoln's funeral would be held in Washington on the 19th at 12 o'clock noon, the Union League of Los Angeles took the initiative and invited the various societies of the city to join in a funeral procession. On April 19th, all the stores were closed, business was suspended, and soldiers as well as civilians assembled in front of Arcadia Block. There were present United States officers, mounted cavalry under command of Captain Ledyard, the mayor and common council, various lodges, the Hebrew congregation Benai Brith, the Tatunia, the French Benevolent and the Junta Patriotica Societies, and numerous citizens. Under the marshalship of S. F. Lamson, the procession moved slowly over what today would be regarded as an insignificantly short route, 
west on arcadia street to maine down Main to spring as far as first east on first to maine and up main street proceeding back to the city hall by way of spring at which point the parade disbanded later on the same day there were memorial services in the upper story of the old temple courthouse where reverend elias birdsell the episcopal clergyman delivered a splendid oration and panegyric and at the same time the members of the hebrew congregation met at the house of rabbi a w edelman prayers for the martyred president were uttered and supplication was made for the recovery of secretary of state seward the resolutions presented on this occasion concluded as follows resolved that with feelings of the deepest sorrow we deplore the loss our country has sustained in the untimely end of our late president but as it has pleased the almighty to deprive this country of its chief and great friend we bow with submission to the all-wise will i may add that soon after the assassination of the president the federal authorities sent an order to los angeles to arrest anyone found rejoicing in the foul deed and that several persons soon in the toils were severely dealt with in san francisco too when the startling news was flashed over the wires unionist mobs demolished the plants of the democratic press the newsletter and a couple of other journals very abusive toward the martyred emancipator the editors and publishers themselves escaping with their lives only by flight and concealment notwithstanding the strong secessionist sentiment in los angeles during much of the civil war period the city election resulted in a unionist victory jose mascarel was elected mayor william c warren marshal j f burns treasurer j h lander attorney and j w beebe assessor the triumph of the federal government doubtless at once began to steady and improve in fares throughout the country but it was some time before any noticeable progress was felt here particularly unfortunate were those who had gone east or south for actual service and who were obliged to make their way finally back to the coast among such volunteers was captain cameron e tom who on landing at san pedro was glad to have j m griffith advance him money enough to reach los angeles and begin life again outdoor restaurant gardens were popular in the sixties on april twenty third the tivioli garden was reopened by henry Soames, and thither on holidays and sundays many pleasure lovers gravitated sometime in the spring and during the incumbency of rev elias birdsell as rector the right rev william ingram kipp who had come to the pacific coast in eighteen fifty three made his first visit to the episcopal church in los angeles as bishop of california although really elevated to that high office seven years before bishop kipp was one of the young clergy who pleaded with the unresponsive culprits strung up by the san francisco vigilance committee of eighteen fifty six and later he was known as an author the rev birdsall by the way was rector of st paul's school on olive street between fifth and sixth as late as eighteen eighty seven john g downey subdivided the extensive santa gertrudis rancho on the san gabriel river in the spring and the first deed was made out to j h burke a son-in-law of captain jesse hunter burke a man of splendid physique was a blacksmith whose main street shop was next to the site of the present van nuys hotel downey and he exchanged properties the ex-governor building a handsome brick residence on burke's lot and burke removing his blacksmith business to downey's new town where by remaining until the property had appreciated he became well to do i have alluded to the dominguez rancho known as the san pedro but i have not said that in eighteen sixty five some four thousand acres of this property were sold to temple and gibson at thirty five cents an acre and on that a portion of this land g d compton founded the town named after him and first called comptonville it was really a methodist church enterprise planned from the beginning as a pledge to teetotalism and is of particular interest because it is one of the oldest towns in los angeles county and certainly the first dry community compton paid temple and gibson five dollars an acre toward the end of the war that is in may major general erwin mcdowell the unfortunate commander of the army of the potomac who had been nearly a year in charge of the department of the pacific made los angeles a long announced visit coming on the government steamer saginaw the distinguished officer his family and suite were speedily whirled to the bella union the competing drivers shouting and cursing themselves hoarse in their efforts to get the general or the general's wife in different stages there first as was customary in those simpler days most of the townsfolk whose politics would permit called upon the guest and editor conway and other unionists were long closeted with him after thirty-six hours or more during which the general inspected the local government headquarters and the ladies were driven to and entertained at various homes the party accompanied by collector james and attorney general mccullough 
boarded the cutter and made off for the north anticipating this visit of general mcdowell due preparations were made to receive him it happened however as i have indicated that jose mascarel was then mayor and since he had never been able to express himself freely in english though speaking spanish as well as french it was feared that embarrassment must follow the meeting of the civil and military personages luckily however like many scions of early well-to-do american families mcdowell had been educated in france and the two chiefs were soon having a free and easy talk in mascarel's native tongue an effort on may second to better establish st vincent's college as the one institution of higher learning here was but natural at the time in the middle of the sixties quite as many children attended private academies in los angeles as were in the public schools while three-fifths of all children attended no school at all at the beginning of the twentieth century two-thirds of all the children in the county attended public schools end of chapter twenty three Chapter 24 of Sixty Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 24 H. Newmark and Company, Carlisle King Duel, 1865 to 1866. From 1862, I continued for three years, as I have told, in the commission business and notwithstanding the bad seasons i was thus pursuing a sufficiently easy and pleasant existence when a remark which after the lapse of time i see may have been carelessly dropped inspired me with the determination to enter again upon a more strenuous and confining life on friday june eighteenth eighteen sixty five i was seated in my little office when a los angeles merchant named david solomon whose store was in the arcadia block called upon me and with much feeling related that while returning by steamer from the north prudent beaudry had made the senseless boast that he would drive every jew in los angeles out of business beaudry then a man of large means conducted in his one-story adobe building on the northeast corner of aliso and los angeles streets the largest general merchandise establishment this side of san francisco i listened to solomon's recital without giving expression to my immediately formed resolve but no sooner had he left than I closed my office and started for Wilmington. During the twelve years that I had been in California, the forwarding business between Los Angeles and the coast had seen many changes. Tomlinson and Company, who had bought out A. W. Timms, controlled the largest tonnage in town, including that of Beaudry, Jones, Childs, and others, while Banning and Company, although actively engaged in the transportation to Yuma of freight and supplies for the United States government, were handicapped for lack of business into Los Angeles. I thought, therefore, that Phineas Banning would eagerly seize an opportunity to pay his score to the numerous local merchants who had treated him with so little consideration. Besides, a very close intimacy existed between him and myself, which may best be illustrated by the fact that for years past, when short of cash, Banning used to come to my old sheet-iron safe and help himself according to his requirements. Arriving in Wilmington, I found Banning loading a lot of teams with lumber. I related the substance of Solomon's remarks and proposed a secret partnership, with the understanding that, providing he would release me from the then existing charge of seven dollars and a half per ton for hauling freight from Wilmington to Los Angeles, I should supply the necessary capital, purchase a stock of goods, conduct the business without cost to him, and then divide the profits if any should accrue. Banning said, I must first consult Don David meaning Alexander, his partner, promising at the same time to report the result within a few days. While I was at dinner, therefore, on the following Sunday, Patrick Downey, Banning's Los Angeles agent, called on me and stated that the chief was in his office in the Downey block, on the site of Temple's old adobe, and would be glad to see me. Without further parleying, Banning accepted my proposition, and on the following morning, or June 21st, I rented the last vacant store in Stearns's Arcadia Block on Los Angeles Street, which stands today, by the way, much as it was erected in 1858. It adjoined John Jones's and was nearly opposite the establishment of P. Beaudry. There I put up the sign of H. Newmark, soon to be changed to H. Newmark and Company, and it is a source of no little gratification to me that from this small beginning has developed the wholesale grocery firm of M. A. Newmark and Company. Footnote. Fifty years after this unpretentious venture in Arcadia Block, 
that is, in the summer of 1915, the half-century of M. A. Newmark and Company and their predecessors was celebrated with a picnic in the woodlands belonging to Universal City, the holiday and its pleasures having been provided by the firm as a compliment to its employees. On that occasion, a loving cup was presented by the employees to M. A. Newmark, who responded feelingly to the speech by M. H. Newmark. Another but somewhat differently inscribed cup was tendered Harris Newmark in an address by Herman Flatow, bringing from the venerable recipient a hearty reply, full of genial reminiscence and natural emotion, in which he happily likened his commercial enterprise, once the small store in Los Angeles Street, to a snowball rolling down the mountainside, gathering in momentum and size, and fortunately preserving its original whiteness. Undoubtedly, this fifty-year jubilee will take its place among the pleasantest experiences of a long and varied career. The Editors End footnote At that time, Stearns's property was all in the hands of the sheriff, Tomas Sanchez, who had also been appointed receiver, and like all other tenants, I rented my storeroom from Deputy A. J. King. Rents and other incomes were paid to the receiver, and out of them a regular monthly allowance of fifty dollars was made to Stearns for his private expenses. The stock on Stearns's ranches, by the way, was then in charge of Pierre Domecq, a well-known and prosperous man, who was here perhaps a decade before I came. My only assistant was my wide-awake nephew, M. A. Newmark, then fifteen years of age, who had arrived in Los Angeles early in 1865. At my request, Banning and Company released their bookkeeper, Frank Le Couvier, and I engaged him. He was a thoroughly reliable man, and had, besides, a technical knowledge of wagon materials, in which, as a sideline, I expected to specialize. While all of these arrangements were being completed, the local business world queried and buzzed as to my intentions. Having rented quarters, I immediately telegraphed my brother, J. P. Newmark, to buy and ship a quantity of flour, sugar, potatoes, salt, and other heavy staples, and these I sold upon arrival, at cost, and steamer freight plus seven dollars and a half per ton. Since the departure of my brother from Los Angeles for permanent residence in San Francisco, where he entered into partnership with Isaac Leitner, forming J. P. Newmark and Company, he had been engaged in the commission business, and this afforded me facilities I might otherwise not have had, insomuch as also, as all of my neighbors were obliged to pay this toll for hauling, while I was not, they were forced to do business at cost. About the first of July I went to San Francisco and laid in a complete stock paralleling, with the exception of clothing and dry goods, the lines handled by Bodring. Banning, who was then building prairie schooners, for which he had ordered some three hundred and fifty tons of iron and other wagon materials, joined me in chartering the brig Tanner, on which I loaded an equal tonnage of general merchandise, wagon parts, and blacksmith coal. The very important trade with Salt Lake City, elsewhere described, helped us greatly, for we at once negotiated with the Mormon leaders, and giving them credit when they were short of funds, it was not long before we were brought into constant communication with Brigham Young, and through his influence monopolized the Salt Lake business. Thinking over these days of our dealings with the Latter-day Saints, I recall a very amusing experience with an apostle named Crosby, who once brought down a number of teams and wagons to load with supplies. During his visit to town, I invited him and several of his friends to dinner, and in answer to the commonplace inquiry as to his preference for some particular part of a dish, Crosby made the logical Mormonite reply that quantity was what appealed to him most, a flash of wit much appreciated by all of the guests. During this same visit, Crosby tried hard to convert me to Mormonism, but after several ineffectual interviews, he abandoned me as a hopeless case. At another time, while reflecting on my first years as a wholesale grocer, I was led to examine a day book of 1867, and to draw a comparison between the prices then, current, and now, when the high cost of living is so much discussed. Raw sugar sold at 14 cents, starch at 16, crushed sugar at 17, ordinary tea at sixty, coal oil at sixty-five cents a gallon, axle grease at seventy-five cents per tin, bluing at one dollar a pound, and wrapping paper at one dollar and a half per ream. Spices, not yet sold in cans, cost three dollars for a dozen bottles. Yeast powders, now superseded by baking powder, commanded the same price per dozen. Twenty-five pounds of shot in a bag cost three dollars and a half while in October of that year, blacksmith coal shipped in casks holding 1,592 pounds each 
sold at the rate of fifty dollars a ton the steamers or a flamme california pacific and sierra nevada commenced to run in eighteen sixty six and continued until about the middle of the seventies the pacific was later sunk in the straits of san juan de fuca and the sierra nevada was lost on the rocks off port harford the los angeles the ventura and the constantine were steamers of a somewhat later date seldom going farther south than san pedro and continuing to run until they were lost to resume the suggestive story of i w hellman who remained in business with his cousin until he was able in eighteen sixty five to buy out adolph portugal and embark for himself at the corner of main and commercial streets during his association with large landowners and men of affairs who esteemed him for his practicality he was fortunate in securing their confidence and patronage and being asked so often to operate for them in financial matters he laid the foundation for his subsequent career as a banker in which he has attained such success the Pioneer Oil Company had been organized about the 1st of February, with Phineas Banning, President, P. Downey, Secretary, Charles Ducommon, Treasurer, and Winfield S. Hancock, Dr. John S. Griffin, Dr. J. B. Winston, M. Keller, B. D. Wilson, J. G. Downey, and Volney E. Howard among the trustees, and the company soon acquired title to all Brea, petroleum or rock oil in San Pasquale Rancho. In the early summer, Sackett and Morgan, on Main Street, near the post office, exhibited some local kerosene or coal oil, and experimenters were gathering the oil that floated on Pico Spring and refining it, without distillation, at a cost of ten cents a gallon. Coming just when Mayor Strobel announced progress in boring at La Cañada de Brea, these ventures increased here the excitement about oil, and soon after wells were sunk in the Camulos Rancho. On Wednesday afternoon, July 5th, at 4 o'clock, occurred one of the pleasant social occasions of the mid-sixties, the wedding of Solomon Lazard and Miss Caroline, third daughter of Joseph Newmark. The bride's father performed the ceremony at M. Kramer's residence on Main Street, near my own adobe, and the site on which later C. E. Tom built his charming residence, with its rural attractions, diagonally across from the pleasant grounds of Colonel J. G. Howard. The same evening, at half-past eight, a ball and dinner at the Bella Union celebrated the event. While these festivities were taking place, a quarrel, ending in a tragedy, began in the hotel office below. Robert Carlyle, who had married Francisca, daughter of Colonel Isaac Williams, and was the owner of some 46,000 acres comprising the Chino Ranch, fell into an altercation with A.J. King, then under-sheriff, over the outcome of a murder trial but before any further damage was done, friends separated them. About noon on the following day, however, when people were getting ready to leave for the steamer and everything was life and bustle about the hotel, Frank and Houston King, the under-sheriff's brothers, passing by the barroom of the Bella Union and seeing Carlyle inside, entered, drew their six shooters, and began firing at him. Carlyle also drew a revolver and shot Frank King, who died almost instantly. Houston King kept up the fight, and Carlyle, riddled with bullets, dropped to the sidewalk. There, King, not yet seriously injured, struck his opponent on the head, the force of the blow breaking his weapon. But Carlyle, a man of iron, put forth his little remaining strength, staggered to the wall, raised his pistol with both hands, took deliberate aim, and fired. It was his last but effective shot, for it penetrated King's body. Carlyle was carried into the hotel and placed on a billiard table and there, about three o'clock, he expired. At the first exchange of shots, the people nearby, panic-stricken, fled, and only a merciful providence prevented the sacrifice of other lives. J. H. Lander was accidentally wounded in the thigh, some eight or ten bystanders had their clothes pierced by stray bullets, and one of the stage horses dropped where he stood before the hotel door. When the first shot was fired, I was on the corner of Commercial Street, only a short distance away, and reached the scene in time to see Frank King expire, and witness Carlyle writhing in agony, a death more striking, considering the murder of Carlyle's brother-in-law, John Raines. Carlyle was buried from the Belly Union at four o'clock the next day. King's funeral took place from A. J. King's residence two days later, at eight o'clock in the morning. Houston King having recovered, he was tried for Carlyle's murder, but was acquitted, the trial contributing to make the affair one of the most mournful of all tragic events in the early history of Los Angeles, and rendering it impossible to express the horror of the public. One feature only of the terrible contest afforded a certain satisfaction, 
and that was the splendid exhibition of those qualities in some respects heroic so common among the old californians of that time july was clouded with a particularly gruesome murder george williams and cyrus kimball of san diego while removing with their families to los angeles had spent the night near the santa ana river and while some distance from camp at sunrise next morning were overtaken by seven armed desperadoes under the leadership of one jack o'brien and without word of explanation were shot dead the women hearing the commotion ran toward the spot only to be commanded by the robbers to deliver all money and valuables in their possession over three thousand dollars the entire savings of their husbands was secured after which the murderers made their escape posses scoured the surrounding country but the cutthroats were never apprehended stimulated perhaps by the king carlisle tragedy the common council in july prohibited everybody except officers and travelers from carrying a pistol dirk slingshot or sword but the measure lacked public support and little or no attention was paid to the law some idea of the modest proportion of business affairs in the early sixties may be gathered from the fact that when the los angeles post office on august tenth was made a money deposit office it was obligatory that all cash in excess of five hundred dollars should be dispatched by steamer to san francisco in eighteen sixty five w h perry having been given a franchise to light the city with gas organized the los angeles city gas company five years later selling out his holdings at a large profit a promise was made to furnish free gas for lamps at the principal crossings on main street and for lights in the mayor's office and the consumer's price at first agreed upon was ten dollars a thousand cubic feet the history of west lake park is full of interest about eighteen sixty five the city began to sell part of its public land in lots of thirty five acres employing e w noyes as auctioneer much of it went at five and ten dollars an acre but when the district now occupied by the park and lake was reached the auctioneer called in vain for bids at even a dollar an acre nobody wanted the alkali hillocks then the auctioneer offered the area at twenty-five cents an acre but still received no bids and the sale was discontinued in the late eighties a number of citizens who had bought land in the vicinity came to mayor workman and promised to pay one half of the cost of making a lake and laying out pleasure grounds on the unsightly place and as the mayor favored the plan it was executed and this was the first step in the formation of westlake park on september second dr j j dyer a dentist from san francisco having opened an office in the bella union hotel announced that he would visit the home of patrons and there extract or repair the sufferer's teeth the complicated equipment of a modern dentist would hardly permit of such peripatetic service today other representatives of this profession and also certain opticians still travel to many of the small inland towns in california once or twice a year stopping in each for a week or two at a time i have spoken of the use in eighteen fifty three of river water for drinking and the part played by the private water carrier this system was still largely used until the fall when david w alexander leased all the public water works for four years together with the privilege of renewing the lease another four or six years alexander was to pay one thousand dollars rental a year agreeing also to surrender the plant to the city at the termination of his contract on august seventh alexander assigned his lease to don louis saint savin and about the middle of october saint savin made a new contract damien marchesault associated himself with don louis and together they laid pipes from the street now known as macy throughout the business part of the city and as far south as first street these water pipes were constructed of pine logs from the mountains of san bernardino bored and made to join closely at the ends but they were continually bursting causing springs of water that made their way to the surface of the streets conway and waite sold the news then a tri-weekly supposed to appear three times a week yet frequently issued but twice to a j king and company on november eleventh and king becoming the editor made of the newspaper a semi-weekly to complete what i was saying about the schlesingers in 1865, Moritz returned to Germany. Jacob had arrived in Los Angeles in 1860, but disappearing four years later, his whereabouts was a mystery until, one fine day, his brother received a letter from him dated, Gunboat Pocahontas. Jake had entered the service of Uncle Sam. The Pocahontas was engaged in blockade work under the command of Admiral Farragut, and Jake and the Admiral were paying special attention to Sabine Pass, then fortified by the Confederacy. On November 27th, Andrew J. Glassell and Colonel James G. Howard arrived together in Los Angeles. The former had been admitted to the California bar some ten or twelve years before, but in the early sixties he temporarily abandoned his profession and engaged in ranching near Santa Cruz. 
after the war glassell drifted back to the practice of law and having soon cast his lot with los angeles formed a partnership with alfred b chapman two or three years later colonel george h smith a confederate army officer who in the early seventies lived on fort street was taken into the firm and for years glassell chapman and smith were among the leading attorneys at the los angeles bar glassell died on january twenty eighth nineteen o one to add to the excitement of the middle sixties a picturesque street encounter took place terminating almost fatally colonel the redoubtable e j c kewen and a good-natured german named fred lemberg son-in-law to the old miller boers having come to blow on los angeles street near mellis's row lemberg knocked kewen down whereupon friends interfered and peace was apparently restored Kewen, a southerner, dwelt upon the fancied indignity to which he had been subjected, and went from store to store until he finally borrowed a pistol, after which, in front of John Jones's, he lay in wait. When Lemberg, who, because of his nervous energy, was known as the Flying Dutchman, again appeared, rushing across the street in the direction of Mellis's row, the equally excited colonel opened fire, drawing from his adversary a retaliatory round of shots. I was standing nearly opposite the scene and saw the Flying Dutchman and Kewen each dodging around a pillar in the front of the row, until finally Lemberg, with a bullet in his abdomen, ran out into Los Angeles Street and fell to the ground, his legs convulsively assuming a perpendicular position and then dropping back. After recovering from what was thought to be a fatal wound, Lemberg left Los Angeles for Arizona or Mexico, but before he reached his destination he was murdered by Indians. I have told of the trade between Los Angeles and Salt Lake City which started up briskly in 1855 and grew in importance until the completion of the transcontinental railroad put an end to it indeed in 1865 and 1866 los angeles enterprise pushed forward until merchandise was teamed as far as bannock idaho 450 miles beyond salt lake and helena montana 1400 miles away this indicates to what an extent the building of railroads ultimately affected the early los angeles merchants the spanish drama was the event of december seventeenth when senor don guiardo el de castillo and senora amelia estrella del castillo played la trenza de sus cabellos to an enthusiastic audience in eighteen sixty five or eighteen sixty six william t glassell a younger brother of andrew glassell came to los angeles on a visit and being attracted by the southwest country he remained to assist glassell and chapman in founding orange formerly known as richland no doubt pastoral california looked good to young glassell for he had but just passed eighteen weary months in a northern military prison having thought out a plan for blowing up the united states ironclads off charleston harbor lieutenant glassell supervised the construction of a cigar-shaped craft known as a david which carried a torpedo attached to the end of a fifteen-foot pole and on october fifth eighteen sixty three young glassell and three other volunteers steamed out in the darkness against the formidable new ironsides the torpedo was exploded doing no greater damage than to send up a column of water which fell onto the ship and also to hurl the young officers into the bay glassell died here at an early age john t best the assessor was another pioneer who had an adventurous life prior to and for a long time after coming to california having run away to sea from his main home about the middle fifties best soon found himself among pirates but escaping their clutches he came under the domination of a captain whose cruelty off desolate cape horn was hardly preferable to death reaching california about eighteen fifty eight best fled from another captain's brutality and making his way into the northern forests was taken in and protected by kind-hearted woodmen secluded within palisades successive indian outbreaks constantly threatened him and his comrades and for years he was compelled to defend himself against the savages at last safe and sound he settled within the pale of civilization at the outbreak of the civil war enlisting as a union officer in the first battalion of california soldiers since then best has resided mostly in los angeles the year eighteen sixty six is memorable as the concluding period of the great war although lee had surrendered in the preceding april more than fifteen months elapsed before the washington authorities officially proclaimed the end of the titanic struggle which left one half of the nation prostrate and the other half burdened with new and untold responsibilities by the opening of the year however one of the miracles of modern history the quiet and speedy return of the soldier to the vocations of peace began and soon some of those who had left for the front when the war broke out were to be seen again in our southland starting life anew with them too came a few pioneers from the east harbingers of an army soon to settle our valleys and seasides 
All in all, the year was the beginning of a brighter era. Here it may not be amiss to take up the tale of the mimic war in which Phineas Banning and I engaged, in the little commercial world of Los Angeles, and to tell to what an extent the fortunes of my competitors were influenced, and how the absorption of the transportation charge from the seaboard caused their downfall. O. W. Childs, in less than three months, found the competition too severe, and surrendered lock, stock, and barrel. P. Beaudry, whose vainglorious boast had stirred up this rumpus, sold out to me on January 1, 1866, just a few months after his big talk. John Jones was the last to yield. In January 1866, I bought out Banning, who was soon to take his seat in the legislature for the advancing of his San Pedro Railroad project, and agreed to pay him in the future seven dollars and a half per ton for hauling my goods from Wilmington to Los Angeles, which was mutually satisfactory, and when we came to balance up, it was found that Banning had received, for his part in the enterprise, an amount equal to all that would otherwise have been charged for transportation, and a tidy sum besides. Sam, brother of Caspar Cohn, who had been in Carson City, Nevada, came to Los Angeles and joined me. We grew rapidly, and in a short time became of some local importance. When Caspar sold out at Red Bluff, in January 1866, we tendered him a partnership. We were now three very busy associates, besides M. A. Newmark, who clerked for us. Several references have been made to the trade between Los Angeles and Arizona, due in part to the needs of the Army there. I remember that early in February, not less than 27 government wagons were drawn up in front of H. Newmark and Company's store, to be loaded with 70 to 75 tons of groceries and provisions for troops in the territory. Notwithstanding the handicaps in this wagon train traffic, there was still much objection to railroads, especially to the plan for a line between Los Angeles and San Pedro, some of the strongest opposition coming from El Monte, where in February ranchers circulated a petition disapproving railroad bills introduced by Banning into the legislature. A common argument was that the railroad would do away with horses and the demand for barley, and one wealthy citizen who succeeded in inducing many to follow his lead vehemently assisted that two trains a month for many years would be all that could be expected. By 1874, however, not less than 50 to 60 freight cars were arriving daily in Los Angeles from Wilmington. Once more, in 1866, the post office was moved, this time to a building opposite the Bella Union Hotel. There it remained until perhaps 1868, when it was transferred to the northwest corner of Main and Market Streets. In the spring of 1866, the Los Angeles Board of Education was petitioned to establish a school where Spanish as well as English should be taught, probably the first step toward the introduction into public courses here of the now much-studied Castellano. In noting the third schoolhouse at the corner of San Pedro and Washington Streets, I should not forget to say that Judge Dryden bought the lot for the city at a cost of one hundred dollars. When the fourth school was erected at the corner of Charity and Eighth Streets, it was built on property secured for three hundred and fifty dollars by M. Kramer, who served on the school board for nine years, from 1866, with Henry D. Barrows and William Workman. There, a few years ago, a brick building replaced the original wooden structure. Besides Miss Eliza Madigan, teachers of this period or later were the Misses Hattie and Frankie Scott, daughters of Judge Scott, the Misses Maggie Hamilton, Eula P. Bixby, Emma L. Hawks, Clara M. Jones, H. K. Sachs, and C. H. Kimball. A sister of Governor Downey, soon to become Mrs. Peter Martin, was also a public school teacher. Piped gas as well as water had been quite generally brought into private use shortly after their introduction, all pipes running along the surface of walls and ceilings, in neither a very judicious nor ornamental arrangement. The first gas figures consisted of the old-fashioned, unornamented drops from the ceiling, connected at right angles to the cross-pipe, with its two plain burners, one at either end, forming an inverted T, and years passed before artistic bronzes and globes, such as were displayed in profusion at the Centennial Exposition, were seen to any extent here. In September, Leon Loeb arrived in Los Angeles and entered the employ of S. Lazard and Company, later becoming a partner. When Eugene Meyer left for San Francisco on the 1st of January, 1884, resigning his position as French consular agent, Loeb succeeded him, both in that capacity and as head of the firm. After 15 years' service, the French government conferred upon Mr. Loeb the decoration of an officer of the academy. As past master of the Odd Fellows, he became in time one of the oldest members of Lodge Number no. 35. On March 23, 1879, Loeb married my eldest daughter Estelle, and on July 22, 1911, he died. Joseph P. and Edwin J. Loeb, the attorneys and partners of Irving M. Walker, 
son-in-law of Tomas Lorenzo Duque, footnote, died on April 6, 1915, and footnote, are sons of Leon Loeb. In the summer there came to Los Angeles from the northern part of California an educator who had already established there and in Wisconsin an excellent reputation as a teacher. This was George W. Burton, who was accompanied by his wife, a lady educated in France and Italy. With them they brought two assistants, a young man and a young woman, adding another young woman teacher after they arrived. The company of pedagogues made quite a formidable array, and the number permitted the division of the school, then on Main, near what is now Second Street, into three departments, one a kind of kindergarten, another for young girls, and a third for boys. The school grew, and it soon became necessary to move the boys' department to the vestry room of the little Episcopal church on the corner of Temple and New High Streets. Not only was Burton an accomplished scholar and experienced teacher, but Mrs. Burton was a linguist of talent and also proficient in both instrumental and vocal music. Our eldest children attended the Burton School, as did also those of many friends such as the Kramers, Whites, Morrises, Griffiths, the Volney Howards, Kewins, Scotts, Nichols, the Schumachers, Joneses, and the Bannings. Daniel Bowen, another watchmaker and jeweler, came after Pyle, establishing himself on September 11th on the south side of Commercial Street. He sold watches, clocks, jewelry, and spectacles, and he used to advertise with the figure of a huge watch. S. Nordlinger, who arrived here in 1868, bought Bowen out and continued the jewelry business during 42 years, until his death in 1911, when, as a pioneer jeweler, he was succeeded by Louis S. and Melville Nordlinger, who still use the title of S. Nordlinger and Sons. Charles C. Lips, a German, came to Los Angeles from Philadelphia in 1866 and joined the wholesale liquor firm of E. Martin and Company, later Lips, Craig and Company, in the Baker Block. As a volunteer fireman, he was a member of the Old 38s, a fact adding interest to the appointment on February 28, 1905, of his son Walter Lips as chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department. On October 3rd, William Wolfskill died, mourned by many. Though but sixty-eight years of age, he had witnessed much in the founding of our great southwestern commonwealth, and notwithstanding the handicaps to his early education and the disappointments of his more eventful years, he was a man of marked intelligence and remained unembittered and kindly disposed toward his fellow man. A good example of what an industrious man, following an ordinary trade, could accomplish in early days was afforded by Andrew Gojin, a blacksmith who came here in 1866, a powerful son of the Isle of Man measuring over six feet and tipping the beam at more than two hundred pounds. He had soon saved enough money to buy for five hundred dollars a large frontage at Second and Hill Streets, selling it shortly after for fifteen hundred. From Los Angeles, Gojin went to Arizona and then to San Juan Capistrano, but was back here again in 1870, opening another shop. Toward the middle seventies, Gojin was making rather ingenious plows of iron and steel which attracted considerable attention. As fast as he accumulated a little money, he invested it in land, buying in 1874 for $6,000 some 360 acres comprising part of one of the Siniega ranchos, to which he moved in 1876. Seven years later, he purchased 305 acres, once called the Tom Gray Ranch, now known by the more pretentious name of Arlington Heights. In 1888, three years after he had secured 600 acres of the Palos Verdes Rancho near Wilmington, the blacksmith retired and made a grand tour of Europe, revisiting his beloved Isle of Man. Pat Goodwin was another blacksmith who reached Los Angeles in 1866 or 1867, shooing his way, as it were, south from San Francisco, through San Jose, Whiskey Flat, and other picturesque places, in the service of A. O. Thorne, one of the stage line proprietors. He had a shop first on Spring Street, where later the Empire Stables were opened, and afterward at the corner of Second and Spring Streets, on the site in time bought by J. E. Hollenbeck. Still another smith of this period was Henry King, brother of John King, formerly of the Bella Union, who in 1879-80 to 80 served two terms as chief of police. Later, A. L. Bath was a well-known wheelwright who located his shop on Spring Street near 3rd. In 1866, quite a calamity befell this pueblo, the abandonment by the government of drum barracks. As this had been one of the chief sources of revenue for our small community, the loss was severely felt, and the immediate effect disastrous. About the same time, too, Samuel B. Caswell, father of W. M. Caswell, first of the Los Angeles Savings Bank and now of the Security, who had come to Los Angeles the year before, 
took into partnership john f ellis and under the title of caswell and ellis they started a good-sized grocery and merchandise business and between the competition that they brought and the reduction of the circulating medium times with h newmark and company became somewhat less prosperous later john h wright was added to the firm and it became caswell ellis and wright on september first eighteen seventy one the firm dissolved end of chapter twenty four Chapter 25 of 60 Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 25 Removal to New York and Return, 1867 to 1868. The reader may already have noted that more than one important move in my life has been decided upon with but little previous deliberation. During August 1866, while on the way to a family picnic at La Bologna, my brother suggested the advisability of opening an office for H. Newmark and Company in New York, and so quickly had I expressed my willingness to remove there that when we reached the rancho I announced to my wife that we would leave for the east as soon as we could get ready. Circumstances, however, delayed our going a few months. My family at this time consisted of my wife and four children, and together on January 29, 1867, we left San Pedro for New York by way of San Francisco and Panama, experiencing frightfully hot weather. Stopping at Acapulco during Maximilian's Revolution, we were summarily warned to keep away from the fort on the hill, while at Panama, yellow fever, spread by travelers recently arrived from South America, caused the captain to beat a hasty retreat. Sailing on the steamer Henry Chancy from Aspinwall, we arrived at New York on the 6th of March, and having domiciled my family comfortably, my next care was to establish an office on the third floor at 31 and 33 Broadway, placing it in charge of M. J. Newmark, who had preceded me to the metropolis a year before. In a short time I bought a home on 49th Street, between 6th and 7th Avenues, then an agreeable residence district. An intense longing to see my old home next induced me to return to Europe, and I sailed on May 16th for Havre, on the steam propeller Union, the band playing the Highland Fling as the vessel left the pier. In mid-ocean the ship's propeller broke, and she completed the voyage under sail. Three months later I returned on the Russia. The recollection of this journey gives me real satisfaction, for had I not taken it then, I should never again have seen my father. On the 21st of the following November, or a few months after I last bade him good-bye, he died at Lebeau, in the seventy-fifth year of his age. My mother had died in the summer of 1859. It was during this visit that, tarrying for a week in the brilliant French capital, I saw the Paris Exposition, housed to a large extent in one immense building in the Champ de Mars. I was wonderfully impressed with both the city and the fair, as well as with the enterprising and artistic French people who had created it although I was somewhat disappointed that of the 50,000 or more exhibitors represented it, but 700 were Americans. One little incident may be worth relating. While I was standing in the midst of the machinery one day, the gendarme suddenly began to force the crowd back, and on retreating with the rest I saw a group of ladies and gentlemen approaching. It was soon whispered that they were the Empress Eugenie and her suite, and that we had been commanded to retire in order to permit Her Majesty to get a better view of a new railroad coach that she desired to inspect. Not long ago I was reading of a trying ordeal in the life of Elihu B. Washburn, American minister to France, who, having unluckily removed his shoe at a court dinner, was compelled to rise with the company on sudden appearance of royalty and to step back with a stockinged foot. The incident recalled an experience of my own in London. I had ordered from a certain shoemaker in Berlin a pair of patent leather gaiters, which I wore for the first time when I went to Covent Garden with an old friend and his wife. It was a very warm evening, and the performance had not progressed far before it became evident that the shoes were too small. I was, in fact, nearly overcome with pain, and in my desperation to remove the gaiters, when the lights were low, quietly shoved them under the seat and sat out the rest of the performance with a fair degree of comfort and composure imagine my consternation however when i sought to put the shoes on again and found the operation almost impossible the curtain fell while i was explaining and apologizing to my friends and nearly every light was extinguished before i was ready to emerge from the famous opera house and to limp to a waiting carriage 
a trifling event also lingers among the memories of this revisit to my native place while journeying towards lobo in a stage i happened to mention that i had married since settling in america whereupon one of my fellow passengers inquired whether my wife was white brown or black major ben c truman was president johnson's private secretary until he was appointed in eighteen sixty six special agent for the post office department on the pacific coast he came to los angeles in february eighteen sixty seven to look after postal matters in southern california and arizona but more particularly to re-establish between los angeles and points in new mexico the old butterfield route which had been discontinued on account of the war truman opened post offices at a number of places in los angeles county on december eighth eighteen sixty nine the major married miss augusta mallard daughter of judge j s mallard from July 1873 until the late summer of 1877, he controlled the Los Angeles Star, contributing to its columns many excellent sketches of early life in Southern California, some of which were incorporated in one or more substantial volumes. And of all the pioneer journalists here, it is probable that none have surpassed this affable gentleman in brilliancy and genial, kindly touch. Among Truman's books is an illustrated work entitled Semi-Tropical California, dedicated with a Dominus Vobiscum to Phineas Banning, and published in San Francisco, 1874, while another volume, issued seven years later, is devoted to Occidental sketches. A fire starting in Bell's Block on Los Angeles Street on July 13th, during my absence from the city, destroyed property to the value of $64,000, and the same season S. Lazard and company moved their dry goods store from Bell's Row to Wolfskill's building on Main Street, opposite the Bella Union Hotel. Germain Pellissier, a Frenchman from the Haute Alps, came to Los Angeles in August, and for twenty-eight years lived at what is now the corner of Seventh and Olive Streets. Then the land was in the country, but by 1888 Pellissier had built the block that bears his name. On settling here, Pellissier went into sheep raising, scattering stock in Kern and Ventura counties, and importing sheep from France and Australia in order to improve his breed and from one ram alone in a year as he demonstrated to some doubting challengers he clipped sixty-two and a half pounds of wool p beaudry began to invest in hill property in eighteen sixty seven at once improving the steep hillside of new high street near sonora town which he bought in at sheriff's stale for fifty five dollars afterward beaudry purchased some twenty acres between second fourth charity and hill streets for which he paid five hundred and seventeen dollars and when he had subdivided this into eighty lots he cleared about thirty thousand dollars thirty-nine acres between fourth and sixth and pearl and charity streets he finally disposed of at a profit it is said of over fifty thousand dollars john g downey having subdivided nieto's rancho santa gertrudis the little town of downey which he named soon enjoyed such a boom that sleepy los angeles began to sit up and take notice among the early residents was e m sanford a son-in-law of general john w gordon of georgia a short time before the founding of downey a small place named gallatin had been started nearby but the flood of eighteen sixty eight caused our otherwise dry rivers to change their courses and gallatin was washed away this subdividing at once stimulated the coming of land and home seekers increased the spirit of enterprise and brought money into circulation soon afterward phineas banning renewed the agitation to connect los angeles with wilmington by rail he petitioned the county to assist the enterprise but the larger taxpayers backed by the over conservative farmers still opposed the scheme tooth and nail until it finally took all of banning's influence to carry the project through to a successful termination george s patton whose father colonel patton of the confederate army was killed at winchester september nineteenth eighteen sixty four is a nephew of andrew glassell and the oldest of four children who came to los angeles with their mother and father andrew glassell senior in eighteen sixty seven educated in the public schools of los angeles patton afterward attended the virginia military institute where stonewall jackson had been a professor returning to los angeles in september eighteen seventy seven when he entered the law firm of glassell smith and patton in 1884 he married Miss Ruth, youngest daughter of B.D. Wilson, after which he retired to private life. One of Patton's sisters married Tom Brown, another sister became the wife of the popular physician W. Another sister became the wife of the popular physician Dr. W. Lemoyne Wills. In 1871 his mother, relict of Colonel George S. Patton, married her kinsman, Colonel George H. Smith. 
john moran senior conducted a vineyard on san pedro street near the present ninth in addition to which he initiated the soda water business here selling his product at twenty-five cents a bottle soda water however was too soft a drink to find much favor and little was done to establish the trade on a firm basis until eighteen sixty seven when h w stoll a german drove from colorado to california and organized the los angeles soda water works as soon as he began to manufacture the aerated beverages stevens and wood set up the first soda water fountain in los angeles on north spring street near the post office after that bubbling water and strangely colored syrups gained in popularity until in eighteen seventy six quite an expensive fountain was purchased by pruce and peroni's drug store on spring street opposite court and what is more they brought in hogsheads from saratoga that would be difficult to find in all los angeles today congress vichy and kissingen waters stole by the way in eighteen seventy three married fraulein louisa ben daughter of john ben an important industry of the late sixties and early seventies was the harvesting of castor beans then growing wild along the zanjas they were shipped to san francisco for manufacturing purposes the oil factories there both supplying the ranchmen with seed and pledging themselves to take the harvest when gathered in eighteen sixty seven a small castor oil mill was set up here the chilicote derived according to charles f loomis from the aztec chile coyote the wild cucumber or echinocystis fabacea is the naming of a plaything supplied by diversified nature which grew on large vines especially along the slope leading down to the river on what is now elysian park and in the neighborhood of the hills adjacent to the mallard and nichols places four or five of these chilicotes each shaped much like an irregular marble came in a small burr or gourd and to secure them for games the youngsters risked limb if not life among the trees and rocks small circular holes were sometimes cut into the nuts and after the meat which was not edible had been extracted the empty shells were strung together like beads and presented as necklaces and bracelets to sisters and sweethearts just about the time when i first gazed upon the scattered houses of our little pueblo the pacific railway expedition sent out from washington prepared and published a tinted lithograph sketch of los angeles now rather rare in eighteen sixty seven stephen a rendell an englishman of angora goat fame who had been here off and on as a photographer devised one of the first large panoramas of los angeles which he sold by advance subscription it was made in sections and as the only view of that year extant it also has become notable as an historical souvenir surrounded by his somewhat pretentious gallery and his mysterious dark room on the top floor of temple's new block v wolfenstein also took good bad and indifferent photographs having arrived here perhaps in the late sixties and remaining a decade or more until his return to his native stockholm where i again met him he operated with slow wet plates and pioneers will remember the inconvenience almost tantamount to torture to which the patron was subjected in sitting out an exposure the children of pioneers too will recall his magic revolving stereoscope filled with fascinating views at which one peeped through magnifying glasses lewis lewin must have arrived here in the late sixties subsequently he bought out the stationary business of w j broderick and p lazarus upon his arrival from tucson in eighteen seventy four entered into partnership with him samuel hellman as was not generally known at the time also having an interest in the firm which was styled lewis lewin and company when the centennial of the united states was celebrated here in eighteen seventy six a committee wrote a short historical sketch of los angeles and this was published by lewin and company now the firm is known as the lazarus stationery company p lazarus footnote died on september thirtieth nineteen fourteen and footnote being president lewin and lazarus married into families of pioneers mrs lewin is a daughter of s lazard while mrs lazarus is a daughter of m kramer lewin died at manila on april fifth nineteen o five on november eighteenth the common council contracted with jean louis saint savin to lay some five thousand feet of two and three inch iron pipe at a cost of about six thousand dollars in scrip but the great flood of that winter caused saint savin so many failures and losses that he transferred his lease in the spring or summer of eighteen sixty eight to dr j s griffin prudent baudry and solomon lazard who completed saint savin's contract with the city dr griffin and his associates then proposed to lease the waterworks from the city for a term of fifty years but soon changed this to an offer to buy when the matter came up before the council for adoption there was a tie vote whereupon murray morrison just before resigning as president of the council 
voted in the affirmative, his last official act being to sign the franchise. Mayor Aguilar, however, vetoed the ordinance, and then Dr. Griffin and his colleagues came forward with a new proposition. This was to lease the works for a period of thirty years, and to pay fifteen hundred dollars a year in addition to performing certain things promised in the preceding proposition. At this stage of the negotiations, John Jones made a rival offer, and P. McFadden, who had been an unsuccessful bidder for the Sansevain lease, tried with Juan Bernard to enter into a twenty-year contract. Notwithstanding these offers, however, the city authorities thought it best, on July 22, 1868, to vote the franchise to Dr. Griffin, S. Lazard, and P. Beaudry, who soon transferred their thirty-year privileges to a corporation known as the Los Angeles City Water Company, in which they became trustees. Others associated in this enterprise were Eugene Meyer, I. W. Hellman, J. G. Downey, A. J. King, Stephen Hathaway Mott, Tom's brother, W. H. Perry, and Charles Lafoon. A spirited fight followed the granting of the 30-year lease, but the water company came out victorious. In the late 60s, when the only communities of much consequence in Los Angeles County were Los Angeles, Anaheim, and Wilmington, the latter place and Anaheim Landing were the shipping ports of Los Angeles, San Bernardino, and Arizona. At that time, or during some of the especially prosperous days of Anaheim, the slough at Anaheim Landing, since filled up by flood, was so formed and of such depth that heavily loaded vessels ran past the warehouse to a considerable distance inland, and there unloaded their cargoes. At the same time, the leading coast steamers began to stop there. Not many miles away was the corn-producing settlement Gospel Swamp. I have pointed out the recurring weaknesses in the wooden pipes laid by Sansevain and Marchessault. This distressing difficulty, causing as it did repeated losses and sharp criticism by the public, has always been regarded as the motive for ex-Mayor Marcia Salt's death on January 20th, when he committed suicide in the old city council room. Jacob Lowe arrived in America in 1865 and spent three years in New York before he came to California in 1868. Clerking for a while in San Francisco, he went to the old town of San Diego, then to Gallatin, and in 1872 settled in Downey, and there, in conjunction with Jacob Barak, afterward of Haas, Barak, and Company, he conducted for years the principal general merchandise business of that section. On coming to Los Angeles in 1883, he bought, as I have said, the Deming Mill, now known as the Capital Mills. Two years later, on the 2nd of August, he was married to my daughter Emily. Dr. Joseph Kurtz, once a student at Geisen, arrived in Los Angeles on February 3rd with a record for hospital service at Baltimore during the Civil War, having been induced to come here by the druggist, Adolph Young, with whom for a while he had some association. Still later, he joined Dr. Rudolf Eichler in conducting a pharmacy. For some time prior to his graduation in medicine, in 1872, Dr. Kurtz had an office in the Lanfranco building. For many years he was surgeon to the Southern Pacific Railroad Company and consulting physician to the Santa Fe Railroad Company, and he also served as president of the Los Angeles College Clinical Association. I shall have further occasion to refer to this good friend. Dr. Carl Kurtz is distinguishing himself in the profession of his father. Hail fellow well met and always in favor with a large circle was my Teutonic friend Louis Ebbinger, who after coming to Los Angeles in 1868 turned clay into bricks. Perhaps this also recalled the days of his childhood when he made pies of the same material, but be that as it may, Lewis, in the early seventies, made his first venture in the bakery business, opening shop on North Spring Street. In the bustling boom days when real estate men saw naught but the sugar coating, Ebbinger, who had moved to the elaborate quarters in a building at the southwest corner of Spring and Third Streets, was dispensing cream puffs and other baked delicacies to an enthusiastic and unusually large clientele. But since everybody then had money, or thought he had, one such place was not enough to satisfy the ravenous speculators. With the result that John Coaster was soon conducting a similar establishment on Spring Street near 2nd, while farther north on Spring Street near 1st, the Vienna Bakery ran both Lewis and John a merry race. Dr. L. W. French, one of the organizers of the Odontological Society of Southern California, also came to Los Angeles in 1868 so early that he found but a couple of itinerant dentists who made their headquarters here for part of the year and then hung out their shingles in other towns or at remote ranches. One day in the spring of 1868, while I was residing in New York City, I received a letter from Phineas Banning, accompanied by a sealed communication, and reading about as follows. 
dear harris herewith i enclose to you a letter of the greatest importance addressed to miss mary hollister daughter as you know of colonel john h hollister who will soon be on her way to new york and who may be expected to arrive there by the next steamer this letter i beg you to deliver to miss hollister personally immediately upon her arrival in new york thereby obliging yours obediently signed phineas banning the steamer referred to had not yet arrived and i lost no time in arranging that i should be informed by the company's agents of the vessel's approach as soon as it was sighted this notification came by the by through a telegram received before daylight one bitterly cold morning when i was told that the ship would soon be at the dock and as quickly as i could i procured a carriage hastened to the wharf and before any passengers had landed boarded the vessel there i sought out miss hollister a charming lady and gave her the mysterious missive i thought no more of this matter until i returned to los angeles when welcoming back banning told me that the letter i had had the honor to deliver aboard ship in new york contained nothing less than a proposal of marriage his solicitation of miss hollister's heart and hand one reason why the Bella Union played such an important role in the early days of Los Angeles was because there was no such thing as a high-class restaurant. Indeed, the first recollection I have of anything like a satisfactory place is that of Louis Viel, known by some as French Louis, and nicknamed by others Louis Gordo, or Louis the Fat. Viel came to Los Angeles from Mexico, a fat, jolly little French caterer, not much over five feet in height, and weighing, I should judge, 250 pounds and this great bulk, supported as it was by two peg-like legs, rendered his appearance truly comical. His blue eyes, light hair, and very rosy cheeks accentuated his ludicrous figure. Louis, who must have been about fifty-four years of age when I first met him, then conducted his establishment in John Lanfranco's building on Main Street, between Commercial and Ricana, from which fact the place was known as the Lanfranco, although it subsequently received a more suggestive title, the What Cheer House. Louis was an acknowledged expert in his art, but he did not always choose to exert himself. Nevertheless, his lunches, for which he charged fifty or seventy-five cents, according to the number of dishes served, were well thought of, and it is certain that Los Angeles had never had so good a restaurant before. At one time, our caterer's partner was a man named Federico Guiol, whom he later bought out. Louis could never master the English language, and to his last day spoke with a strong French accent. His florid cheeks were due to the enormous quantity of claret consumed both at and between meals. He would mix it with soup, dip his bread into it, and otherwise absorb it in large quantities. Indeed, at the time of his fatal illness, while he was living with the family of Don Louis saint Savin, it was assumed that overindulgence in wine was the cause. Be that as it may, he sickened and died, passing away at the Lanfranco home in 1872. Viel had prospered but during his sickness he spent largely of his means. After his death it was discovered that he had been in the habit of hiding his coin in little niches in the wall of his room and in other secret places, and only a small amount of the money was found. A few of the real pioneers recollect Louis Gordo as one who added somewhat to the comfort of those who then patronized restaurants, while others will associate him with the introduction of the first French dolls to take the place of rag babies. Both Judge Robert M. McClay Widney and Dr. Joseph P. Widney, the surgeon, took up their residence in Los Angeles in 1868. R. M. Widney set out from Ohio about 1855, and having spent two years in exploring the Rockies, worked for a while in the Sacramento Valley, where he chopped wood for a living, and finally reached Los Angeles with a small trunk and about $100 in cash. Here he opened a law and real estate office and started printing the Real Estate Advertiser. Dr. Widney crossed the continent in 1862, spent two years as surgeon in the United States Army in Arizona, after which he proceeded to Los Angeles and soon became one of the charter members of the Los Angeles Medical Society, exerting himself in particular to extend Southern California's climactic fame. I have spoken of the ice procured from the San Bernardino Mountains in rather early days, but I have not said that in the summer, when we most needed the cooling commodity, there was none to be had. The enterprising firm of Queen and Guard, the first to arrange for regular shipments of Truckee River ice in large quantities by steamer from the north, announced their purpose late in March of 1868 of building an ice house on Main Street, and about the 1st of April they began delivering daily in a large and substantial wagon, especially constructed for that purpose, and which, for the time being, was an object of much curiosity. 
liberal support was given the enterprise and perhaps it is no wonder that the perspiring editor of the news going into ecstasies because of a cooling sample or two deposited in his office said in the next issue of his paper the founding of an ice depot is another step forward in the progress that is to make us a great city we have water and gas and now we are to have the additional luxury of ice Banning's fight for the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad has been touched upon more than once. Tomlinson, his rival, opposed the project, but his sudden death about two weeks before the election in 1868 removed one of the serious obstacles. When the vote was taken on March 24th as to whether the city and county should bond themselves to encourage the building of the railroad, 700 votes were cast in favor of, and 672 votes against, the undertaking, leaving Banning and his associates ready to go ahead. By the way, as a reminder of the quondam vogue of Spanish here, it may be noted that the proclamation regarding the railroad, published in 1868, was printed in both English and Spanish. On May 16th, Henry Hamilton, whose newspaper, The Star, during part of the war period had been suspended through the censorship of the national government, again made his bow to the Los Angeles public, this time in a half-facetious leader in which he referred to the late unpleasantness in the family circle. Hamilton's old-time vigor was immediately recognized, but not his former disposition to attack and criticize. Dr. H. S. Orm, once president of the State Board of Health of California, arrived in Los Angeles on July 4th and soon became as prominent in Masonic as in medical circles. Dr. Harmon, an early successor to Drs. Griffin and Den, first settled here in 1868, although he had previously visited California in 1853. Carl Felix Heinzemann, at one time a well-known chemist and druggist, emigrated from Germany in 1868 and came direct to Los Angeles, where, after succeeding J.B. Saunders and company, he continued in the Lanfranco building what grew to be the largest drug store south of San Francisco. Heinzemann died on April 29, 1903. About the same period, a popular apothecary shop on Main Street near the plaza was known as Chevalier's. In the 70s, when hygiene and sanitation were given more attention, a Welshman named Hughes conducted a steam bath establishment on Main Street, almost opposite the Baker Block, and the first place of its kind in the city. Charles F. Harper, footnote, died September 19, 1915, end footnote, of Mississippi, and the father of ex-Mayor Harper, in 1868, opened with R. H. Dalton a hardware store in the Allen Block, corner of Spring and Temple Streets, thus forerunning Coulter and Harper, Harper and Moore, Harper, Reynolds and Company, and the Harper Reynolds Company. Michel Levey, an Alsatian, arrived in San Francisco when but seventeen years of age, and after various experiences in California and Nevada towns, he came to Los Angeles in 1868, soon establishing with Joe Coblentz the wholesale liquor house of Levey and Coblentz. The latter left here in 1879, and LeVay continued under the firm name of M. LeVay and Company until his death in 1905. Anastasio Cardenas, a dwarf who weighed but one and a half pounds when born, came to Los Angeles in 1867 and soon appeared before the public as a singer and dancer. He carried a sword and was popularly dubbed General. A brother, Ruperto, lived long here. When the Canal and Reservoir Company was organized with George Hansen as president and J.J. Warner as secretary, P. Beaudry contributed heavily to construct a 20-foot dam across the canyon, below the present site of Echo Park, and a ditch leading down to Pearl Street. This first turned attention to the possibilities in hill lands to the west, and in return the city gave the company a large amount of land, popularly designated as Canal and Reservoir property. In 1868, when there was still not a three-story house in Los Angeles, James Alvinza Hayward, a San Franciscan, joined John G. Downey in providing $100,000 with which to open, in the old Downey block on the site of the Temple Adobe, the first bank in Los Angeles, under the firm name of Hayward & Company. The lack of business afforded this enterprise short shrift, and they soon retired. In July of the same year, I. W. Hellman, William Workman, F. P. F. Temple and James R. Toberman started a bank with a capital of $125,000 under the title of Hellman Temple and Company, Hellman becoming manager. I do not remember when postal lock boxes were first brought into use, but I do recollect that in the late 60s Postmaster Clark had a great deal of trouble collecting quarterly rents, and that he finally gave notice that boxes held by delinquents would thereafter be nailed up. 
a year or two after the burtons had established themselves here came another pedagogue in the person of w b lawler a thick-set bearded man with a flushed complexion who opened a day school called the lawler institute and after the burtons left here to settle at portland oregon where burton became headmaster of an academy for advanced students many of his former pupils attended lawler's school the two institutions proved quite different in type Burton training had tended strongly to language and literature, while Lawler, who was an adept at shortcut methods of calculation, placed more stress on arithmetic and commercial education. Burton, who returned to Los Angeles, has been for years a leading member of the Times editorial staff, and Burton's book on California and its sunlit skies is one of this author's contribution to Pacific Coast literature. His wife, however, died many years ago. Lawler, who was president of the Common Council in 1880, is also dead. The most popular piano teacher of about that time was Professor Van Gilpin. William Pridham came to Los Angeles in August, having been transferred from the San Francisco office of Wells Fargo and Company, in whose service as pony rider, clerk at Austin, Nevada, and at Sacramento, and cashier in the northern metropolis, he had been for some ten years. Here he succeeded Major J. R. Toberman when the latter, after long service, resigned and with a single office boy, at one time little Joe Binford, he handled all the business committed to the company's charge. John Osborne was the outside expressman. Then most of the heavy express matter from San Francisco was carried by steamers, but letters and limited packages of moment were sent by stage. With the advent of railroads, Pridham was appointed by Wells Fargo and Company, superintendent of the Los Angeles district. On June 12, 1880, he married Miss Mary Esther, daughter of Colonel John O. Wheeler, and later moved to Alameda. Now, after 51 years of association with the express business, Pridham still continues to be officially connected with the Wells Fargo Company. Speaking of that great organization reminds me that it conducted for years a mail-carrying business. Three-cent stamped envelopes, imprinted with Wells Fargo and Company's name, were sold to their patrons for ten cents each. To compensate for this bonus, the company delivered the letters entrusted to them perhaps one to two hours sooner than did the government. This recalls to me a familiar experience on the arrival of the mail from the north. Before the inauguration of a stage line, the best time in the transmission of mail matter between San Francisco and Los Angeles was made by water, and Wells Fargo messengers sailed with the steamers. Immediately upon the arrival of the boat at San Pedro, the messenger boarded the stage, and as soon as he reached Los Angeles, pressed on to the office of the company near the Bella Union, where he delivered his bag full of letters. The steamer generally got in by five o'clock in the morning, and many a time about seven have I climbed Signal or Pound Cake Hill, higher in those days than now, and affording in clear weather a view of both ocean and the smoke of the steamer, upon whose summit stood a house, used as a signal station, and there watched for the rival stages, the approach of which was indicated by clouds of dust. I would then hurry with many others to the express company's office where, as soon as the bag was emptied, we would all help ourselves unceremoniously to the mail. In August, General Edward Boughton, a Northern Army officer, came to Los Angeles and soon had a sheep ranch on Boyle Heights, a section then containing but two houses, and two years later he camped where Whittier now lies. In 1874 he bought land for pasture in the San Jacinto Valley, and for years owned the ocean front at Alamitos Bay from Devil's Gate to the inlet, boring artesian wells there north of Long Beach. Louis Ribadeau, who had continued to prosper as a ranchero, died in 1868 at the age of 77 years. With the usual flourish of spades, if not of trumpets, ground was broken for the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad at Wilmington on September 19th, and toward the end of November the rails had been laid about a mile out from Wilmington. The last contract for carrying the overland mail was given to Wells Fargo and Company on October 1st and pledged a round remuneration of $1,750,000 per annum, while it also permitted passengers and freight to be transported. But the company came to have a great deal of competition. Phineas Banning, for example, had a stage line between Los Angeles and Yuma, in addition to which mail and passengers were carried in buckboards, large wagons, and jerkies. Moreover, there was another stage line between Tucson and El Paso, and rival stage lines between El Paso and St. Louis, and in consequence the Butterfield service was finally abandoned. This American vehicle, by the by, the jerky, was so named for the very good reason that as the wagon was built without springs, it jerked the rider around unmercifully. Boards were laid across the wagon box for bed or seats, accommodating four passengers, and some space was provided in the back for baggage. To maintain one's position in the bumping, squeaking vehicle at all was difficult, while to keep one's place on the seat approached the impossible. 
of the various los angeles roadways in 1868 west sixth street was the most important in its relation to travel along this highway the daily overland stages entered and departed from the city and by this route came all the havila lone pine soledad and owens river trade as well as that of the balona and siniega districts sixth street also led to the fairgrounds and over its none too even service dashed most of the sports and gallants on their way to the race course i have said that i returned to new york in eighteen sixty seven presumably for permanent residence soon after i left los angeles however samuel cohn became desperately ill and the sole management of h newmark and company suddenly devolved on sam's brother caspar this condition of affairs grew so bad that my return to los angeles became imperative accordingly leaving my family i took passage on october thirty first eighteen sixty eight for san francisco and returned to los angeles without delay i then wired my wife to start with the children for the coast and have the furniture including a chickering grand piano just purchased shipped after them and when they arrived we once more took possession of the good old adobe on main street where we lived contentedly until eighteen seventy four this piano by the way which came by freight around cape horn was one of the first instruments of the kind seen here john schumacher having previously bought one while we were living in new york Edward J. Newmark, my wife's brother, died here on February 17, 1868. Before I left for New York, hardly anything had been done in subdividing property, save perhaps by the Lugos and Downey, and at Anaheim and Wilmington. During the time that I was away, however, newspapers and letters from home indicated the changes going on here, and I recall what an impression all this made upon me. On my way down from San Francisco, on Captain Johnson's Orizaba in December, about the same time that the now familiar locomotive san gabriel reached wilmington land agents were active and people were talking a great deal about these subdivisions and by the time i reached los angeles i too was considerably stirred up over the innovations and as soon as possible after my return hastened out to see the change the improvements were quite noticeable and among other alterations surprising me were the houses people had begun to build on the approaches to the western hills i was also to learn that there was a general demand for property all over the city colonel charles h larrabee city attorney in eighteen sixty eight especially having bought several hundred feet on spring and fort streets later i heard of the experiences of other angelinos aboard ship who were deluged with circulars advertising prospective towns to show the provincial character of los angeles fifty years ago i will add an anecdote or two while i was in new york members of my family reported by letter as a matter of extraordinary interest the novelty of a silver nameplate on a neighboring front door and when i was taken to inspect it a year later i saw the legend still novel mr and mrs eugene meyer in the metropolis i had found finger bowls in common use and having brought back with me such a supply as my family would be likely to need i discovered that it had actually fallen to my lot to introduce those desirable conveniences into los angeles William Ferguson was an arrival of 1868, having come to settle up the business of a brother and remaining to open a livery stable on North Main Street near the plaza, which he conducted for ten years. Investing in water company stock, Ferguson abandoned his stable to make water pipes, a couple of years later, perhaps, than J. F. Holbrook had entered the same field. Success enabled Ferguson to build a home at 303 South Hill Street, where he found himself the only resident south of Third this manufacture here of water pipe recalls a cordial acquaintance with william lacy senior an englishman who was interested with william roland in developing the puente oil fields his sons william jr and richard h originators of the lacy manufacturing company began making pipe and tanks a quarter of a century ago c r rinaldi started a furniture business here in eighteen sixty eight opening his store almost opposite the stern's home on north main street before long he disposed of an interest to charles daughter and then i think sold out to i w lord and moved to the neighborhood of the san fernando mission about the same time sidney lacy who arrived in eighteen seventy and was a popular clerk with the pioneer carpet and wallpaper house of smith and walter commenced what was to be a long association with this establishment in eighteen seventy six c h bradley bought out lord and the firm of daughter and bradley so well known to households of forty years ago came into existence in eighteen eighty four h h markham soon to be congressman and then governor of the state with general e p johnson bought this concern and organized the los angeles furniture company whose affairs since nineteen ten when her husband died have been conducted by the president mrs catherine fredericks 
Conrad Hafen, a German Swiss, reached Los Angeles in December 1868, driving a six-horse team and battered wagon with which he had braved the privations of Death Valley, and soon he rented a little vineyard, two years later buying for the same purpose considerable acreage on what is now Central Avenue. Rewarded for his husbandry with some affluence, Hafen built both the old Hafen House and the new on South Hill Street, once a favorite resort for German arrivals. He retired in 1905. End of chapter 25chapter 26 of 60 years in southern california 1853 to 1913 by harris newmark this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand chapter 26 the cerro gordo mines 1869 it was early in 1869 that i was walking down spring street one day and saw a crowd at the city hall on a large box stood mayor joel h turner and just as I arrived, a man leaning against the adobe wall called out, Seven dollars. The mayor then announced the bid, for an auction was in progress, Seven dollars once, Seven dollars twice, Seven dollars three times, and, as he raised his hand to conclude the sale, I called out, A half. This I did in the spirit of fun. In fact, I did not even know what was being offered. Seven dollars fifty once, Seven dollars fifty twice, Seven dollars fifty three times, and sold to Harris Newmark called the mayor i then inquired what i had bought and was shown the location of about twenty acres a part of nine hundred being sold by the city at prices ranging from five to ten dollars an acre the piece purchase was west of the city limits and i kept it until eighteen eighty six when i had almost forgotten that i was the owner then george williamson one of the first salesmen of h newmark and company who became a boomer of the period bought it from me for ten thousand dollars and resold it within two weeks for fourteen thousand the Sunset Oil Company starting there, as the land was within what was known as the Oil District. Since the opening of streets in all directions, I have lost trace of this land, but inclined to the belief that it lies in the immediate vicinity of the Wilshire District. My experience reminds me of Colonel John O. Wheeler's investment in fifty or sixty acres at what is now Figueroa and Adams Streets. Later, going to San Francisco as a customs officer, he forgot about his purchase until one day he received a somewhat surprising offer. On January 1st, A.J. King and R.H. Offutt began to publish a daily edition of the news, hitherto a semi-weekly, making it strongly democratic. There was no Sunday issue, and $12 was the subscription. On October 16th, Offutt sold his interest to Alonzo Waite, and the firm became King and Waite. In another year, King had retired. How modest was the status of the post office in 1869 may be gathered from the fact that the postmaster had only one assistant, a boy, both together receiving $1,400 in greenbacks worth but $1,000 in gold. Henry Hamill, for years connected with the Bella Union, and a partner named Bremerman, leased the United States Hotel on February 1st from Louis Mesmer, and in March John King succeeded Winston and King as manager of the Bella Union. King died in December 1871. In the winter of 1868-69, to 69, when heavy rains seriously interfered with bringing in the small supply of lumber at San Pedro, a cooperative society was proposed to ensure the importation each summer of enough supplies to tide the community over during the wintry weather. Over 100 persons, it was then estimated, had abandoned the building, and many others were waiting for material to complete fences and repairs. Thanks to contractor H. B. Titchener's vigor in constructing the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad, public interest in the venture, by the beginning of 1869, had materially increased. In January, a vessel arrived with a locomotive and a steam pile driver, and a few days later a schooner sailed into San Pedro with ties, sleepers, and rails enough for three miles of the track. Soon also the locomotive was running part of the way. The wet winter made muddy roads, and this led to the proposal to lay the track some eight or ten miles in the direction of Los Angeles, and there to transfer the freight to wagons. Stearns Hall and the plaza were amusement places in 1869. At the latter in January, the so-called Paris Exposition Circus held forth, while Joe Murphy and Maggie Moore, who had just favored the passengers on the Orizaba, on coming south from San Francisco with a show, trod the hall's more classic boards. Ice a quarter of an inch thick was formed here for several days during the third week in January, and butchers found it so difficult to secure fat cattle that good beef advanced to six and a quarter cents a pound. 
on january twentieth i purchased from eugene meyer the southern half of lots three and four in block five fronting on fort street between second and third formerly owned by william buffum and j f burns meyer had paid one thousand dollars for one hundred and twenty feet front and three hundred and thirty feet depth and when i bought half of this piece for one thousand dollars it was generally admitted that i had paid all that it was worth isaac lankershim father of j b lankershim and mrs i n van wise who first visited california in eighteen fifty four came from san francisco in eighteen sixty nine and bought for one hundred fifteen thousand dollars part of andres pico's san fernando rancho which he stocked with sheep Levi Strauss and Company, Scholl Brothers, L. and M. Sachs and Company of San Francisco, and others were interested in this partnership, then known as the San Fernando Farm Association. But Lankershim was in control until about one year later, when Isaac Newton Van Wise arrived from Monticello, where he had been merchandising, and was put permanently in charge of the ranch. At this period, Lankershim lived there, for he had not yet undertaken milling in Los Angeles. A little later, Lankershim and Van Wise successfully engaged in the raising of wheat, cultivating nearly 60,000 acres and consigning some of their harvests to Liverpool. This factory caused a heavy loss in the spring of 1881, when the Parisian, which left Wilmington under Captain Reume, found it at sea with nearly 250 tons of wheat and about 75 tons of flour belonging to them. J. B. Lankershim, owner of the well-known hotel bearing his name, after the death of his father, made some very important investments in Los Angeles real estate including the northwest corner of Broadway and 7th Street, now occupied by the building devoted to Bullock's department store. M. N. Newmark, a nephew of mine and president of the Newmark Grain Company, arrived in 1869 and clerked for H. Newmark and Company until 1871, in which year he established a partnership with S. Grand in Compton, selling general merchandise. This partnership lasted until 1878, when Newmark bought out Grand. He finally disposed of the business in 1889, and with D.K. Edwards, organized the firm of Newmark and Edwards. In 1895, Edwards sold out his interest. Victor Ponet, a native of Belgium and once Belgian consul here, while traveling around the world, landed in California in 1867, and two years later came to Los Angeles. Attracted by the climate and Southern California's possible future, Ponet settled here, engaging first in the pioneer manufacture and importation of mirrors and picture frames, and before his retirement to live in Sherman, he had had experience both as undertaker and banker. Footnote. Died February 9, 1914. End footnote. In 1869, General W.S. Rosencrantz came south in the interest of the proposed San Diego and Gila Railroad, never constructed. The general, as a result, took up land around Sausul Redondo, and there, by the summer of 1869, so many people, who insisted that Rosecrans had appropriated public land, had squatted, that he was put to no end of trouble in ejecting them. Though I have witnessed most of the progress in Southern California, it is still difficult to realize that so much could have been accomplished within the lifetime of one man. During 1868-69, to 69, only 2,200 boxes of oranges were shipped from Los Angeles, while the southern county's crop of oranges and lemons for 1913-14 to 14 is estimated, I am told, at about 12 million boxes. Due to the eight-day shindy marking the celebration of the Chinese New Year, demand for a more concentrated rumpus was voiced in February 1869, threatening an agitation against John Chinaman. The same month, residents, wishing a school in which German should be taught, and a gymnasium, petitioned the Common Council to acquire a lot in New High Street for the purpose. About 1869, the Los Angeles Social Club, which to the best of my recollection was the first of its kind in the city, was organized, with headquarters in the earliest building erected by I.W. Hellman at the northwest corner of Los Angeles and Commercial Streets. Among other pioneer members were Captain Cameron E. Tom, Tom Mott, Eugene Meyer, Sam and Charles Prager, Tom Rowan, I.W. and H.W. Hellman, S. Lazard, W.J. Broderick, John Jones, Caspar Cohn, a. C. Chauvin, M. and J. L. Morris, Leon Loeb, Sam Meyer, Dr. F. A. McDougall, B. Cohn, and myself. Somewhat later, the club moved to the east side of Los Angeles Street, between Commercial and Aliso. Still later, it dissolved, and although it did not become the direct ancestor of any of the several well-known social organizations in the Los Angeles of today, I feel that it should be mentioned as having had the honor of being their precursor and model. Speaking of social organizations, I may say that several Los Angeles clubs were organized in the early era of sympathy, tolerance, and good feeling, 
when the individual was appreciated at his true worth and before the advent of men whose bigotry has sown intolerance and discord and has made a mockery of both religion and professed ideals it must have been early in the sixties that alexander bell sold the southern end of his property to m heinsch the saddler on february twenty third eighteen sixty nine the directors of the san pedro railroad selected the mike madigan lot on alameda street on a part of which the owner was conducting a livery stable as the site for the depot in los angeles and heinsch having allowed the authorities to cut through his property the extension of commercial and Rakina streets eastward from los angeles to alameda was hastened late on february fourteenth the news was circulated of a shocking tragedy in the billiard saloon of the lafayette hotel and at once aroused intense regret affecting as the affair did the standing and happiness of two well-known los angeles families about eight o'clock charles howard a young lawyer of prominence and a son of volney e howard met daniel b nichols son of the ex-mayor and some dispute between them having reached its climax both parties drew weapons and fired howard was killed and nichols wounded though not fatally as was first thought the tragedy the cause of which was never generally known made a profound impression the work of extending water mains along fort spring and other streets progressed steadily until the los angeles water company struck a snag which again demonstrated the city's dependence difficulty in coupling pipes called a halt and the management had to send all the way to san francisco for a complete set of plumbers tools in the spring tillotson emery and company a los angeles and san gabriel firm brought south the first steam separator seen here and took contracts to thrash the farmers grain on june third they started the machine and many persons went out to see it work among features pointed out were precautions against fire from the engine which the contractors declared made everything perfectly safe from its inception wilmington sought in one way or another to rival los angeles and in april they threw down the gauntlet a a polhemus a workshop engineer of the los angeles and san pedro railroad in 1887 a manufacturer of straw wrapping paper somewhere between here and wilmington had bought a velocipede and no sooner was it noised about than john goller set to work to eclipse the achievement about one o'clock therefore on april twenty fifth one of goller's apprentices suddenly appeared ready to make the first experiment the streets were soon crowded and interest was at fever heat the young fellow straddled the wheels moved about half a block and then at the junction of main and spring streets executed a first-class somersault Immediately, however, the other intrepid ones tried their skill, and the Velocipede was voted a successful institution of our young and progressive city. By the first week in May, the Velocipede craze had spread, crowds congregating daily on Main Street to see the antics of the boys, and soon H. F. Lawrence announced the opening in Stearns Hall on May 14th of a Velocipede school, where free instruction would be given, afternoons to ladies and evenings to men, and to further stimulate interest, Lawrence announced a raffle on May 15th of a splendid velocipede. By May 22nd, J. Eastman had obtained permission of the Common Council to build a velocipede track on the historic Old Plaza, but evidently he did not make use of the privilege, for a newspaper writer was soon giving vent to the following sarcasm. Our city followers tried to make a little coin by leasing the plaza as a velocipede circle or square, but so far the velocipedist has failed to connect. I dare say the cost of cleaning up the place of weeds backed the poor soul out. It happened in 1869 that Judson, the financier, and Belshaw, a practical miner, began working their lead mines in Cerro Gordo, in the Owens River country, and as the handling of the ore necessitated a great many wagons, Remy Nadeau obtained the contract for the transportation of the ore brought down to Wilmington and then shipped by boat to San Francisco. Remy had returned here about 1866 after having been in San Francisco for four or five years, and eventually he built the Nadeau Hotel at the corner of Spring and First Streets, where A. Bull, father of Frank A. Bull, had formerly kept a little grocery store in an adobe. This ore was loaded onto very large wagons, each drawn on level stretches by twelve or fourteen mules, but requiring as many as twenty or more mules when crossing the San Fernando Mountains, always regarded as one of the worst places on the route. In order not to return with empty wagons, Nadeau purchased supplies of every description, which he sold to people along the route, and in this way he obtained the best financial results. This was about the same time that Victor Beaudry, Prudence's brother, who came in 1855 to mine at San Gabriel, opened a store at Camp Independence in Neal County, and became a stockholder in the Cerro Gordo mines. 
In their early 80s, Baudry was interested with his brother in local real estate movements. He died in Montreal in 1888. After a time, the mines yielded so much ore that Nadeau found himself short of transportation facilities, but with the assistance of Judson and Belshaw, as well as H. Newmark and Company, he was enabled to increase his capacity until he operated 32 teams. Los Angeles was then the southern terminus of his operations, although during the building of the numerous Southern Pacific tunnels, his headquarters were removed to San Fernando, and still later on the completion of the railroad to Mojave. Nadeau's assistant, Willard G. Halstead, son-in-law of H. K. W. Bent, handled most of the business when Nadeau was absent. A. E. Lott was foreman of teams and continually rode up and down the line of operations, while Thomas O'Brien was station agent at Cerro Gordo. The contract had been very profitable to Judson and Belshaw, yet when the agreement expired on January 1, 1872, they wished to renew it at a lower figure. Nadeau, believing that no one else could do the work satisfactorily, refused the new terms offered, whereupon Judson and Belshaw entered into an arrangement with William Osborne, a liveryman, who owned a few teams. The season of 1871-72 to 72 was by no means a good one, and barley was high, involving a great expense to Nadeau in feeding four or five hundred animals, and right there arose his chief difficulty. He was in debt to H. Newmark and Company, and therefore proposed that he should turn his outfit over to us, but as we had unlimited confidence both in his integrity and in his ability, we prevailed on him to keep and use his equipment to the best advantage. This suggestion was a fortunate one, for just at this time large deposits of borax were discovered in the mountains at Wordsworth, Nevada, and Nadeau commenced operations there with every promise of success. In his work of hauling between Cerro Gordo and Los Angeles, Nadeau had always been very regular, his teams with rare exceptions arriving and leaving on scheduled time, and even when occasionally a wagon did break down, the pig lead would be unloaded without delay, tossed to the side of the trail, and left there for the next train, a method that was perfectly safe since thieves never disturbed the property. Osborne, on the other hand, soon proved uncertain and unreliable, his wagons frequently breaking down and causing other accidents and delays. To protect themselves, Judson and Belshaw were compelled to terminate their contract with him and reopen negotiations with Nadeau, but the latter rejected their advances unless they would buy a half interest in his undertaking and put up $150,000 for the construction and maintenance of the numerous stations that had become necessary for the proper development of his business. Nadeau also made it a condition that H. Newmark and Company be paid. The stations already constructed or proposed were Mud Springs, Lang's Station, Mojave, Red Rock, Penament, Indian Wells, Little Lake, Hiawaii Meadows, and Cartago. Before these were built, the Teamsters camped in the open, carrying with them the provisions necessary for man and beast. Cartago was on the south side of Owens Lake, Cerro Gordo being on the north side, 18 miles opposite and between these points the miniature side-wheeler Bessie of but twenty tons capacity operated. An interesting fact or two in connection with Owens Lake may be recorded here. Its water was so impregnated with borax and soda that no animal life could be sustained. In the winter the myriads of wild duck were worth talking about, but after they had remained near the lake for but a few days they were absolutely unpalatable. The teamsters and miners operating in the vicinity were in the habit of sousing their clothes in the lake for a few minutes, and when dried, the garments were found to be as clean as if they had passed through the most perfect laundry. Even a handful of the water applied to the hair would produce a magnificent lather and shampoo. Judson and Belshaw were compelled to accept Nadeau's terms, and Nadeau returned from Nevada, organized in 1873 the Cerro Gordo Freighting Company, and operated more extensively than ever before until he withdrew, perhaps five years after the completion of the Southern Pacific Railroad, and just before the petering out of the Cerro Gordo mines. In their palmy days, these deposits were the most extensive lead producers of California, and while the output might not have been so remarkable in comparison with those of other lead mines in the world, something like 85 to 90 bars, each weighing about 100 pounds, were produced there daily. Most of this was shipped, as I have said, to San Francisco, and for a while at least, from there to Swansea, Wales. Nadeau at one time was engaged in the industry of raising sugar beets at the Nadeau Rancho near Florence, now Nadeau Station, and then he attempted to refine sugar. But it was bad at best, and the more sugar one put in coffee, the blacker the coffee became. On April 24, 1869, under Mayor Joel Turner's administration, the Los Angeles Board of Education came into existence. In the early 60s, the city authorities promised to set out trees at the plaza, providing neighboring property owners would fence in the place, 
but even though Governor Downey supplied the fence, no trees were planted, and it was not until the spring of 1869 that any grew on the public square. This loud demand for trees was less for the sake of the usual benefits than to hide the ugliness of the old water tank. On May 9th, F. G. Walter issued the first number of the Los Angeles Chronic, a German weekly journal that survived scarcely three months. The 10th of May was another red-letter day for the Pacific Coast, rejoicing as it did in the completion of the Central Pacific at Promontory Point in Utah. There, with a silver hammer, Governor Stanford drove the historic gold spike into a tie of polished California laurel, thus consummating the vast work on the first transcontinental railroad. This event recalls the fact that in the railway's construction, Chinese labor was extensively employed, and that in 1869 large numbers of the dead bodies of celestials were gathered up and shipped to Sacramento for burial. William J. Broderick, after wandering in Peru and Chile, came to Los Angeles in 1869 and started as a stationer. Then he opened an insurance office, and still later became interested in the Main Street Railway and the Water Company. On May 8, 1877, Broderick married Miss Laura E., daughter of Robert S. Carlyle. On October 18, 1898, Broderick died, having been identified with many important activities. Hacks and omnibuses first came into use in 1869. Toward the end of May that year, J. J. Reynolds, who had been long popular as a driver between Los Angeles and Wilmington, purchased a hack and started in business for himself, appealing to his reputation for good driving and reliability as a reasonable assurance that he would bring his patrons right side up to their scattered homes. And so much was he in demand, both in the city and its suburbs, that a competitor, J. Hewitt, in the latter part of June, ordered a similar hack to come by steamer. It arrived in due time and was chronicled as a luxurious vehicle. Hewitt regularly took up his stand in the morning in front of the Lafayette Hotel, and he also had an order slate at George Butler's livery stable on Main Street. During the 60s, Dr. T. H. Rose, who had relinquished the practice of medicine for the career of a pedagogue, commenced work as principal of the Boys' Grammar School on Bath Street, and in 1869 was elected superintendent of city schools. He held this office but about a year, although he did not resign from educational work here until 1873. During his incumbency, he was vice principal of the first teacher's institute ever held here, contributing largely toward the founding of the first high school and the general development of the schools prior to the time when Dr. Lucky, the first really professional teacher, assumed charge. On leaving Los Angeles, Dr. Rose became principal of the school at Heldsburg, Sonoma County, where he married a Mrs. Jewell, the widow of an old-time wealthy miner. But he was too sensitive and proud to live on her income, and much against her wishes, insisted on teaching to support himself. In 1874, he took charge of the high school at Petaluma, where the family of Mrs. Rose's first husband had lived, and the relationship of the two families probably led to Rose and his wife separating. Later, Dr. Rose went to the Sandwich Islands to teach, but by 1883, shortly before he died, he was back in Los Angeles, broken in health and spirit. Dr. Rose was an excellent teacher, a strict disciplinarian, and a gentleman. The retirement of Dr. Rose caused to mine a couple of years during which Los Angeles had no city school superintendent. While Rose was principal, a woman was in charge of the girls' department, and the relations between the schoolmaster and the schoolmistress were none too friendly. When Dr. Rose became superintendent, the school ma'am instantly disapproved of the choice and rebelled. And there being no law which authorized the governing of Los Angeles schools in any other manner than by the trustees, the new superintendent had no authority over his female colleague. The office of superintendent of city schools, consequently, remained vacant until 1873. Dr. James S. Crawford had the honor, as far as I am aware, of being one of the first regular dentists to locate in Los Angeles. As an itinerant, he had passed the winters of 1863, 1864, and 1865 in this city, afterward going east, and on his return to California in 1869, he settled in the Downey Block at Spring and Main Streets, where he practiced until, on April 14, 1912, he died in a Ventura County camp. In 1864, the California legislature, wishing to encourage the silk industry, offered a bounty of $250 for every plantation of 5,000 mulberry trees of two years' growth, and a bounty of $300 for each 100,000 salable cocoons. And in three years, an enormous number of mulberry trees in various stages of growth was registered. Prominent among silk growers was Louis Prevost, who rather early had established here an extensive mulberry tree nursery, and near it a large cocoonery for the rearing of silkworms and had planned, in 1869, the creation of a colony of silkworms whose products would rival even those of his native Belle France. The California Silk Center Association of Los Angeles was soon formed, and 4,000 acres of the rancho, once belonging to Juan Bandini, 
fourteen hundred and sixty acres of the hartshorn tract and three thousand one hundred and sixty nine acres of jerupa on the east side of the santa ana river were purchased that was in june or july but on august sixteenth in the midst of a dry season louis provost died and the movement received a serious setback to add to the reverses the demand for silkworm eggs fell off amazingly while finally to give the enterprise its death blow the legislatures fearful that the state treasury would be depleted through the payment of bounties withdrew all state aid the silk center association therefore failed but the southern california colony association bought all the land paying for it something like three dollars and a half an acre to many persons the price was quite enough old louis robidoux had long refused to list his portion for taxes and someone had described much of the acreage as so dry that even coyotes in crossing took along their canteens for safety a town called at first Yurupa and later riverside was laid out a fifty thousand dollar ditch diverted the santa ana river to a place where nature had failed to arrange for its flowing and in a few months a number of families had settled beside the artificial waterway riversiders long had to travel back and forth to los angeles for most of their supplies a stage still in existence being used by ordinary passengers and this made a friendly as well as profitable business relation with the older and larger town but experiments soon showing that oranges could grow in the arid soil riverside in the course of time had something to sell as well as to buy who was more familiar both to the youth of the town and to grown-ups than nicolas martinez in summer the purveyor of cooling ice cream in winter the vendor of hot tamales from morning till night month in and month out during the sixties and seventies martinez paced the streets his dark skin made still swarthier in contrast to his white costume a shirt scarcely tidy together with pantaloons none too symmetrical and hanging down in generous folds at the waist on his head in true native fashion he balanced in a small hooped tub what he had for sale he spoke with a pronounced latin accent and his favorite method of announcing his presence was to bawl out his wares the same receptacle resting upon a round board with an opening to ease the load and covered with a bunch of cloths served both to keep the tamales hot and the ice cream cool while to dispose the latter he carried in one hand a circular iron tray in which were holes to accommodate three or four glasses further for the convenience of the exacting youth of the town he added a spoon to each cream-filled glass and what stray speck of the ice was left on the spoon at the youngster had given in a parting lick nicolas bawling anew to attract the next customer fastidiously removed with his tobacco stained fingers end of chapter twenty six Chapter 27 of Sixty Years in Southern California, 1853 to 1913, by Harris Newmark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chapter 27 Coming of the Iron Horse, 1869. The Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad continued in 1869 to be the local theme of most importance, although its construction did not go on as rapidly as had been promised. The site for a depot, it is true, had been selected, but by June 14th only six miles were finished. Farmers were loud in complaints that they had been heavily taxed, and in demanding that the road be rushed to completion in order to handle the prospectively large grain crop. Additional gangs were therefore employed, and by the 20th of July seven more miles of track had been laid. In the meantime, the Sunday school at Compton enjoyed the first excursion, the members making themselves comfortable on benches and straw in some freight cars. As the work on the railroad progressed, stages, in addition to those regularly running through from Los Angeles to Wilmington, began connecting with the trains at the temporary terminus of the railroad. People went down to Wilmington to see the operations, not merely on the track, but in the machine shops where the cars for freight, express, baggage, smoking, and passenger service, designed by A. A. Polhamus, the machinist, were being built under the superintendence of Samuel Atkinson, who had been brought west by the San Francisco and San Jose Valley Railroad because of a reputation for railroad experience enjoyed by few, if by any other persons, on the coast. The company also had a planing mill and wheelwright shop under the charge of George W. Oden. By the 1st of August, both the railroad and connecting stages were advertising Sunday excursions to the beach, emphasizing the chance to travel part of the way by the new means of transit. Curiously, however, visitors were allowed to enjoy the sea breezes but a short time. Arriving at Wilmington about ten or half past, they were compelled to start back for Los Angeles by four in the afternoon. 
many resorters still patronized the old service and frequently the regular stages racing all the way up from the steamer would actually reach the city half an hour earlier than those transferring the passengers from the railway terminus which was extended by august first to a point within four miles of town when eighteen miles had been finished it was reported that general stoneman and his post band would make an excursion on the first train accompanied by general banning and leading citizens of the town but strong opposition to the company laying its tracks through the center of the lane now alameda street having developed the work was stopped by injunction the road had been constructed to a point opposite the old wolfskill home then far from town until the matter was settled passengers and freight were unloaded then great excitement prevailed here shortly after sundown on wednesday evening august twenty first when the mail stage which had left for gilroy but a short time before came tearing back to town the seven or eight passengers excitedly shouting that they had been robbed the stage had proceeded but two miles from los angeles when four masked highwaymen stepped into the road and ordered hands up among the passengers was the well-known and popular ben truman who having learned by previous experience just what to do in such a ticklish emergency and being persuaded that the two barrels of cold steel had somewhat the proportions of a railway tunnel sadly but promptly unrolled one hundred and eighty dollars in bills and quite as sadly deposited in addition his favorite chronometer the highwayman picked up the watch looked it over shook his head and thanking ben returned it expressing the hope that whatever adversity might overwhelm him he should never be discovered with such a timepiece all in all the robbers secured nearly two thousand dollars but strange to relate they overlooked the treasure in the wells fargo chest as well as several hundred dollars in greenbacks belonging to the government sheriff j f burns and deputy h c wiley pursued and captured the robbers and within about a week they were sent to the penitentiary on the same evening at high tide the little steamer christened los angeles and constructed by p banning and company to run from the wharf to the outside anchorage was committed to the waters bonfires illuminating quite distinctly both guests and the neighboring landscape and lending to the scene a weird and charming effect in a previous chapter i have given an account of lady franklin's visit to san pedro and los angeles and of the attention shown her her presence awakened new interest in the search for her lamented husband and paved the way for the sympathetic reception of any intelligence likely to clear up the mystery no little excitement therefore was occasioned eight years later by the finding of a document at san buenaventura that seemed like a voice from the dead according to the story told as james daly of the lumber firm of daly and rogers was walking on the beach on august thirtieth he found a sheet of paper a foot square much mutilated but bearing in five or six different languages a still legible request to forward the memoranda to the nearest british consul or the admiralty at london every square inch of the paper was covered with data relating to sir john franklin and his party concluding with the definite statement that franklin had died on june eleventh eighteen forty seven having been found within a week of the time that the remnant of dr hall's party went in search of the explorer had arrived home in connecticut with the announcement that they had discovered seven skeletons of franklin's men this document washed up on the pacific coast excited much comment but i am unable to say whether it was ever accepted by competent judges as having been written by franklin's associates in eighteen sixty nine the long familiar adobe of jose antonio carrillo was raised to make way for what for many years was the leading hotel of los angeles this was the pico house in its decline known as the national hotel which when erected on main street opposite the plaza at a cost of nearly fifty thousand dollars but emphasized in its contrasting showiness the ugliness of the neglected square some thirty five thousand dollars were spent in furnishing the eighty odd rooms and no little splurge was made that guests could there enjoy the luxuries of both gas and baths in its palmy days the pico house welcomed from time to time travelers of wide distinction while many a pioneer among them not a few newly wedded couples now permanently identified with los angeles or the southland look back to the hostelry as the one surviving building fondly associated with the olden days charles knowlton was an early manager and he was succeeded by dunham and schifflin competition in the blacking of boots enlivened the fall the hotel lafayette putting boldly in printer's ink the question do you want to have your boots blacked in a cool private place this challenge was answered with the following proclamation champion boot black boots blacked neater and cheaper than anywhere else in the city at the blue wing shaving saloon by d jefferson 
Brick-making had become, by September, quite an important industry. Joe Mullally, whose brickyard was near the Jewish cemetery, then had two kilns with a capacity of 225,000, and in the following month he made over 500,000 brick. In course of time, the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad was completed to the Madigan lot, which remained for several years the Los Angeles terminus, and justly confident that the difficulty with the authorities would be removed, the company pushed work on their depot and put in a turntable at the foot of New Commercial Street. There was but one diminutive locomotive, though a larger one was on its way around the horn from the east, and still another was coming by the Continental Railway. And every few days the little engine would go out of commission, so that traffic was constantly interrupted. At such times, confidence in the enterprise was somewhat shaken, but new rolling stock served to reassure the public. A brightly painted smoking car, with seats mounted on springs, was soon the talk of the town. I have spoken of J. J. Reynolds's early enterprise and the competition that he evoked. Toward the end of July he went up to San Francisco and outdid Hewitt by purchasing a handsome omnibus, suitable for hotel service, and also adapted to the needs of families or individuals clubbing together for picnics and excursions. This gave the first impetus to the use of the hotel buses, and by the first Sunday in September, when the cars from Wilmington rolled in bringing passengers from the steamer Orizaba, the travelers were met by omnibuses and coaches from all three hotels, the Belly Union, the United States, and the Lafayette. The number of vehicles, public and private, giving the streets around the railroad depot a very lively appearance. Judge W. G. Dryden, so long a unique figure here, died on September 10th, and A. J. King succeeded him as county judge. A notable visit to Los Angeles was that of Secretary William H. Seward, who in 1869 made a trip across the continent, going as far north as Alaska and as far south as Mexico, and being everywhere enthusiastically received. When Seward left San Francisco for San Diego, about the middle of September, he was accompanied by Frederick Seward and his wife, his son and daughter-in-law, General W. S. Rosecrans, General Morton C. Hunter, Colonel Thomas Sedgwick, and Senator S. B. Axtell, and the news of their departure having been telegraphed ahead, many people went down to greet them on the arrival of the steamer Orizaba. After the little steamer Los Angeles had been made fast to the wharf, it was announced, to everyone's disappointment, that the Secretary was not coming ashore, as he wished to continue on his way to San Diego. Meanwhile, the Common Council had resolved to extend the hospitality of the city to the distinguished party and by September 19th posters proclaimed that Seward and his party were coming, and that citizens generally would be afforded an opportunity to participate in a public reception at the Bella Union on September 21st. A day in advance, therefore, the mayor and a committee from the council set out for Anaheim, where they met the distinguished statesman on his way, whence the party jogged along leisurely in a carriage and four until they arrived at the bank of the Los Angeles River and there Seward and his friends were met by other officials and a cavalcade of eighty citizens led by the military band of drum barracks. The guests alighted at the Bella Union, and in a few minutes a rapidly increasing crowd was calling loudly for Mr. Seward. The secretary, being welcomed on the balcony by Mayor Joel H. Turner, said that he had been laboring under mistakes all his life. He had visited Rome to witness celebrated ruins, but he found more interesting ruins in the Spanish missions. Great cheers. He had journeyed to Switzerland to view its glaciers, but upon the Pacific coast he had seen rivers of ice two hundred and fifty feet in breadth, five miles long, and God knows how high. More cheers. He had explored Labrador to examine the fisheries, but in Alaska he found that the fisheries came to him. Hear, hear, and renewed applause. He had gone to Burgundy to view the most celebrated vineyards of the world, but the vineyards of California far surpassed them all vociferous and deafening hurrahs, and tossing of bouquets. The next day the Washington guests and their friends were shown about the neighborhood, and that evening Mr. Seward made another and equally happy speech to the audience drawn to the Bella Union by the playing of the band. There were also addresses by the mayor, Senator Axtell, ex-Governor Downey, and others, after which, in good old American fashion, citizens generally were introduced to the associate of the martyred Lincoln. At nine o'clock a number of invited guests were ushered into the Bella Union's dining room, where, at a bounteous repast, the company drank to the health of the secretary. This brought from the visitor an eloquent response with interesting local allusions. Secretary Seward remarked that he found people here agitated upon the question of internal improvements, for everywhere people wanted railroads. 
Californians, if they were patient, would yet witness a railroad through the north, another by the southern route, still another by the 35th parallel, a fourth by the central route, and lastly, as the old plantation song goes, one down the middle. California needed more population, and railroads were the means by which to get people. Finally, Mr. Seward spoke of the future prospects of the United States, saying much of peculiar interest in the light of later developments. We were already great, he affirmed, but a nation satisfied with its greatness is a nation without a future. We should expand, and as mightily as we could, until at length we had both the right and the power to move our armies anywhere in North America. As to the island lying almost within a stone's throw of our mainland, ought we not to possess Cuba, too? Other toasts, such as the mayor and common council, the pioneers, the ancient hospitality of California, the press, the wine press, and our wives and sweethearts, were proposed and responded to, much good feeling prevailing notwithstanding the variance in political sentiments represented by guests and hosts, and every one went home, in the small hours of the morning, pleased with the manner in which Los Angeles had received her illustrious visitors. The next day Secretary Seward and party left for the north by carriages, rolling away toward Santa Barbara and the mountains so soon to be invaded by the puffing, screeching iron horse. Recollecting this banquet to Secretary Seward, I may add an amusing fact of a personal nature. Eugene Meyer and I arranged to go to the dinner together, agreeing that we were to meet at the store of S. Lazard and Company, almost directly opposite the Bella Union. When I left Los Angeles in 1867, evening dress was uncommon, but in New York I had become accustomed to its more frequent use. Rather naturally, therefore, I donned my swallowtail. Meyer, however, I found in a business suit, and surprised at my query as to whether he intended going home to dress. Just as we were, we walked across the street, and, entering the hotel, whom should we meet but ex-mayor John G. Nichols, wearing a grayish linen duster, popular in those days, that extended to his very ankles, while Pio and Andres Pico came attired in blue coats with big brass buttons. Meyer, observing the mayor's outfit, facetiously asked me if I still wished him to go home and dress according to Los Angeles fashion whereupon I drew off my gloves, buttoned up my overcoat, and determined to sit out the banquet with my claw-hammer thus concealed. Mr. Seward, it is needless to say, was faultlessly attired. The Spanish archives were long neglected until M. Kramer was authorized to overhaul and arrange the documents, and even then it was not until September 16th that the Council built a vault for the preservation of the official papers. Two years later, Kramer discovered an original proclamation of peace between the United States and Mexico. Elsewhere I allude to the slow development of Fort Street. For the first time, on the 24th of September, street lamps burned there, and that was from six to nine months after darkness had been partially banished from Nigger Alley, Los Angeles, Aliso, and Alameda Streets. Supplementing what I have said of the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad Depot, it was built on a lot fronting 300 feet on Alameda Street and having a depth of 120 feet, its situation being such that, after the extension of Commercial Street, the structure occupied the southwest corner of the two highways. Really, it was more of a freight shed than anything else, without adequate passenger facilities. A small space at the north end contained a second story in which some of the clerks slept, and in a cramped little cage beneath, tickets were sold. By the way, the engineer of the first train to run through to this depot was James Holmes, although B.W. Colling ran the first train stopping inside the city limits. About this time, the real estate excitement had become still more intense. In anticipation of the erection of this depot, Commercial Street property boomed, and the first realty agents of whom I have any recollection appeared on the scene, Judge R. M. Widney being among them. I remember that two lots, one eighty by one hundred and twenty feet in size at the northwest corner of First and Spring Streets, and the other, having a frontage of only twenty feet on New Commercial Street, adjacent to the station, were offered simultaneously at twelve hundred dollars each. Contrary, no doubt, to what he would do today, the purchaser chose the Commercial Street lot, believing that location to have the better future. Telegraph rates were not very favorable in 1869 to frequent or verbose communication. Ten words sent from Los Angeles to San Francisco cost one dollar and a half, and fifty cents additional was asked for the next five words. After a while, there was a reduction of twenty-five percent in the cost of the first ten words and fifty percent on the second five. Twenty-four hundred voters registered in Los Angeles this year. In the fall, William H. Spurgeon founded Santa Ana some five miles beyond Anaheim on a tract of about fifty acres, where a number of the first settlers experimented in growing flax. 
it is not clear to me just when the rocky arroyo seco began to be popular as a resort but i remember going there on picnics as early as eighteen fifty seven by the late sixties when santa monica canyon also appeared to the lovers of sylvan life the arroyo had become known as sycamore grove a name doubtless suggested by the numerous sycamores there and clois f henriksen had opened an establishment including a little hotel a dancing pavilion a saloon and a shooting alley free lunch and free beer were provided for the first day and each sunday thereafter in the summer season an omnibus ran every two hours from los angeles to the sycamores after some years john rumpf and wife succeeded to the management frau rumpf being a popular virten and then the los angeles turnverein used the grove for its public performances including gymnastics singing and the old-time sack racing and target shooting james miller ginn who had come to california in november eighteen sixty three and had spent several years in various counties of the state digging for gold and teaching school drifted down to los angeles in october and was soon engaged as principal of the public school at the new town of anaheim remaining there in that capacity for twelve years during part of which time he also did good work on the county school board under the auspices of the french benevolent society and toward the end of october the cornerstone of the french hospital built on city donation lots and for many years and even now one of the most efficient institutions of our city was laid with the usual ceremonies on october ninth the first of the new locomotives arrived at wilmington and a week later made the first trial trip with a baggage and passenger car just before departure a painter was employed to label the engine and decorate it with a few scrolls when it was discovered too late that the artist had spelled the name los angelos on october twenty third two lodges of odd fellows used the railway to visit bowen lodge at wilmington returning on the first train up to that time run into los angeles at midnight october twenty sixth was a memorable day for on that date the los angeles and san pedro railroad company opened the line to the public and invited everybody to enjoy a free excursion to the harbor two trains were dispatched each way a second consisting of ten cars and not less than fifteen hundred persons made the round trip unfortunately it was very warm and dusty but such discomforts were soon forgotten in the novelty of the experience on the last trip back came the musicians and the new los angeles depot having been cleared cleaned up and decorated for a dedicatory ball there was a stampede to the little structure filling it in a jiffy judge h k s o melvaney who first crossed the plains from illinois on horseback in eighteen forty nine came to los angeles with his family in november having already served four years as a circuit judge following his practice of law in sacramento he was a brother-in-law of l j rose having married in eighteen fifty miss annie wilhelmina rose upon his arrival he purchased the southwest corner of second and fort streets a lot one hundred and twenty by one hundred and sixty five feet in size and there he subsequently constructed one of the fine houses of the period which was bought some years later by jotham bixby for about forty five hundred dollars after it had passed through various hands bixby lived in it for a number of years and then resold it in 1872, O'Melvaney was elected judge of Los Angeles County, and in 1887 he was appointed superior judge. H. W. O'Melvaney, his second son, came from the East with his parents, graduating in time from the Los Angeles High School and the State University. Now he is a distinguished attorney and occupies a leading position as public spirited citizen and a patron of the arts and sciences. In his very readable work, From East Prussia to the Golden Gate, Frank Le Corvier credits me with having served the commonwealth as supervisor this is a slight mistake i was an unwilling candidate but never assumed the responsibilities of office in eighteen sixty nine various friends waited upon me and requested me to stand as their candidate for the supervisorship to which i answered that i would be glad to serve my district but that i would not lift a finger towards securing my election h abila was chosen with six hundred and thirty one votes e m sanford being a close second with six hundred and sixteen while 537 votes were cast in my favor. Trains on the new railway began to run regularly on November 1st, and there still exists one of the first timetables bearing at the head Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad, and a little picture of a locomotive and train. At first, the train scheduled for two stated round trips a day, except on steamer days when the time was conditioned by the arrival and departure of vessels, left for Wilmington at 8 o'clock in the morning and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, returning at 10 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. The fare between Los Angeles and Wilmington was $1.50, with an additional charge of $1 to the Anchorage. While on freight from the Anchorage to Los Angeles, the tariff was 
dry goods sixteen dollars per ton groceries and other merchandise five dollars and lumber seven dollars per thousand feet after the formal opening of the railroad a permanent staff of officers crews and mechanicians was organized the first superintendent was h w hawthorne who was succeeded by e e hewitt editor of the wilmington journal n a macdonald was the first conductor sam butler was the first and for a while the only brakeman and the engineers were james mcbride and bill thomas the first local agent was john milner the first agent at wilmington john mccray the former was succeeded by john e jackson who from eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty two served the community as city surveyor Worthy of remark, perhaps, as a coincidence, is the fact that both Milner and McRae ultimately became connected in important capacities with the Farmers and Merchants Bank. The first advertised public excursion on the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad after its opening was a trip to Wilmington and around San Pedro Harbor, arranged for November 5, 1869. The cars, drawn by the locomotive Los Angeles and connecting with the little steamer of the same name, left at 10 and returned at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Two dollars was a round-trip fare, while another dollar was exacted from those who went out upon the harbor. In the late 70s, a Portuguese named Fayol settled near what is now the corner of 6th and Front Streets, San Pedro, and one Linskow took up his abode in another shack a block away. Round these rude huts sprang up the neighborhoods of Fayol and Lindville, since absorbed by San Pedro. Probably the first attempt to organize a fire company for Los Angeles was made in 1869 when a meeting was called on Saturday evening, November 6th, at Buffum's Saloon to consider the matter. A temporary organization was formed, with Henry Vortenberg as president, W. A. Mix vice president, George M. Fall secretary, and John H. Gregory treasurer. An initiation fee of two dollars and a half and monthly dues of twenty-five cents were decided upon and J. F. Burns, B. Katz, Emile Harris, George Pridham, E. B. Frink, C. D. Hathaway, P. Thompson, O. W. Potter, C. M. Small, and E. C. Phelps were charter members. A committee appointed to canvass for subscriptions made little progress, and the partial destruction of Rowan's American Bakery in December, demonstrating the need of an engine and hose cart, brought out sharp criticism of Los Angeles's penuriousness. About the middle of November, Daniel Desmond, who had come on October 14th of the preceding year, opened a hat store on Los Angeles Street near New Commercial, widely advertising the enterprise as a pioneer one and declaring, perhaps unconscious of any pun, that he proposed to fill a want that had long been felt. The steamer Orizaba, which was to bring down Desmond's good, as ill luck would have it, left half his stock lying on the San Francisco pier, and the opening, so much heralded, had to be deferred several weeks. As late as 1876, he was still the only exclusive hatter here. Desmond died on January 23, 1903, aged 70 years, and was succeeded by his son, C.C. C. Desmond. Another son, D.J. Desmond, is the well-known contractor. Toward the close of November, Joseph Jolly, a Frenchman, opened the Chartres Coffee Factory on Main Street opposite the plaza, and was the pioneer in that line. He delivered to both stores and families and for a while seemed phenomenally successful, but one fine morning in December it was discovered that the Jolly Joseph had absconded, leaving behind numerous unpaid bills. The first marble cutter to open a workshop in Los Angeles was named Miller. He came toward the end of 1869 and established himself in the Downey Block. Prior to Miller's coming, all marble work was brought from San Francisco or some source still further away, and the delay and expense debarred many from using that stone, even for the pious purpose of identifying graves. With the growth of Anaheim as the business center of the country between the New San Gabriel and the Santa Ana Rivers, sentiment had been spread in favor of the division of Los Angeles County, and at the opening of the legislature of 1869-70, to 70, Anaheim had its official representative in Sacramento, ready to present the claims of the little German settlement and its thriving neighbors. The person selected for this important embassy was Major Max von Strobel, and he inaugurated his campaign with such sagacity and energy that the bill passed the assembly and everything pointed to an early realization of the scheme. It was not, however, until Los Angeles awoke to the fact that the proposed segregation meant a decided loss, that opposition developed in the Senate and the whole matter was held up. Strobel thereupon sent post-haste to his supporters for more cash, and efforts were made to get the stubborn Senate to reconsider. Doubtless somebody else had a longer purse than Strobel, 
for in the end he was defeated and the germans dream did not come true until long after he had migrated to the realms that know no subdivisions one of the arguments used in favor of the separation was that it took two days time and cost six dollars for the round trip to the los angeles courthouse while another contention then regarded as of great importance was that the one coil of hose pipe owned by the county was kept at los angeles strobel by the way desired to call the new county anaheim major von strobel was a very interesting character he was a german who had stood shoulder to shoulder with karl schurz and franz scheigel in the german revolution of eighteen forty eight and who after having taken part in the adventures of walker's filibustering expedition to nicaragua finally landed in anaheim where he turned his attention to the making of wine he soon tired of that and in eighteen sixty seven was found boring for oil on the brea ranch again meeting with reverses where others later were so successful he then started the movement to divide los angeles county and once more failed in what was afterward accomplished journalism in anaheim next absorbed him and having had the best of educational advantages strobel brought to his newspaper both culture and the experience of travel the last grand effort of this adventurous spirit was the attempt to sell santa catalina island backed by the owners strobel sailed for europe and opened headquarters near threadneedle street in london in a few weeks he had almost effected the sale the contract having been drawn and the time actually set for the following day when the money a cool two hundred thousand pounds was to be paid but no strobel kept tryst to carry out his part of the transaction only the evening before alone and unattended the old man had died in his room at the very moment when fortune for the first time was to smile upon him eighteen or twenty years later catalina was sold for much less than the price once agreed upon End of chapter 27